So good morning to everybody. I hope you slept well. You enjoyed the silence at the Abbey. Some announcements before I will pass the moderation to Oliver Dürr and Luca Basquera. So as I told you, the music festival Schubert Jade starts today. Maybe the whole city will change a little bit. In order to participate in the concert this night in the Aula Magda, you need a daily entrance, and it has the form of this red ribbon. Uh, we still have three of them. You find them, you found them in your map. So as soon as you put it and you close it, you will not be able to, to take it away again. So reflect if you will need it and use it or not. It might become useful during the day because uh, we will not have common lunch in a common restaurant, but I'm rather sure that everywhere in the city you will find small places where you can quickly take something to eat. If you need Swiss money to do so, so address to me and I will give you uh, some money. Now the question, who did not yet find, get such a ribbon and would like to have one? Okay, might happen. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, five. Look around. So, uh, five. I will just distribute already. Vielleicht ein Fabio eins. Ah, oh, eins ist schon da. So, the second question, and now you have to listen, concerns money. You found in your map such a sheet. There you can, can fill in your expenses. There are two possibilities. Uh, give me this filled in sheet as soon as possible. If you want to have your money here during this day, please give it to me until 11 o'clock so that I can prepare the money. The second possibility is you put in here your bank account and uh, then we will send the money by a transfer. What is important is that we need the original documents of your expenses. So we prepared an envelope that you also find in your map and you can just send us the documents because they, you will probably need them to travel back home. Uh, just to repeat, the evening program will be the following one. We cl close around uh, six, quarter past six here. Then we will find some refreshments here uh, upstairs, as you know, at 7.30, there is the possibility to uh, listen to the concert in the Aula Magna, so it's inside the building. And then we already made a reservation for the hotel, uh, restaurant Gemelli, where we have gathered the first night and we ordered a meal, a classic simple meal, so that everybody is served quite quickly. We will arrive there at 20.30, so it will not become too late. Other things we can uh, discuss and clarify later. If you have questions, do not hesitate to address to me. And I pass the floor to Oliver Dill. Good, yes. So good morning everyone from my end, from our end. Luke and I will sort of lead through the day um, and try to instigate a discussion as we did yesterday already, but that worked quite well since we have so many people with good thoughts and brilliant, brilliant ideas and perspectives. And so just know that you're all welcome to join the discussion um, in the sessions and in the moments in the conviviums uh, more informally, but also in these questions, contributions and perspectives sections that we can get into a, a lively debate. And we will just dive in uh, straight on with Nina Power. She's an English writer and philosopher and she will just introduce us also herself to what her relationship to Illich and his thought is, and I'll just hand it over to you.
Okay, thank you. Um, obviously, it's nine o'clock in the morning on Saturday, and I've been commissioned to talk about eutropelia, uh, which is, I will talk about it, uh, a difficult concept to maybe enact in this uh, time on a Saturday morning. Um, but first of all, uh, I, I wanted to just speak freely rather than read a paper, um, but I wanted to address um, what um, Barbara um, mentioned at the beginning of the conference, which is uh, something of an explanation or a contextualization for why Illich has become relevant um, to, to me and not just to me, to people in my, I don't know, network, let's say, or circles or uh, convivial spaces. Um, and I also just wanted to thank the organizers because this whole uh, conference is so complicated to organize and I hadn't realized the extent of the complexity. Um, so I'm really appreciative of being here. Um, so, where to begin? I, I, I guess I came across Illich probably um, quite a few years ago uh, with Deschooling uh, Society, probably the most uh, obvious book in some ways. Um, I taught philosophy in the academy for 13 years. I was a lecturer at Roehampton University in London. Um, I left a few years ago. <laughs> um, because of a feeling that I found a lot of um, uh, explanation for actually in the work of, of, of Illich and I think uh, a lot of us were coming to similar questions at least regarding uh, the way in which institution, institutions were uh, becoming completely bureaucratized, centralized, um, being completely opposed to what they set out to do in the first place. Of course Illich's famous phrase, the corruption of the best is the worst. Everything that was supposed to uh, be to do with learning became actually to do with policing and regulating and so on. And I think, you know, uh, in 2010, I, I and many other people were involved in the student protests in the UK. You might remember there was a very uh, aggressive financialization of the university. The tuition fees were tripled. They'd been very minimal. I, I myself was fortunate fortunate to not pay for my university education at all. I had a completely free university education. I was the last generation, the last cohort. And of course, I remembered this relationship to learning, uh, which was a, um, an honor, you know, and people talk about this word privilege, they use it in a stupid way now, but it, it really was an honor and a privilege to go to university in the 90s and to, to learn and to think and to reflect um, and a lot of us saw that was being lost, right, in the name of this creating a client, creating a consumer. And in fact, what happened to the students was not that they became more demanding in that, in that way as a consumer, but they became more anxious. They were worried constantly about money, and I, I completely understand why they were. I don't blame them at all, but the whole structure was uh, created in such a way that it mitigated against uh, philosophy in particular, because people were too anxious to say the wrong thing. They didn't want to ask the wrong question. There was no really room for dialogue. You know, people tried to, to continue, but, and at the same time, I could see the kind of people who were being rewarded in the academy were precisely those people who were the most bureaucratic. You know, a very, like this, almost like this bureaucracy person or this, technocratic person, and I know that David Cayley's written text yesterday was about technocracy, so I think we could see uh, this was happening. Um, so I, I think not only the, the lockdowns, but was, what was already happening before in multiple institutions, particularly education, was this, uh, exactly what Illich diagnosed, this, this reversal of values and the places where we should have been having difficult discussions and intellectual freedom and freedom of speech and expression were all being uh, uh, shrunk and crushed and made into these uh, uh, very unpleasant places to be. So basically, on the positive side, what we decided to do, me and various people who left the academy, maybe had benefited in the past from this system, um, we set up our own uh, what we sometimes call post-academic or para-academic uh, forms of learning. And I think when we talk about the internet or when we talk about any tool, you know, and I, I appreciate very much Illich's emphasis on, 
on thinking about the specificity of each tool rather than becoming overwhelmed by the abstraction of technology. But to think about something like the internet, which of course has its diabolical uh, elements, it is on the side of this world, <laughs> which is to say uh, it, it has its uh, anti antichrist elements. Um, at the same time, there are precursors in some of what Illich was describing when he was talking about learning webs. Um, and the possibility of people, let's say on the one hand, uh, wanting to learn about something, like I want to learn how to make a wooden box, I want to learn how to speak a different language. And the idea that you could simply write this down, someone else would see the, the request and meet the, the demand. So this idea of uh, uh, um, skill exchanges or peer-to-peer -peer kind of relationships, and lots of people have been thinking about those possibilities for the internet. Um, for a long time, and, and it does seem that that is, um, in a way, one uh, extremely positive possibility of the internet. So basically what we did, we tried to do something like this with Illich as our topic. So during the lockdown, um, we basically, uh, so, so me and various other people, Justin Murphy, who's also somebody who's very interested in this post-academic, para-academic world, but there are various people doing these things let's say, to, to try to cut out the middle man as much as possible, to try to cut out, it's not even a man anymore, try to cut out the system, the middle systems, try to um, work with people face to face on the basis of a system of trust and mutual interest. So even online, of course, there are uh, complexities with the, this technology. But to basically locate, let's say, the six people in the world who wanted to study uh, Ivan Illich's 1982 book on gender, right? And we could find those people, right? That this is something incredible, I think. You know, this possibility of locating and these people meeting each other. So, and from all over the world, right? From South America, from Australia, from America, from U Europe, and so on. And to try to find a time that we could all meet, um, and where it was a question of, of, of money, because of course I had no money anymore, having left the university, it would only become a question of what people could afford, what they could, you know, reasonably, um, you know, pay, and so on. And, and, and even that was open to negotiation or discussion. Um, because what the main thing was, was the thing that we wanted to return to, which was learning and understanding and thinking together through these difficulties. Um, so this is part of where I'm coming from, I suppose, with the, with the question of Illich. And I think there is a very um, important question about what Illich means in the age of the internet or you know, how we can have an Illichian uh, type of networks. Uh, which, of course, uh, include the personal dimension, like the fact of, in a way, of course, this is the more valuable face-to-face, -face, the, the convivial. Um, but I think, you know, when we were locked down, these discussions that we were having um, were extremely meaningful, you know, and we were looking at uh, medical nemesis. We were obviously thinking about you know, the, what was happening that was discussed a great deal yesterday with, with Kaylee uh, and, and as paper. Um, and Illich then, I suppose, along with perhaps René Girard, along with somehow Georges Bataille, along with other kind of thinkers, um, who, by the way, are not really being taught anymore <laughs> in, the, in the UK Academy, or at least they're extremely marginal thinkers. And we wanted to bring them into... Uh, uh, a more vivid existence again, you know, and precisely to understand what they could uh, help us to, to think through in the current age. So eutropelia is the, the idea, this concept I've, I'm, I'm talking about this morning. Um, and it's a, it's a term that Illich uses in the introduction to tools for conviviality. Um, and it's a very uh, old term. It means uh, well-turning. We would translate it perhaps as something like wittiness or playfulness or graceful play, Illich describes it. It's, uh, we find this word in Aquinas. We also find it in Aristotle. There's also a kind of version of it in the, uh, in the Bible. Um, Augustine uh, talks about it as well. It's somewhere between a kind of boorishness and a buffoonery. It's a sort of lightheartedness. 
It's a way of um, thinking and being together that is uh, not so serious, but it's serious in its playfulness. And one of the things I suppose myself and many of our friends had identified or were worried about, I guess, was where, where this playfulness, where playfulness and wittiness had gone, where it had disappeared. It seemed to be completely absent in the kind of work that people are doing. Um, obviously, we've seen the blurring of the boundary completely um, between what it means to be a laborer, what it means to be a worker, what it means to, to rest and have relaxation and so on. And all these things seem to be absolutely mixed up in the most perverse way, in fact, so that uh, relaxation also then becomes a form of labor, becomes something that, for example, uh, where people are using dating apps, you know, it becomes this chore, this kind of horror of trying to find somebody to talk to and, you know, this very, uh, I don't know, sort of grim uh, landscape without this sort of, uh, without wittiness. You know, and I, I think also we've seen a kind of fear of humour uh, in general. Uh, in many institutions, I mean, I'm sure it's worse in the UK <laughs> and these sort of, sort of extreme Anglophone countries. Um, you know, what, what has become very dominant is a kind of, yeah, the insecurity and anxiety, um, a fear of playfulness, a, a fear of making a mistake, let's say. What if you say the wrong thing? What if you you know, you comfort someone and they say that it was the wrong thing to do. You know, people have become very, very timid and they're therefore antisocial, you know, and, and these kinds of questions of sociability, you know, Agamben mentioned the, the horror of the phrase social distancing, you know, but we've become an entire culture of social distancing, you know, because of this trepidation, because of the fear of getting things wrong. And, one of those fears, I think, is to do with this, with this problem of humour, if you like. Like, of course humour can be cruel. Of course we can say things that are just nasty and mean and upsetting, right? And sometimes there is an inability to, to deal with these, I don't know, perceived offences or risk or any of these things. And, and at the same time, when we look back at people like Aquinas and Aristotle and Illich, they're talking about something that is much more balanced, that is somewhere between, let's say, the seriousness of um, study or um, a particular work, um, but also the kind of lightness, you know, not, not like a playfulness that we have to get stuck in all the time. You know, there's also a grimness, if you like, to the thought of people playing computer games for like 20 hours a day. You know, this is not, clearly is not what is meant either, right? But there's something about this convivial um, aspect, this way of being together as a form of graceful play, as a form of um, lightheartedness, of wittiness, that is about the enjoyment simply of being uh, relaxing with others, you know, and of course it can go wrong, of course it's risky, of course it's open to misinterpretation. Um, nevertheless, uh, I think this, this concept is absolutely um, crucial, and, and the more we become technocratic subjects, the more we're online, the more we are institutionalized, um, the more we need these, uh, these light-hearted, medium-sized concepts, these, these sort of good humor uh, playfulness. Um, and I think it's one way of describing it is to, to think about it as a kind of, of a virtue about games, um, a sort of uh, a respect for our capacity uh, to play. It is not teleological. This is another beautiful thing about what Illich is, is talking about in the book on, on, on conviviality. In, in this sense, it's a form of recreation and a rest of the soul, as the, as the ancient thinkers would say. It's closer in that sense to a form of contemplation or even um, of prayer, in the sense that it doesn't have this, this end in sight. It is, is something whose, um, where the goods are internal to its practice. It is not for any other reason than its own joy and its own beauty. And I think it's very interesting in the, uh, the Tools for Conviviality book that Illich links this concept of eutropelia 
to the idea of austerity. And again, when we think about the bastardization of words and the corruption of these these terms, you know, austerity, if you say austerity to somebody in the UK, they will think only of this economic policy, which is actually extremely detrimental, you know, where basically people have been asked since the financial crash of 2007-2008 to, uh, to tighten their belt, you know, to live in such a way in order to sacrifice their own pleasure or enjoyment um, to save the economy, right? Because this is what we are, are supposed to be concerned with, you know, the health of the economy, the happiness of the economy, and so on. Um, you know, so, so again, this, this beautiful word, austerity, uh, which again, um, uh, Illich is drawing on from, from both Aquinas and Aristotle, this is something really that only ultimately means the exclusion of distraction. You know, so, so it's a way of, of linking this sort of graceful play and this sort of light-hearted conversation, this um, playfulness that is not cruel, right? Is not overbearing, but is something like a gentle um, pleasure in being together and even a kind of mockery of the very fact of our own existence, which is um, in some ways extremely absurd. You know, and, and the absurdity of ourselves, the fact that we are all mockable, we all make mistakes, we are all um, uh, idiots, frankly, a lot of the time. Um, and so I think this, this, to reclaim these words, to, to take back words like austerity and say, like, this is nothing to do with the fucking economy, this is nothing to do with making people's lives a misery, but actually this is a way of trying to be together in a gentle way, where we are not distracted, actually, where people are not sitting there playing on their phones, you know. And I'm not saying this in a moralistic way, like we're all prey to these forces. You know, I myself am, you know, absolutely prey to them, them too. This is not about saying there is this set of rules that you must live by, but it's rather to ask the question always of what it is that we value, actually. You know, if someone says to you, what is it that you value the most in your life? You know, you would likely say something like spending time with my friends and family, you know. And then we, we can think very carefully about the quality of those interactions and the, and the meaning of that time and what it actually means to be present in a non-teleological way, in a way that we are not rushed, in a way that we are not... Uh, feeling elsewhere constantly, you know, and these were all of these, these moods and these modes of being that Illich through, throughout is, is, is um, you know, is, is, is protecting, I would say, actually, reminding us of, of our capacity um, to be together in these ways. And um, the, the way in which, just to, just to finish, how, how Eutropelia fit, featured in my own work. I wrote a book that came out earlier this year um, called uh, What Do Men Want? Which was a joke again about Freud, obviously, who famously asked, what does, what does woman want? And he couldn't answer it. And obviously, I don't answer the question either. But I, wrote, I wanted to write a book about men. And it was partly inspired by reading um, Illich's book on gender. And of course, when gender came out in 1982, Illich was, to use a common parlance, cancelled. <laughs> By a, lot of, uh, <laughs> by a lot of people um, who regarded the book as extremely reactionary and so on. But it, I, think, I think we're, we're due, apart from anything else, for a re revival of actually Illich's claims about gender, because I think in many ways he was completely um, correct. Uh, what he describes in the industrial era is the way in which this economic regime um, culminates in a kind of neutering of both men and women. It's the erosion of separate spheres um, he talks about the way in which we, we go from being um, complementary, like thinking about men and women as, as, as companions, of, as different and, and beautiful in their difference, right? And, and the beauty of these interactions between the sexes and this complementarity um, to a world in which we all use the same tools. We're basically pitted against one another as rivals. 
whether it's in romantic sphere, economic sphere, we become more like siblings, like rival, you know, like we're competing for the same things. We no longer appreciate and respect the distance, well, the distance and the proximity of our difference. Um, and I wanted to write a book that was partly a defense of men, <laughs> of all things, um, because the last few years have seen this unbelievably um, horrific, uh, divisive discourse, I think, that has come to dominate the Anglo Anglosphere, in which men have become positioned as the, as the enemy, um, the enemy of women, um, and that they're somehow kind of uniquely or ontologically bad, you know, and, and this is uh, just simply a lie to me, right? This is not how men and women um, get on. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, capture, let's say, the, all of the things that Illich was trying to preserve when he was describing this sad loss of gender, as he puts it. He uses gender in a way that's complicated. I, I, we pro probably can't go into it, but what he means, I suppose, is the way in which this, this difference, the difference that we are, the difference between the sexes has become eradicated in the name of this bureaucratizing, homogenizing sameness, you know, which pits us against one another um, and, and eliminates everything that is complementary about us. So I wrote this book, which was, you know, a, an attempt to be a truthful book, and lots of people wanted to try and cancel it. They wrote to the publisher to try to get it pulled before it was even finished, um, because, you know, we live in this world now. And, um, but really, I defended, instead of this idea of, let's say, um, these negative games that we are supposed to play, like the pickup artist, for example, uh, this idea of this man who's going around using these particular games on women in order to sort of trick them into having sex with them. You know, I was like, oh my God, no, you know, this is horrible. This is not this gentle world of like conversation and flirting and interaction and all of these things that I think were captured in this idea of eutropelia. So I went back to Illich and to try to, um, to, to, to use this concept of eutropelia to suggest that not only do we actually have a lot more of these kinds of interactions than we're supposed to think according to the media and this framework where, you know, now men are the enemy and you're supposed to hate men, you know, I mean, this, this kind of horror. Um, um, but actually that we, uh, you know, that this is something we can also think about as to how to move forward, you know, how to reconcile, how to live together. I mean, of course, we have to live together. We, we do live together. We live in this mixed world. We're in a shared world. We are together, you know, and there are better, more beautiful ways of being together, um, which we already understand in some ways, but we are kind of constantly forgetting or being told to forget actually, that we can be together in these more um, beautiful and, and, and playful, uh, playful ways. Um, so that's just a, yeah, a, a kind of overview of where we, we I, I say we, I mean me, but, but also the people I'm thinking with, people I'm around, whether they're online or, or in real life, um, and, and people here too, you know, all of us who feel called <laughs> by something. Um, in Illich. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you very much for this um, inspiring talk. It just struck me, uh, as, you were t as you were talking, it just struck me that sometimes we're so caught up in analyzing the downsides of technologies and these kinds of things that we or analyzing the abuse that we just forget what would a, a good use of it look like. And that play has an imaginative power to it that things don't need to be as they are, but they can be what they currently aren't. Like, I don't know, this stick can be a sword if I'm playing. And maybe sort of our world can be different uh, if we have that kind of perspective and that kind of practice. 
Um, we'll just dive in next with uh, Celia Zamerski, who is somebody I think I don't really need to, <laughs> to introduce uh, because most of you know her very well. Uh, she teaches social work with a focus on health in Emden Leer currently in the north of Germany. So I had a long trip coming here. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, taking that on you. And of course, she was a personal assistant to Ivan Ilich. So we're looking forward to hear from you. Thank you very much. Okay, good morning. Thank you for your kind introduction. I want to say that I'm very glad to be here. When Mr. Basquera wrote to me for the first time, I immediately got the impression that you do not only plan an academic um, conference, but also a convivial meeting. You intended to gather people who would not only talk about Ivan Illich, but also be together in the spirit of Ivan Illich. This is why I gladly accepted your invitation without hesitation. So Ivan Illich was not only an impressive scholar and uh, thinker, but he was also an awesome character. After his death, I got quite a few letters, or we got quite a few letters from people who recounted their first and sometimes only meeting with him. That, as some of them wrote, changed their life. There are certainly many reasons why meeting Ivan Illich was a gift, but one of them was his capacity to celebrate presence. When we were eating together in Barbara's house, with Barbara also, as a, uh, it never felt like simply having lunch or dinner, but it was a celebration of each other's presence and of being in the world. Sometimes, when drinking a coffee and talking about some serious stuff like eugenics, George Steiner, or risk thinking, Ivan suddenly would burst out with Gratia tibi agimus omnipotens deis pro beneficis tuis amen. Or simply with a sentence, I do not really remember, maybe you remember, Barbara, but with a sentence which indicated that he considered his vis-a-vis -vis the most convincing proof of God's existence. So when I met Ivan for the first time in 1995, I was a student of genetics, writing my final thesis on the phylogenetic relationship of prosimians in Madagascar. I almost revolutionized the anthropoid pedigree because using genetic technology, I found a surprisingly close relationship between humans a Madagascan prosimians, until my advisor revealed to me that I had probably analyzed my own DNA instead of the prosimians. So at least I had shown that molecular geneticists are also only humans. I had never been a committed geneticist, but a staunch critic of genetic technology. I was convinced that I knew better than others what I was talking about in the matter of genes, DNA, and uh, genetic manipulation. Ivan, Barbara, and their friends in Bremen gave me a piece of their mind. They liberated me from my gene credo. Ivan always encouraged his friends not only to think things through, but also to think through things. Thus, around Barbara's spaghetti table, I learned that as a geneticist, especially as a critical one, I knew something about working in the lab, but nothing about genetics. I had been naive enough to believe in the existence of genes that can be discovered, analyzed, and finally manipulated. For my dissertation under Barbara's tutelage, I examined genetic counseling sessions, sessions in which a geneticist ascribes to a woman and her coming child such genes and genetic risks, and asks her to make an informed decision. <clears throat> her options are genetic testing and finally, extirpation. Be aware that those women are not sick. In the case of pregnant women, the main patient is the unborn, a patient that cannot be healed, 
but only be aborted. In the case of breast cancer, genetic tests would only lead to in intensive surveillance and the option of mammectomy. In order to enable counseling clients to make a so-called informed and self-responsible decision, counselors instructed them about Mendel's laws, biostatistics, and the weighing of risks. When I reported to Ivan for the first time on those genetic counseling sessions that I had observed, he was taken aback. Pregnant women being instructed about genetics and biostatistics in order to cajole them into making a decision about their coming child. He was so intrigued by these sessions that, for example, in his talk, and do not lead us into diagnosis, he dedicated a long section on genetic counseling. So why was Ivan so intrigued by these genetic educational rituals? Why did he refer to them in his talks? I think that Ivan immediately realized that these sessions represented a new era in medicine, that they typified what I now want to call, uh, because I have no better words for it, but health in the age of systems, or maybe management in the, health of, uh, in the age of systems. So in the next minutes, I would like to spell out how genetic counseling was, so to say, pregnant with what we are facing today concerning health. Analyzing the present through the burning glass of genetic counseling, I think, is still a fruitful undertaking. I have nine theses about health in the age of systems, that, um, namely the following. First of all, health in the age of systems means being treated as a risk profile. And then I will explain them step by step, but I tell you the nine theses first. It means being treated as a risk profile. It means generalizing suspicion. It means constant surveillance. It means the intermingling of personal and public health, if you can call it health at all. It means being blackmailed by responsibility. It means the growing irrelevance of healing and healing arts. It means the destruction of social ties. And uh, eighth, um, no, this is the eighth um, thesis. It means the annihilation of meaning. And last point, it means the destruction of personal judgment. So my first thesis, it means being treated, treated as a risk profile. Genetic counseling clients do not suffer from any disease, disease but from statistical risk. What makes them sick is not a present headache, a fever, a heart attack, or any other calamity, but the idea of what might happen tomorrow. The main task of the genetic counselor is calculating a risk profile to, of the client. Be it, for example, age 38, mother with club foot, high risk of Down syndrome, or age 42, three cases of colon cancer in her family, irritable bowel syndrome. From these profiles, the geneticist infers test options and his client's possible future. Be aware, a risk is not a diagnosis. It is not a statement about what is. It is a statement, uh, it is a statistical ca calculation of an unknown future. As uh, medical sociologist David Armstrong has put it, calculating and recalculating risk profiles has become part of the core task of medicine. David Cayley yesterday stressed or criticized that corona management was all about risk. And with digitalization in health, medicine centering on risk becomes uh, or uh, comes to its full blossoms. With diagnostic and therapeutic apps on the smartphone or on the computer and in doctor's offices, medical decisions 
do not emanate from the concrete body of the patient anymore, but are derived from statistical collectives on probability spaces. Software calculates and recalculates risk factors that are interpreted as a latent future, a latent future threat to health against which preemptive action has to be taken. <coughs> So, so health in the age of systems does not treat what is present, but is committed to manipulate a statistically anticipated future. <coughs> so, Okay, <clears throat> second thesis. <clears throat> I hope I make all nine now. <clears throat> Otherwise, someone has to jump in, maybe. So, I speak a little less loud, and that's the microphone anyway. <clears throat> so, second thesis. Um, as in the age of system means generalizing suspicion. As genetic counselors tell their pregnant clients, everyone is at risk. Every pregnancy bears a so-called base risk that <coughs> the child might be sick and handi handicapped. This is why every pregnant woman is subjected to tests and counseling procedures. As the medical sociologist David Armstrong has analyzed 30 years ago, today's risk-oriented medicine blurs the difference between normal <clears throat> and pathological, which so far had shaped medical thinking and acting. Prenatal diagnostics declares <clears throat> that all pregnant women are in need of care, even if nothing is wrong with them. No longer are the ill the sole targets of medical monitoring and treatment. In the age of prevention, medicine targets the healthy population in particular and requires, as Armstrong puts it, <coughs> requires the dissolution of the distinct clinical categories of healthy and ill as it attempts to bring everyone within its network of visibility. One second. This is all on YouTube now? I don't believe it. Oh my God. No, I think can it's better. I have to take this tablet out of the way. Let's hold me another one. So in the field of crime prevention, where basically the same techniques of statistical anticipation and surveillance are implemented, criminologists call this <coughs> the generalization of suspicion. <coughs> this means everybody is turned into a suspect. Everybody is seen as a potential thief or terrorist or super spreader until proven otherwise. <coughs> I'm sorry, this is ridiculous. Thus, technologies of prevention precariously invert a legal concept that is fundamental for constitutional democracy, the legal concept of innocent until proven guilty. In the age of risk, whole populations stay, stay suspect until they prove their health or innocence. 
What the sleeper in crime prevention is the asymptomatic sick in the area of health. The inconspicuous, non-descriptly non person who could be of the greatest risk. Face masks in everyday life symbolize this presumption that everybody is first and foremost a risk. So health in the age of systems turns everyone into a suspect. Third, this also means constant surveillance. In the 1990s, David Armstrong has called risk-centered medicine surveillance medicine. If medicine aims at manipulating the future, where presence is under continuous control. In the age of digitalization, surveillance is proliferating. Everything can be interpreted as a risk to health, from infections to riots to dwindling trust in authorities and institutions. Long before corona, in the 90s, health experts of the WHO, military and public health departments, together have installed a global digital surveillance system in order to detect health and security threats in real time or even pre preventively. They do not rely on official channels and statements anymore, but rather on the accumulation of everyday and personal data, such as media reports or Facebooks, Facebook posts. For example, the 2005 revision of the international health regulations have expanded mandatory reporting from, unknown, uh, from known communicable diseases, that is, professionally asserted health threats, to events that create the potential for disease. This has broadened the scope of surveillance and left much room for establishing what counts as relevant to public health. Vaccination refusal, for example, could be also interpreted as such potentially relevant event. In fact, vaccination critics' sentiments communicated in social media have long been uh, analyzed by digital, uh, by digital epidemiolo epidemiologists. Thus, health in the age of systems means constant surveillance. Fourth. It also means intermingling personal and public health, or maybe I uh, should rather say the breakdown of this crucial difference between public health and personal well-being. Not only is the globe covered with a net of surveillance technologies, but also people themselves. Citizens routinely track their personal health and fitness status with wearables manage themselves with health apps and subscribe to flu alerts or things like that. The innumerable traces that people leave from their myriad activities online, from searching for information or Facebook posts, comprise the raw material for new risks and suspicions, from a spreading flu to a threatening heart attack and to vaccine hesitancy. Yet these personal data, generated for private purposes, can only be interpreted in the light of epidemiology. Even the most personalized risk profile still needs reference to population statistics to be more than a database of random information. Thus, self-surveillance and self-profiling blurs the boundary between public and personal health. You see, the, only, the one only works with the other together. But that also means that if you manage your own health, so to say, with digital apps and digital data, you always have this uh, epidemiologic data in, in there. You, are, you rule yourself according to public health, so to say. And so um, that means self-surveillance and global surveillance converge, both technically and epistemically. My fifth thesis, health and GA in the age of systems means being blackmailed by the call for responsibility. In genetic counseling, women are asked to make a so-called eigenverantwortliche in German, in English, self-responsible decision. They are persuaded to take responsibility for something no one 
can res be responsible for. They are asked to feel responsible for something no one can be responsible for, namely for the outcome of their pregnancy. Bill Arney, the author of Experts in the Age of System, has already claimed in the 80s that when society and technology are organized according to the premises and concepts of systems thinking, no one can really act in a responsible way anymore. Those ones who try, he claims, are quickly dismissed. And we see today in institutions like clinics or care homes, doctors and nurses state frankly that they cannot act responsibly anymore. In a system that leaves them no time for dialogue and forces them to treat patients as risks, immune systems and financial resources. But, but the less people can actually uh, be responsible or act responsibly, the louder the call for responsibility. During the last two years, responsibility has become an imperative. Acting responsibly meant following the corona rules um, and not following them was stigmatized as being irresponsible. So responsibility was equalized with, with obeying rules. This is more than an inept nomenclature, especially young people were effectively blackmailed by the idea of responsibility concerning an infection that in most cases is even not tangible. Suddenly they were pushed into feeling responsible for preventing their family and friends falling sick. Every meeting was overshadowed by the potential threat of infection caused by some apparently irresponsible action such as visiting or being close to each other. And I think this kind of blackmailing was much more effective than just uh, the imperative of uh, stay home. In 1995, Ivan Illich gave a talk uh, called Health in One's Own Responsibility, Thank You No, when he renounced both responsibility and health. There's no way to act responsibly in a world of climate catastrophe, genetic manipulation, and, as he certainly would add today, a regime aiming at the control of a respir respiratory virus. Responsibility is the flip side of technical megalomania, he argues, and therefore, to remain sound and decent, we first of all have to face our own impotence. So my sixth thesis is that uh, health in the age of systems means growing, the growing irrelevance of the healing arts. Or maybe it is, uh, is I should also, maybe it's closer um, connected also the, to the loss of the, of the yeah, loss of the medical establishment, but we, we can discuss this later if there's a relationship and which kinds of relationship. So a geneticist is not a doctor. He or she belongs to a discipline that focuses on the prevention, not of disease, but of sick people. There's no therapy he can offer, neither to his pregnant client, nor to the woman scared of breast cancer. He cannot even give advice to his clients because there's nothing he can actually say about the concrete person in front of him. All he does is executing an educational program. Therefore, in some places, genetic counselors have already been displaced by online courses. But also in other areas, we face a growing irrelevance of the healing arts. Psychotherapists are increasingly substituted by chatbots. Vobot, for example, is ready to listen to you 24 hours and seven hours um, a week, and has, as a user says, plenty of human warmth. Wobot is a therapeutic chatbot. And during the corona crisis, the traditional healing arts, no matter if family doctors or other practitioners, were literally disabled. German health authorities, when informing people about their positive test result on the phone, simply wished them good luck. And then they added, when your health condition really aggravates, go to, the emergency, uh, go to the emergency ward. And I know of practitioners 
who treated their corona patients secretly and asked them to come uh, uh, in the darkness at night into their practice because they weren't allowed, of course, to leave their home. Doctors were not allowed to enter their home, so they came secretly at night to the practice. So health in the age of system means the disabling of healing. Seventh thesis, it also means the destruction of social ties. Most women who undergo genetic counseling are in good hope. They are happily expecting a baby. Yet in the counseling session, their coming child is transmogrified into a bundle of risks. They are asked to, me, uh, they are asked to treat the unborn like a parcel of shares that according to its prospects of growth is to be kept or disposed of. I remember a small instance in the second summer of corona that also shares, uh, shows the uh, destruction of social ties. We took, this is a personal anecdote now, we took my mother to one of the beautiful German islands in the North Sea. We waited in a long line for embarking. It was a fresh and windy summer day and at public transport like buses and trains, face masks were mandatory. This included the ferries. So my mother, aged 83, was happy to breathe some fresh air after a strenuous ride on the bus. Suddenly, and she had her mask here, suddenly she was shouted at by a service employee, put your mask on, just this command. My mother was not seen as an elderly woman, as a grandmother of two youngsters standing beside her, but only as a risk and rule breaker. So health in the age of systems means the destruction of social ties and social manners. And as, uh, after yesterday, I would also add um, this kind of imperative that the staff has apparently immediately uh, uh, understood that this is just an imperative, nothing else, has something to do with the state of the exception we talked about yesterday, um, since David and especially David, but also um, Sajai said, um, the imperative has become the mode of governance then, C referring to George Agamben. So, last two theses. It also means, health and the age of system means the annihilation of meaning. When pregnant women in genetic counseling sessions are faced with different risks, they mostly are at a loss. For example, the counselor says, at your age, you have a 0.8 risk for a child with Down syndrome and a 0.5 risk of losing a child through genetic testing. So these are the options. Two different risks. Perplexed, some of them asked the counselor to inter interpret these numbers. But counselors strictly refrain from doing so. Not only to avoid lawsuits, in case the child is not how the parents expected, but also because they cannot. For a doctor, there's no way to interpret statistical risks to give those numbers any meaning in reference to a particular person. But no matter how much women agonize over the risk figures and the decisions they are asked to make, the genetic instructions have had their effect. In any case, her hope, confidence, and affection have been annihilated. Trying to understand corona measures of the last two years to make sense of them, or to, not, to many of them, let's say, or to find a meaning also means wrecking one's brain. And you know, in Germany, at least, an inoculation, which clearly does not prevent infections, has been made mandatory for health workers to protect the vulnerable. Even the RKI says it doesn't prevent infections, but nevertheless, it's mandatory. Old people, um, and David mentioned that yesterday also, old people at the end of their life are brutally isolated from their dear ones to protect them from dying. Face masks are required on the outer areas of a ship in the stiff breeze of the North Sea. And police in Germany even controlled if people were wearing masks when they were in, went sledding with their kids in the winter during a few days of snow and clear air. So health in the age of system means being governed 
by meaningless imperatives. Last thesis. It also means the destruction of personal judgment. And I think this is a thesis that was very important to Ivan too. The decision the genetic counselor asked the clients to make, Ivan insisted, has nothing to do with what decision once meant. I quote Ivan now. He says, on another occasion, he says, actio humana, as distinct from the actio hominis, qui habit aures, requires judgment evaluated by common sense and desire rooted in the flesh. It requires senses that are at home and an autoception that results from experience. Common sense, desire, and senses are all done away with in the modern healthcare. And genetic counseling, again, is a prime example. The counselor asks his client to weigh statistical risks. She can either opt for the risk of a handicapped child or for the risk of a positive genetic test, which would force her to consider an abortion. In any case, what she learns is that her pregnancy is now a matter of her decision. No one can tell her what to do, because there is no sensible distinction between both options. She is asked to choose, or, as Ivan formulated it, to throw dice between two probabilities. She is asked to gamble. And I quote Ivan again, I consider immoral to sur the surreptitious transfer from the counselor to the counseled of a scaffolding according to which moral decision ought to be made on the basis of technical options according to which an embodied commitment could never be founded on scientific facts. So genetic counseling can be seen as a precursor of the various educational rituals that we are facing today in the health system, be it diet, counselor, or online depressant therapy, and many more. I just made some examples. Each of them asks us to create a risk profile of ourselves and then click one of the options the system accordingly offers. <clears throat> and since corona, it has become much more commonplace to act according to test results and rules instead of common sense and commitment. So is there also, last sentence, is there also something, also something like healing in the age of systems? Because this was my original title, and I talk much more about health in the age of systems. I have to admit, I don't know, but I hope so. And at the end now of my talk, I want to quote Ivan again. And it's my, I read it first in English because it's my translation, and it might not be well-fitting, so I also repeat the German original. So Ivan once asked himself, is it possible in the company of incarnate persons who face each other to build on the tradition in which the ought is oriented towards causa finalis, is resolved with prudence and supported by practice pathos. In German, ich frage mich, ob es nicht doch möglich ist, im Umgang mit leibhaftigen Menschen, die füreinander Gesicht haben und einander riechen und leiden können. This I didn't know how to translate, but it's beautiful in German. You can say, I can suffer you and I can smell you. So, say, die sich riechen und leiden können auf der Tradition weiterzubauen, in der das Sollen durch die Causa Finalis ausgerichtet, mit besonderer Klugheit entschlossen und durch geübtes Pathos getragen wird. And I think this is a question we can ask here. Vielen herzlichen Dank für diesen uh, thank you very much for this, uh, for this uh, presentation. It was, I was very much um, a flashback since I did my PhD on transhumanism, which in many cases is just what you have described on steroids. It's just people <laughs> making this sort of, uh, and, and taking it as far as one can think. So thank you very much for this inspiring talk. We will now take one hour-ish, uh, 55 minutes for a convivium to continue. Uh, informal discussions be together here and I would just ask you that you would be here at 
two minutes before 11 so that we can uh, start timely with the next presentation. And so, do you want to say something also? I only add that during the break I will be at the reception desk, so for any questions of uh, money, reimbursement, and so on.
everyone for the second session of our morning here. Uh, I apologize for the delay. Uh, I was involved in a very interesting conversation with Barbara Duden. This is perhaps uh, the meaning also of this convivium uh, time between the sessions. But I'm very pleased now to introduce very briefly our next speaker, Martina, Martina Kalla. Uh, she's from Vienna. She's a philosopher and a historian. Uh, she's professor for history of modern times in Vienna. Uh, and you, Martina, are responsible uh, for uh, me being or getting involved and inspired by the thoughts and life of Ivan Illich because one of the first books I read about Ivan Illich was your biography, uh, biography and intellectual uh, study about the, the thought of Ivan Illich. So thank you very much and the floor is yours. Thank you, Luca. Thank you for this kind invitation and for having me here. I, even if it looks like that's not going to be a presentation, I just um, thought I will show you some pictures of places in the 40s, 50s, 60s, actually Cuenavaca. This is my focus. I originally thought I would talk about the, the, the legal case of CDOC, and then I came across that I already have written that, and everybody can also check the key corners of or the key issues of this uh, legal accusation of CDOC and the final ban of the place uh, in a, a booklet which was published in CDOC itself. It's uh, one of the three publications they had lines. One was Quadernos, the most uh, known one. The other was Sondeos. And then there were these dossiers, and then dossier 61, there you will find a collection also of uh, newspaper articles. And of course, they were chosen from people at CDOC. Basically, I hope, I think that Ivan had a hand in it. So I was, um, of course, what you see here, this picture is not Ivan Illich. Uh, it is the picture of Gustavo Esteva. He was, unfortunately was, uh, he died this year in March, uh, also already aged. And um, he was uh, a Mexican, a Mexican writer, a very, um, how to say, you know, uh, very sensitive person for also activism or coming up with new um, movements which are not necessarily defined politically. Uh, he was, for instance, an advisor, on, one of the first advisors to the Zapatistas, the Neo-Zapatistas, the Chiapas. And he was a person who really was moving around in whole places. He, he started as a guerrillero, and then he became uh, a member of the Ministry of Planification in Mexico during the Petrodollar's time. So, and then he uh, abruptly stopped that and joined grassroots movements, etc. So, he's a very, you know, multiple. He was a very multiple uh, personality, and besides, he knew. Uh, Ivan Illich in 1985. So Ivan never was uh, at the sea talk. He was not a witness uh, of it. But he, what he always said, that when he started to read and to talk to Ivan Illich, that he finally um, discovered a language for what he was seeing in his environment in the grassroots, in Los Pueblos, uh, with La Gente, with, with the people who have their own presence. They have, they have their community, and they have different ways of dealing and also different values. I cannot go into depth of that, but I will show and I will try to connect these uh, inquiries here, also in my conversation with you, and um, yeah that will come later. For me, Gustavo Esteva was my 
uh, inspirer, my, my first contact with this weird uh, knowledge. <laughs> I, I found it completely weird what he told me. I, I remember the, the first time when I read Gender, and I, it was like I, I went into a drown somehow because that was everything so new and fascinating at the same time. So, um, but it was uh, Gustavo Esteva who introduced me to these readings. And uh, Gustavo, uh, finally, we, we knew each other in 1990. I was rather young. He, I passed through this brainwashing um, towards Illich. And uh, then uh, we decided that I'm going to translate a text of, by him. And uh, we uh, published a book with text by Gustavo Esteva. And when you're translating, you have to also know what your author had read, what he has in mind, his authors. And that was the moment when I really had to dig deeply into Ivan Illich's um, writings. And uh, yeah, and it was fascinating. I already mentioned that. And yeah, and uh, I want to say one, uh, one comment in this conversation about this book. Uh, it is not a biography per se, because the biography suggests that there is a narrative which starts somewhere with, with birth and ends with dying, and uh, that there's a coherent life. Uh, nobody has a coherent life, and also this narrative cannot exist. And my initial intention was to contextualize uh, Ivan Illich's uh, lifetime for my students because I myself had to study, for instance, the 1960s. Yeah? I had to go to the archives in Vienna to check this uh, legacy of the Ringstreit family, etc. Yeah? So uh, I thought that would be helpful and hopefully inviting my students to learn more about. And what is more important, that my book, yeah, Stops in 1982. That's the last event, the big scandal in Berkeley. Uh, you see uh, Berkeley, and uh, and that was it. Because I'm aware that after that time, there were so many people already in his uh, proximity, and there were so many people collaborating, and they were writing themselves, and they enriched, and they stayed in permanent conversation. So that's uh, not on me to interpret them. I still, you know, I'm, I'm in a position of learning and being amazed uh, every, every moment by often every word. And I was very uh, touched that when uh, in yesterday in the morning uh, there was this question of physical place or what space is. And then I felt such a deep longing to go back to Mexico again. And somehow, when I prepared this uh, um, conversation, I kind of anticipated it. And I will go so <laughs> in December, uh, because I haven't been there for a long time. I lived there. I studied in Mexico. I did my field work in Oaxaca, uh, close to the place of uh, Gustavo, he was my advisor, but the, my, you know, the consecration that I wanted to get was not the commission of the habilitation. It was uh, Ivan Illich's uh, comments, and he did so on, on the whole manuscript, and I keep that still with his annotations, and I always remem will remember the long phone, phone call we had afterwards. Yeah. So um, what I'm going to share with you is I, I started to call it even Illich under the volcano because Buenavaca is not a place, a, a, some place. It's a very particular place. Uh, the state of Morelos is so <laughs> important. It was so important in the pre-history, uh, in the pre-Columbia uh, history, and it was, became so important also during all phases of Mexican history, and it's such a pity that 
this um, state is so destroyed and so much exposed to violence, uh, and it's really a pity. Yeah? So I will invite you uh, to also see some pictures of the older uh, Cuenavaca where Illich uh, settled his thinkery. And um, yeah, maybe you know this very famous uh, novel under the volcano by Malcolm Lowry. It was also, yeah, it was published in 1947. And I would say this was the moment when the big rush to Guanabaca started because it became very early a tourist hub uh, in, of Mexico. Yeah. And um, yeah, first for the American gringos and then for all other gringos. Gringos are white people in the Mexican notion. And then uh, this book, uh, Los Volcanos de Cuernavaca, is a publication by a journalist from uh, Cuernavaca. Actually, it's a collection of uh, interviews, of 21 interviews, people who lived around, worked around, together with the bishop of Cuenavaca, uh, Don Sergio Mendes Arceo, which was a key figure also in this legal case, because I don't want to go into details. We can do that afterwards in the convivium. But the, the, the case Cuenavaca, the legal case Cuenavaca, um, is not what I have concluded in my book in 2007. It was not a case against Ivan Illich, nor a case against Georges Lemassier. It was against, and was not against, but it was a direct aggression to the Bishop of Cuenavaca. So it's worth to talk to him. And what I'm doing now, I'm, I'm coming from outside, yeah, from the Cuenavaca uh, environment to kind of understand, yeah, first, where the thinkery took place, not only physically, but also its network, its local network. And secondly, what were the most questions in the 1960s that these people who were connected in uh, Cuenavaca uh, shared? OK. Now we will go quickly through some uh, images. That's a postcard from the late 1940s in Guanabaca. You see, this is a vibrant uh, uh, street where also there were already cars, so it was paved by them. And you see all these tags and announcement, and some of them are already written in English. Uh, maybe it's not sharp enough because I zoomed it on my, my device and could see that. This is another postcard. Up here. Ah. <laughs> and it shows, not this one, this one is part of the same time and it shows, as you see uh, below Del Chula Vista, it's this building in the corner, <coughs> the curve, and that was the first place where um, the then Sikh, before it became Sirak, was um, uh, settled, yeah, and uh, it was a former hotel, and they turned it into a center for the formation of future miss missionaries and um, other people, the Peace Corps, etc., people who uh, went to serve uh, in Latin America. Mexico is kind of the door that was the open door to uh, Latin America. It was, the, it was reachable from the United States. You could go there by bus. It took you about so two or three days, depending where you came from, but it was feasible. Yeah? Also for young people, you didn't have to take a flight necessarily. That came later when the Europeans also joined in this marvelous place. This is already a, play, a, a photograph of the, 19, the early 1970s. That's a photograph of the terrace of a hotel. So you see already there are changes, not only in the type of photograph, but this, in this moment, in the 1960s, 
70s. That were the two decades when Cuernavaca was a big, big tourist house, uh, hub. Yeah. And yeah, here maybe I skipped that, but I like these uh, two postcards where young people, obviously young people are describing, we're not from Sidor, uh, uh, yeah? But it's kind of the mood no? that they describe that they had a good time, that I, they don't want to go back to check the grades. So it was obviously a student who was writing back and, uh, and then at the end he says, I got you a Batman comic book in Spanish. Uh, so that's <laughs> uh, very much like uh, today's uh, WhatsApp message would look Look like. This is a very nice also um, postcard and it says, hi, we'll write you tonight and explain the circumstances that arose last night. My trip back with two trunks and a sleepy girl was most enjoyable. These kind of people, these young people, yeah, we are not talking about the, the, the clerks and the, the priests and the nuns and the missionaries, but these were the people who went to Cuernavaca to have fun. Yeah, that was the environment uh, in which also a lot more serious project, and that was of course uh, the Sikh and later Sea Dog uh, was um, placed. Now I have to skip that and open. Oh, oh. This one, uh, of course, now finally we have a photograph. Uh, it reminds me that uh, Ivan Illich was very young when he was in Cuernavaca. Uh, everything was uh, what I heard this today and yesterday was uh, from a person who already had developed a lot of had many insights, was uh, not only inspiring, he was. His, his sentences, his wording, yeah, were so solid. Yeah. Which at the beginning, if I imagine that I'm 34 and I just get to Mexico and I start this um, thinkery there and uh, with also the contract with uh, the church, yeah, the North American church, uh, that you are still open and you're still building yourself. Yeah, so this is very important, even was young in Cuernavaca. And if you look here, I have some pics of, of the establishment already. The second one, that's not uh, Chula Vista anymore. Uh, the, that's um, the second, La Casa Blanca. And when I look closer to these pics of 1974, it looks really like a very recreational uh, place, uh, silent, warm, well equipped, very stylish in the best sense. Yeah. So um, there was something, you know, of this common environment which you also could find in Sea I'm not talking about what you learned there, but where you have been physically, which place it was, yeah? And here we have a pic that shows uh, some people around the table, and this were the famous breakfasts in um, Sitok, where um, Ivan would join whoever, yeah? wanted to talk to him. These were very serious talks, according to what people remembered, who, who are doctors, um, whose rem memories are partly also documented in the chapter, Sidok was a magic place of my book. And uh, yeah, so uh, you could approach um, Ivan and uh, people told me, and then he would ask you, what were your last three books? And if you had problems to reply or to answer that question, he most probably wouldn't have continued an uh, in-depth conversation by then. And I remember yesterday, uh, Barbara told us that Ivan was so quick, yes, almost accelerated in digesting so many readings. Yeah? And I think he also uh, needed inspiration 
from these other people joining him here in this table because uh, Ivan was everything else than a, a person who would talk from above to you, uh, old fashioned professor. Now he was approachable. Okay, this was the part with the pics and the fun, the impressions. Then, this is very briefly, just to understand what Morelos and Cuernavaca is. I highlighted only very few names here of the most famous people in Cuernavaca. Of course, in Morelos, it's first and all above Emiliano Zapata, the leader of La Revolución del Sur. Uh, he succeeded the leader of the peasant movement in the Mexican Revolution. Then Lázaro Cárdenas is a very important person. He was a president in uh, the um, 30s and until 1940, it was six years uh, that the Mexican president stays in position. And he was the one who nationalized uh, the oil resources, everything, yeah, what was soil and below soil. That is very important because since 1940, no foreigner could possess a surface. <laughs> that means also he couldn't or she couldn't buy a house yeah, because it was built on Mexican surface. So, uh, and also Menes Arceo was uh, a relative of Lázaro Cárdenas. And then here I have Luis de Chavarria. It's not so important for that context. Uh, and yeah, and then I also uh, hear the religious figures, which is very important, was later important also for, for the decision of um, Menes Arceo, Illich, and many others to um, to live in Ocotepec is there was a, a, a finding of 6th, 17th century of a monastery, yeah, because the hospital was a monastery, and it still exists. Yeah, there was a clear connection to a female uh, monastery. Then we already had Gregorio or Georges Le Messier. And uh, for me, the central figure uh, is Sergio Mendes Arceo. I will come back to him. Um, and maybe we also should think in Juan Jesus Posadas Ocampo, who was the follower of, uh, of uh, Bishop Mendes Arceo, and he was one of the most conservative reactionary bishops, not only in Cuenavaca. And he made quite a career because he became a cardinal later after uh, he retired from uh, the diocese of Cuenavaca. Then, Guanabaca and Morelos was, since the 40s, I already mentioned it, a place where artists went. Yeah, because it's so marvelous. And wherever you step, you would step on a pyramid and you will be emerged in this profound Mexico. Uh, and uh, so also Frida Kahlo, who you might know, Wolfgang Palm, Diego Rivera, Rufino Tamayo, most, most famous uh, painters. Wow. I'm really running out. <laughs> OK, I just need to speed up, because I put here my, my alarm clock, because <laughs> I'm used to one and a half hour talk. <laughs> OK, what I, I think what is most important, and we can also talk about the, the, the ideological backgrounds. There were so many accusations of being communist or not communist, of being communist. And if you're a communist, you're not. Um, able to be a Christian, you know, that was the 60s, and it was very much in Latin America because the Cold War took place in Latin America in the 60s. Remember 1959, uh, the Cuban Revolution, then uh, the uh, Big Bay, almost nuclear clash between the Soviet Union and uh, the US, then the Alliance of Progress, complete you know, colonization process of development, which turned out to become a, a counterinsurgency initiative more than anything else against communism. Then remember, for instance, 1964, the coup d'etat in Brazil, uh, with all the, the victims who had to flee from there. Some of them also uh, came to CIDOC and spent some time there, like Paulo Freire. Uh, or Francisco Julião, 
And, um, and then what else? Yeah, La Unidad Popular in Chile. Yeah, that was a big hope, yeah, which ended with the defeat of the elected president, Salvador Allende, in 1973. This was quite a time, yeah? And I could add many other uh, uh, highlights of this time. But what concerned people, like Erich Fromm was in uh, Cuenavaca, and he was a very close uh, fatherly friend of uh, Ivan Illich, and he was, they were all kind of interested how this transition from a basic rural society to an industrial society, how, not only how that takes place, but what happens to the people? What happens? Because it's a very drastic shift. In Mexico, it was a rush yeah, after Cárdenas. Yeah, the, the industrialization was enormous. The uh, GDP growth was enormous. And then uh, in, after 73, Mexico became really rich with the petrodollars uh, because of the energy crisis, and Mexico is very, very rich in um, fuel resources, fossil fuel resources. So uh, Eric Form was an anthropologist from Chicago. He uh, wrote this book, or he published that book, Social Character in a Mexican Village. And this is a book, and this is a study which was conducted over many years by Eric Form and his younger colleague, um, McCovey, and all the people yeah, who were around uh, Ivan and around you know, Sergio Menes Arceo, there was one bubble to say. They were all very interested, and they would always refer at least to the intention to understand with uh, psych psychoanalytical means yeah, the collective psyche of people who lift this traumatic shift. And am I still here on? So I will skip over. Ooh. Yeah. And you know, there were other people behind this question in um, it's basically the United States. The, uh, yeah, that was already said. Oscar Lewis might be a known an anthropologist who came up with the concept of the culture of poverty. Yeah. Very pessimistic, but also a very interesting study. They all had studied in Morelos. Yeah. They all did their first field works in Morelos, often in Tepoztlan, which is close to Guanajuato. Yeah. Uh, also, Robert Redfield, the primitive world and its transformation the question of the transformation, what to do, that was a very traumatic situation, yeah? Uh, a crisis all over the place, except uh, companies and development agencies. Then also Eric Wolf, who sp spoke about the close corporate communities that they didn't exist after 65 about, yeah? There was no way out of this development rush, of this modernization, monetarization rush, and that was tremendous. And of course, also, um, Menes Aceo was very much interested in studies uh, related to this question, because uh, just to summarize who he was, he was uh, in favor of, and he was formed part uh, of the theology of liberation. He was in favor of Vatican Two, he was uh, a person committed. He said he was a, uh, belonged to the group Catholicos para el Socialismo. He uh, went to Cuba when nobody else went to Cuba, and he was just uh, a mess for <laughs> the Mexican uh, clergy, yeah, because he was the only one, yeah, who would take this path. That was not what Ivan Illich was interested. He didn't commit to this immediate political um, questions and activities. And he, he didn't agree uh, with many of uh, the reforms of the Vatican II, especially of sending out missionaries all over the world and renovate the mission. Uh, he was not in favor of the theology of liberation, but he hosted all these people. He was not a career at all. 
Yeah? I would say when it, a revolution would start, it would keep quite in the center of the wheel yeah? to not get uh, thrown out by the energy. The, the, and yeah, but they were all very, uh, these were people who really had respect and loved it, uh, each other and liked to listen to each other and to learn from each other. And this is very specific in this context uh, of the big names to say in Cuernavaca that the, this pending question, how to survive yeah, as a pueblo in this world, in this crisis, yeah, in this uh, destruction, yeah, how which signs could you set? That was very, very important. And uh, Don Sergio and Ivan often met uh, for long prayings. Yeah? So also to inspire them because they were so exposed to be questioned, also aggressions from all sides. So they also, they found uh, in praying, they found also um, their silence and their strength. And I guess I will finish with that picture because it's really fascinating. Uh, the Cathedral of Cuenavaca is the oldest cathedral of all over Latin America. Uh, it was built in the first Franciscan and also in this very typical style with the one tower. Yeah? Uh, uh, you can see that all over Latin America, but, uh, and especially in Mexico, they were always renovated and they were uh, considered a patrimonial uh, cultural. The, the Mexico. And what, when um, Bishop Aceo Mendes arrived in, uh, as a bishop in Cuenavaca in 1958, one of the first things he did that he remodeled the cathedral completely. This cathedral, all the walls and the decoration that was very neoclassicist. So to say 19th, 19th century neoclassicism, a lot of gold and a lot of you know, pictures and a lot of uh, statues of all kinds and of course uh, many uh, corners, places where you could uh, pray to send saints. And so that's the real final mm -hmm. <laughs> call. And, but it's only, and then he, when Menezes uh, Feo did, he let remove all of that. Yeah. And they went down to the first frescoes, the first graffitis. Yeah. There are very few left that you can see from the 16th century. And he opened the space to a public altar. So that was his statement, already you know, advancing the reforms of the Second Vatican Council. And uh, in this book that I showed, Los Volcanes de Cuenavaca, there's uh, this person this, uh, who was in charge, not as, a, not as an architect, but as a, as a, um, <coughs> a priest in the diocese, was in charge of this revelation. He talks about, and he talks how many, how often uh, Mendes Arceo came and insisted that I would break down more. And, go to the essential, essential and find the essential uh, church with the essential message. That's the place of the people. They had also, you know, mu music wise, there were mariachis who were coming to the cathedral. They would eat and sing at the cathedral. But it was, it still is a very special place. It's also built on top of a pyramid. And, um, and this clear vision and this deepness of this play, and then I imagine this is not a space, this is a place. How Don Sergio, uh, Don Ivan met there, were praying and inspiring himself, and with this spreading the chispas, the funken, the sparks. Yeah. I, you know, that was the conversation, probably some impressions that would like to continue these conversations in whatever context. Thank you. Ah, one more word. Sorry. This image, yeah? 
I, I don't know who knows where it comes from, where it was first published. It was in 1983 that uh, Ivan first published his text, Silence is a Comment. And it was uh, published in the Co-Evolution Quarterly in uh, San Francisco. And this uh, Co-Evolution Quarterly was published and led by Stuart Brand. They know each other from the time of the whole uh, world catalog, etc. I just wanted to mention that this uh, silence is the comments is my most preferred text. Yeah, that's my my meditating text. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. For Thank you very much, Martina for your presentation. I, I found it very interesting to hear towards the end that Ivan Illich and the Bishop of Cuernavaca, who apparently didn't share all uh, the ideas that they had about the church and the way in which um, reforms, for example, should happen, that they were be able, and not only able, but they, they, they were convinced that a common uh, basis for living together and think together was prayer together, uh, which for me as a theologian is a, a very yeah, basic as insight. As a historian, I also share that they, even uh, Don Sergio, like, formed the Church of Cuernavaca, also Ah, yeah, that's all. That's very interesting too. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. That's yeah. So I have the pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Stefan Tautz, uh, a German theologian uh, based at the moment in Freiburg in Breisgau. But you studied in Leuven, you studied in Dresden, uh, you got many different inspirations uh, in an international context, and you are now presenting uh, a paper with the very interesting and very Elitian, I would say, title the Eucharist as politics. So, thank you. Thank you, Yuluka. Um, and as uh, many other people who um, presented here, I also start with the, the, um, the, the topic of how I am linked uh, to Illich. And the thing is, actually, I have to confess that before coming here, I was not so acquainted with his works. But uh, in preparation, reading about him, his works, and now listening to those people who actually knew him, I really get this uh, sensation of missing somebody I actually never have met. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Um, and uh, on a personal note, uh, Luca also already mentioned it. Um, I'm a theologian, a Catholic theologian, talking about the Eucharist. This is as hardcore as it might get, I think. Um, so this is a warning, um, but to all of you who are not uh, theologians or not Christians, I invite you to simply uh, think of convivial um, community when uh, I talk about the church. And I hope I will make this clear. And a second personal note, I might also count as a substitute for the US American Catholic theologian William Kavanagh. Um, in my view, he is far more acquainted with Illich's work, and he constructed his own political theology of the Eucharist, which, uh, in, um, in my view, can be, in a very fruitful way, be brought in dialogue uh, with Illich thought. So, uh, but since Kavanagh is otherwise engaged, uh, Barbara Hallens Levin came up very spontaneous with the idea that I might step in, for which I'm very grateful, and yeah, I personally did my dissertation on Kavanagh, so in that sense, I know quite of the work of Kavanagh. But um, this, of course, um, doesn't mean that I will simply try to mimic his argument or just uh, recite his thoughts on Illich. So instead, what I try to show is how by interpreting central um, axioms of Illich, in light of a political theology of the Eucharist, one might contrive the, the basic outlines of a vision of the church as a political body, which nevertheless takes into account uh, Illich's anti-institutional stance. 
And I think for this endeavor, Kavanagh's work is quite the perfect dialogue partner for at least two reasons. Um, firstly, although Kavanagh does not, qu not quote Illich extensively, he does so at central passages of his own work, which shows, to, to me at least, a, a basic at a shared basic attitude, for instance, towards some modern social and political phenomena, which both, in their respective way, uh, characterize as corruptions of the gospel. And secondly, despite this sharp, this, this shared criticism, their respective political counter theologies differ quite when it comes to the role of the church as an institution plays. It is not the case that um, we have on the one hand Illich, um, who can be associated with the mystical and um, individualized solution and Kavanagh's Eucharistic ec ecclesiology with the all too real, concrete, uh, institutionalized option. In fact, I think both thinkers um, particularly distinguish themselves by balancing out both the mystical and um, the real, the concrete aspects in their, in their respective ways. And yet, Kavanagh's political theology allows more than Illich's approach does to discern the social, the communal, and political dimension of the kingdom among us. Or as uh, Agamben puts it, the very particular kind of presence here now, no, this can't be true. <laughs> um, so, and I think this ultimately is due to Kavanagh's methodological concentration on the Eucharist. And I characterize it as methodological because he is not primarily an advocate of a specific Roman Catholic Eucharistic ecclesiology, typical for the first part of the 20th century and famously associated with visions of the church as societas perfecta, opposing yeah, the outside world. Rather, Kavanagh mainly concentrates on the specific way the church as political body, body of Christ, is constituted, namely by a liturgical enactment in the celebration of the sacrament of the altar. This liturgical enactment, this performance, Kavanagh also describes as a special form of a political performance to organize bodies in space and time. And it's I think it's precisely this lens of political performances in which bodies are organized, which might be helpful to further think about how Illich's conviviality might fit to a concrete social political body. So this methodological lens, moreover, also allows us to bring Illich two forms of the church closer together, the church as she and the church as it. Um, so my proposition is that having the Eucharist as uh, the point of convergence of political theology has the advantage that the corresponding body politic inevitably inherits this dynamic tension between the mystical and the real. So this tension I interpret also as perichoretic. Both aspects are indissolvably interwoven and pushed towards, yet, a manifestation, the mystical element of the kingdom resisting any institutionalization, and at the same time, precisely in the gesture of resistance to concrete manifestation, since fleshing out itself. So also in a social and a convivial sense. So following this uh, Eucharistic methodology, um, I rely, of course, as a Catholic theologian on Catholic vocabulary, but nevertheless, in my view, this method reach, reaches far beyond Catholic boundaries, just also as Illich um, thought, like also Agamben notes, uh, he cannot be simply, his work cannot be separated between his time as a priest and after he resigned from any ecclesial office. So, um, to put it in Illich's words, um, who famously compared the kingdom with getting a joke, my underlying question is how we can think of a, a party community. Uh, I will proceed in four steps. I start with a short introduction in Kavanagh's political theology of the Eucharist. And here I, of course, concentrate on axioms he shares with Illich and the different views both derive from the thereof, con thereof con concerning the church. In step two, I turn again to Illich, analyzing his delicate tension 
uh, he himself holds between the subversive, eschatological, mystical aspect of the kingdom and its, its fleshiness, its lived conviviality. Uh, then in the third step, then I, um, I discern in how far Illich's plea for a concelebration of the kingdom might be enhanced with a liturgical and a sacramental interpretation of community. And finally, I conclude with some remarks on how such a convivial Eucharistic body might help us to widen also our understanding of what, what is at stake in liturgy and what sacrament really means. Kavanagh is perhaps best known to a wider audience for his work, um, The Myth of Religious Violence, um, in which he unmasks the underlying political motivation for distinguishing between supposedly irrational religious violence and secular violence, which, and here's the quote, is often necessary and sometimes praiseworthy, especially when used for the purpose of bringing the blessings and peacefulness of liberalism or to contain or prevent religious violence, end quote. Um, running from the separation between the religious and the secular is also the allocation of any political authority in the public sphere to the secular agency of the state, while religious sentiments are strictly limited to the private sphere. Kavanagh criticizes this notion because the secular state, in his eyes, is, is not this neutral uh, agent it claims to be, but rather a secularized theopolitical agent which emerged historically in, uh, in the cause of early modernity by slowly taking over any political authority from any other social body, and most notably, of course, the church. So accordingly, Kavanagh also speaks of the migrations of the holy into the state sphere, and not so much of the banishment, banishment from the now secular business of politics. The secular state can, for Kavanaugh, thus also be described as a simulacrum, a false copy of the body of Christ, um, with its own theopolitical soteriology in which, and this is also an interesting uh, observation, I think, salvation is essentially a matter of making peace among competing individuals. It is in this critical reading of um, the state's agency, particularly its effect on imagining and embodying social rela relations where Kavanagh follows Illich's dictum of the corruptio optimi pessima closest. Or as um, Stanley Hauermas notes, uh, in light of, and here I quote, in light of Kavanagh's account of the development of modern state, we are confronted with the uncomfortable realization, Christians have met the enemy and it is us, end quote. So, um, Kavanagh argues, when Christian charity is secularized, uh, it is um, in the precise sense of its transfer from church to civil control, the risk that the spirit of Jesus will be disembodied and lost is magnified. So accordingly, the welfare state for Kavanagh is a two-edged sword. So underneath the obvious benefits lurks also a social imagination in which the state liberates the individual from dependence upon others by creating a direct relationship of dependence between the individual and the state. It depicts for Kavanagh a distortion of and not a fulfillment of the gospel, of what he calls a truer Christian sociality that can be located in the Eucharist as the Christian social practice par excellence. So a true sociality in Kavanagh's sense is bodily and by explicitly referring to Illich, Kavanagh warns against modernity's process of disembodiment. And with Illich, um, Kavanagh refers to the incarnational foundation of Christianity and its legacy to the church as this prolonging of the incarnation as and how he interpreted this, the last uh, here, uh, quotation here, a network of personal relation that uh, crosses human-made boundaries but does not obliterate differences. Thus, Kavanagh concludes, what we can do is to turn to what is at heart of Christian sociality, our call to the body of Christ and build communities that offer the world a more personalized practice of social life. And I think it is precisely this question of community building where Kavanaugh's and Illich's shared analysis and critique do part. So for Kavanaugh, the crucial 
question is how the church will not only make pronouncements but act to organize bodies in space and time. Um, so the particular kind of political organization the church arises in the liturgical enactment of the Eucharist which uh, locates the church politically in a, in a rather precarious position we can find here in this longer quote. And uh, yeah, I read it to you. The church can participate in Eucharistic bodies in space and time that stand, in counter, stand as counterpolitics to violence and injustice while avoiding both church, state entanglement and the secularization and irrelevance of the church in the West. The church can act as a tertium quid, a body which is neither seeking to use coercive state power nor is reduced to a semi-private club. So um, this precarious position does not render the church otherworldly or sectarian, as Kavanagh clarifies, but, as in, but, in, in, but it is in a sharp discontinuity with the politics of the world which killed the savior, as he puts it. So this politics of the church might be best described as sacramental. And as this uh, dogmatic constitu constitution of the church, Lumen Gentium, holds, the church is in Christ, um, I quote, uh, like a sacrament or sign and instrument for the unity with Christ and among all humans. As sign and instrument, the church is already an embodiment of the kingdom. It represents. Yet, of course, it's not its full realization. The sacramental link between the church and the kingdom might be best described um, what we in theology call its eschatological nature. Or as Kavanaugh holds, in the Eucharist the church is always called to become what is eschatologically is. And as we will see, this eschatological uh, nature is central for both Illich and Kavanaugh. And yet I would claim that Kavanaugh argues for a much closer embracement of the eschatological presence in the Eucharistic celebration and the therein constituted political body. Institutionalization, in Kavanaugh's view, is just unavoidable. Um, what matters, in his view, is the implicit or explicit political theology underlying the body of the state or the, the um, Christ. So, as he puts it, what needs to be separated is good political theology from bad political theology. Precisely this is Kavanaugh's main concern for constructing his political theology of the Eucharist as a basis to resist and sometimes even oppose politics that deviate from the gospel. Of course, um, this very impulse uh, is also driving Illich, who, like Kavanaugh, bases his argument on this eschatological concept of the kingdom. And also Illich puts great emphasis on the balance between the already and the not yet of the kingdom as a reality among us, as he puts it, and not just a subjective individuality simply within us. But um, despite all his emphasis on the enfleshment of the gospel, he seems to be very hesitant when it comes to imagining the body compiled by this flesh. That's at least my proposition. Um, Illich seems determined to avoid any tendency to identify the kingdom with the it church. And correspondingly, he also would, for example, interpret the conversion of the emperor Constantine um, as the beginning of the corruption. Kavanaugh, on the other hand, distances himself from what he then calls the fall narrative because in his eyes this does not allow for a nuanced view on salvation history, pneumatology, and eventually also the character of the church. Instead he warns, and we can read this here, um, that the holiness and sinfulness in and of the church should not be neatly divided between visibility and invisibility, the pure and the apostate. What Constantine then might teach us is the insight that the church, as prolonging of the incarnation inevitably, is entangled in the sometimes muddy and corrupted stream of history. 
Um, well, I'm not sure if one rightly could charge this, uh, the historian Illich with some kind of historical forgetfulness, yet I found another um, interesting observation, and uh, maybe we can later discuss this. Um, and this is concerning Illich's reading of the church history, um, which most interestingly concerns the 12th century controversy on the Eucharist following the monk uh, Beringer of Tours' problematization of God's real presence in bread and wine. Illich interprets the, uh, this observation that at a certain time this experience became problematic as an initial sign for the change in the 12th century, which would then, in his view, eventually lead to modernity's disenfleshment of our perceptions, concepts, and senses. But, what Illich seems to miss here is Henri de Lebac's rediscovery of the social character of the Corpus Mysticum in his seminal study by the same name. As de Lebac, de, de Lebac shows, did the reaction to Beringer not only lead to the development of this concept of transubstantiation, thus also confirming the real presence of Christ in the Eucharistic host as the Corpus Verum, um, but more importantly, the concept of the corpus verum changed its meaning in the process. As the Lübeck points out, in the patristic and early medieval periods, it was the church as a social gathering which was regarded as corpus verum. And only due to this uh, interchanging of the meaning by, by the middle of the 12th century, the church would then be defined as corpus mysticum. And it is this interpretation of the mystical body which, in course of modernity, would take on the somewhat spiritual, otherworldly character which um, Illich opposes with his plea for enfleshment. So, um, thus, one might return to de Lübeck's famous slogan, the Eucharist makes the church. And this might help us to discern more closely how one could overcome a neatly division between the she and the it church, a consideration, of course, uh, which is not at all alien to Illich. Um, this ultimately leads to the question in how far Illich's emphasis on the celebration character of the kingdom and the liturgical constitution of the church can be brought together. And interestingly, it's Illich himself uh, who points in this direction when uh, here we can see how he comments on the establishment or how faith interplays with celebration. Faith manifests ritually in the celebration of the mysteries of the kingdom, the symbols of its presence. Faith is only acquired in concelebrating in the conviviality of the gratitude act as exemplified by a meal of bread and wine. The faithful believe in the celebration of the kingdom that is really present. Mm. So I think what we can here see is how Illich comments in the, in the con celebration, in the conviviality of the Eucharist, um, the, king, uh, the kingdom becomes present, and as the prefixes con signify, this presence occurs in community. One might characterize this community as mystical body insofar as it indeed is precarious. Kavanagh's elaboration of what he then calls the Eucharistic reconfiguration might be helpful here. And here we have also a quote, this eschatological imagination of the Eucharist will be key to reconfiguring the temporal, not as a space, but as a time, namely the time connecting Christ's first coming with his second. And due to this, uh, its eschatological orientation, or what um, Jürgen Kroh describes as the fragile presence of Eucharistic representation, the corresponding lit liturgical community is fragile too. It only becomes present in the performance of the sacrament of the Eucharist every time, again and again. So we not only celebrate the Eucharist once, but we do it weekly. Um, its time structure escapes both the domination of the chronicle time and the requirements of current time because it 
its transient presence is saturated, politically, uh, not uh, poetically put, it's saturated with eternity. We are able, as Illich puts it, to write the history for the future in the present. With Kavanagh, we might characterize the church then as an action, a dynamic calling together of a group of people by God. In, and in the early tradition, the Eucharist was the mystery of unity, a social action, binding people to one another. And here I have another proposition. Um, it is this particular power which allows the mystical body of Christ to resist opposing political performances of other actors in the world. It is a power of possibility, of the possibility of change, of the not to. Just as God's precarious sacramental presence could with Gerd Tyson, uh, be, and, and he's a Protestant uh, systematic theologian, uh, no, biblical um, theologian, um, it could be characterized as presence of change, Veränderungspräsenz. This power, however, could with Illich also be described as powerlessness because it is not under the control of humans, but it's more, yeah, it could be considered in the modus of, of kenosis. Correspondingly, the concept of, um, yeah, that's a Catholic uh, concept of the ex opere operato could be interpreted not as a guarantee of an institution, but as a gesture of disempowerment of the liturgy, liturgist facing the unconditional unavailability of God. So by making a free space at the center of the community, God might become present. And this might in the modus of might could possibly be elaborated also with um, Agamben's, what Agamben calls potenza destituente, um, which is a, as a form of power that maintains a constitutive ambiguity without and it's interesting, without dissolving the destituent moment into a purely constitutive one. So there's it's always somehow hoovering. I conclude with some um, yeah, suggestions of how, we, how this understanding might widen our understanding of liturgy and sacraments. Um, this interpretation of the church as a liturgical action is corresponding, um, and its corresponding form of powerless power leads in a final step to some basic considerations concerning a possible interpretation of the church's sacramental and its sacramental foundation. And here again, we might follow the direction of Illich, who is uh, pointing uh, to and um, Yeah, where he's pointing to and critically expand um, Kavanagh's sometimes too optimistic link between liturgy and hierarchy. And uh, you see the, the quote of Illich, um, what distinguishes believers from non-believers is the fact that they celebrate all their life just as they celebrate this meal or this gathering. In light of this, um, if the kingdom is present in concelebration and the church itself is this liturgical celebration, um, we need to widen our understanding of sacraments as the occasions where we traditionally locate the feast. Like in Illich example of the Sam Samaritan who passes over the cultural boundaries beyond what is culturally sanctified in order to create a new community, the mystical body is porous. It transgresses the boundaries between sacred and profane. Uh, in Kavanagh's words, we need to Eucharistize the world, but also, I would add, the other way around, discern where the Eucharist is celebrated on the altar of the world. So in close proximity to Illich's illustration of the kingdom as getting a choke, Kavanagh describes the consumer of the Eucharist as the global village idiot. Um, and he writes, the consumer of the Eucharist begins to walk in the strange landscape of the body of Christ while still inhabiting a particular earth earthly place. 
and um, this Samaritan fool might animate them, his fellow beings, to join the party by singing this famous song, Celebration, Good Times, Come On. And with this uh, note, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Stefan. Um, I must admit I'm a little bit skeptic about the, the possibility of the, the how, how can I say, uh, the, the propriety to um, define a Eucharistic gathering as a party, but <laughs> this, is something, this is something that we can discuss afterwards. Uh, thank you very much for these uh, insights in the, in the thought and the theology of an author that I don't know, I didn't know at all till uh, today, and uh, that has, in some sense at least, uh, some points of, of uh, contact also with, with ideas that Illich put forward himself. So we have, we have now half an hour uh, for discussion. Uh, I think exactly like we did it yesterday, not only on the two last papers that we heard, but on all the four uh, that were at the center of our session today in the morning. So I, everyone is invited to ask questions, make comments, and as yesterday, my... Just now. Sorry? I just thought for the discussion I might... Okay, yeah. I just give you a moment. Uh? Yeah, um, I didn't put them. Uh, I have the footnotes here with me, so maybe I just later give you the paper and then you. Yeah. Who would like to ask something? May, may I ask you to, to come forward? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean... <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to ask a question to myself, obviously, right? I spoke <laughs> earlier, but um, I, I don't know, just something maybe interesting to bring a lot of what we're saying together, which is to do with, I suppose, something like this desire for an outside. I mean, one of the things that really, whether it's a religious... Uh, feeling or anything beyond this kind of uh, materialist technocracy, the kind of closing down, you know, I mean, I think maybe we used to think that there, were, there would be this kind of pluralism of positions, you know, that there, there would be kind of, uh, I don't know, whether postmodernism might have meant something like uh, an appreciation or respect for difference or diversity of uh, origin and belief and position. And I think what we've seen instead is, is, is uh, you know, and, and I really appreciated your talk for pinning down exactly the regime, if you want to, I mean, you didn't use this word, but I'm going to use this word. <laughs> whether, we, we've, whether we talk about the technocracy or the regime or the, I don't know, like the, the, the total closing down of the world, it seems to me. And, and one thing I suppose, you know, I... I, I you know, my background personally is, is, you know, my parents are not religious at all. They're kind of almost like paganistic. They live in the countryside, you know, the sort of heathen in a technical way and, you know, that so on. But I really, I see, and I, this is maybe what I'm interested in people's reflections, like this absolute desire for, um, you know, the outside, something beyond this uh, regime, this, this, this way that we're only allowed to speak about uh, health in this way. Well, we're not even really allowed to speak about health. It's, it's your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the state. You are something like a vector or, you know, of suspicion, like you were saying. You know, this kind of um, internalization of, 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 of a way of speaking a language which is so reductive. You know, we're, we're all reduced to speaking in this state uh, regime language, and it's the opposite of a plura plurality. It's no respect at all for difference. It bears no relation to any genuine uh, religious position or a secular position or a paganistic position or whatever. Like, whatever diversity we might find in common, 
you know, despite all of these differences. And, and you know, I just wanted to note, I suppose, that even um, amongst people who've been brought up in this liberal, secular <laughs> society, which pretends to be neutral, but of course it's not, as your presentation makes very clear, um, is, is a desire for this, uh, for uh, the, the kinds of things that Illits were talking about. And I see like a return to people going to church, for example, right? It does, and even in the ignorance, and I include myself in this, you know, I don't really particularly understand all of the differences between, uh, you know, the different types of Christianity or even, you know, I understand broadly some of the historical differentiation between Protestantism and Catholicism and so on. But I think we see all over, even in major cities among people who are, let's say, the most liberal subjects, you know, the most secularized, the most um, entranced by uh, a hedonistic, technophilic world, um, a resistance, you know, a rebellion against this. Um, and I'm really uh, um, uh, curious about what people, you know, if, 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 they, if you see this as well, like this kind of desire for, for, for all of these... Um, uh, you know, ways of being together for, for conviviality, for human <laughs> life, you know, whether it's religious or not, you know, and, and how, how much it matters whether we are good religious believers or whether we actually don't have that background or, you know what I mean? Like, uh, because I feel it. I feel that people desperately want this, you know, way of being together, you know, from all these different uh, ways of life against the, the regime or whatever we want to... Uh, describe it, yeah. So it's not really quite, it's like a comment. <laughs> well, my new person, I only have one uh, question to uh, see here, and it's a question uh, that I'm asking myself since quite a long time. I also know from uh, Ivan, especially also the, the uh, title that you quoted, the 85 uh, uh, health, no thank you text, that he said that there was an option or a way to cope with it and it was the powerlessness, to recognize the powerlessness. And I was in the last two years, of course, as everybody was the crisis, asking myself whether I should accept that as kind of a final statement or do we need what you did brilliantly to elaborate on um, yeah from the scratch what Ivan said about it was about everything what you presented yeah the institutional political sphere etc mm -hmm. But I think even by powerlessness, even didn't mean giving up or resignating. So it means first accept your powerlessness, and then you you can start analyzing and be creative. And but it meant uh, I would say, yeah, first of all, be clear, accept the powerlessness, and don't. Uh, look for, you know, general solutions, other solutions, or political, uh, let's say political solutions, because this is, but maybe, Barbara, you wanted to ask a question, but you can also say something uh, on the question of powerlessness. I was just uh, uh, thinking all the while with the last presentation that Ivan consciously, not say reject, but abstained from using the term religion, and he was, had a, a stance against religiosity. He said, and he spoke about the viri irreligiosi, people who do not join a religion. And I was 
um, and I found that very important then in understanding that very consciousness, and that's not a theological statement, I'm a historian. As a historian, he, he, would, he would be careful <coughs> for the semantics, the historical semantics of religion as an invitation to join or not to join, and then, then um, I don't know if it uh, is useful, but, but he always said, I'm not a religious man. Yes, very, very religious. Yes, it was not an issue of a religion to join. Because they didn't bow down uh, in front of all the, and they didn't want to put their God as one of the others yes. in the country, or no, but that was one example. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. The Christian, for his. Um, I really know very little about knowing in the sense that I know what I'm saying. Uh, but um, um, Christian was not about a religion in the sense of the semantics, historical semantics of religion in, in the Western history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no. <laughs> no, no, this is bread and butter of the... Uh, yeah. no, I, um, thank you so much, and I absolutely concur, and that's why I tried ending by looking as a theologian, saying we have to understand, try to widen our understanding that what outside of Christianity, so to say, out, can be interpreted as taking place in the same way. But um, when I read Illich, of course, I also stumbled over this, but my insight was... But yeah, maybe it's a very different one, uh, that um, you could no longer use one adjective to describe this community, because the community, the conviviality, the people, different people gathering, should by themselves then decide what they call it or what not. So there is no one, there is no, no one vision, because then you would take away, then you would have an ideology in a certain sense. It's, it's, it's not under one umbrella. No matter if you call it Christian or not religious, that would be also kind of an umbrella, maybe. If you would say you identify it as particularly not Christian, I think there's the same tendency there. But this is just a comment. So maybe. First, quickly to religion, what I like, uh, just by reading one of the essays in, in the new book, The Bowerless Church, is that even Illich liked holiness very much. And that reminds me of uh, René Girard and Levinas, who distinguished very clearly between the sacred and the holy. And I think uh, maybe even Illich's uh, careful not using religion is related to the problem, uh, problematic side of the sacred distinguished from the holy. But uh, that was not <laughs> what I wanted to say. First of all, I liked your talk very much. And I think uh, to bring Kavanaugh in this discussion is very important. And if I understood your paper correctly, at least one of the uh, things so it was that uh, it's not it's not really possible to be outside institution so it's a dialectical thing and I was a little bit worried also by <laughs> your paper by David Cayley's paper by the last remark on social distancing by Agamben because those things were not dialectical enough so it was a little bit like black and white. And uh, I mean, we are here also, it relates on uh, to uh, Satchai's uh, comment on the law system. And it also relates to what we are doing here. Because we are in the framework of an academic institution, we are part of the system. 
I am paid <laughs> by the Austrian system. So I think in order to understand uh, Illich properly, we have to have a dialectic approach. So when we talk about the healthcare system or the law system or the schools or universities, we have to address both sides. We have to address the dangers and we have to address what they achieved or tried to achieve and see both sides. And a little bit you did it in, in regard to church as an institution, but I missed it a little bit in regard to the healthcare system. So you didn't say anything about what could be probably positive developments. Or is it completely dark and <laughs> corrupt and diabolic? I don't think so. So I just wanted to address. But, I mean, but when do we get out? This is the question. You know, sometimes they're wrong. <laughs> Sorry? The institutions, sometimes you have to leave them. I mean, no, sure, sure. Are, yeah, sure. Broken. Yeah. Yeah. And then did you create new... But, you know, what, what worried me a little bit and even worries me in regard to Illich because I'm no longer sure is the starts the problem with Illich or with some of his followers was the reaction by Agamben, by Kelly, and a little bit we heard it also here on the COVID crisis. I don't think it's a black and white thing. I think some, some of the measures were really helpful. Uh, some we have to rethink. So for me, it's a little bit too, too 100 uh, percent, too black and white. And yeah. Just one comment. Quick comment. Yeah. I, <laughs> oh, I, 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 it's just a question. No, no, no. But the thing is, we, I did not do an evaluation of COVID measures and even did not do an, uh, the risks and chances of the healthcare system. That is not our point. They, it's a they, certain they, argument and a certain thing to make things clear. And then, of course, you follow an argument. It's a very typical uh, way of discussing things in the academia, risks and chances, Vorteile and Nachteile. So with that, everything is lost. You can't make an argument. Yeah. No? And, and that's a different way of thinking, I think. Uh, I, this is, uh, yeah. Just, you, you very, yeah. Just one comment to uh, Wolfgang. I'm not paid by a system. Yeah. I don't know what I'm not paid by a system. That's no, then you can also do the microphone, please. Uh, to the microphone, not to the people listen. Uh, just Wolfgang and I get paid by the same government. I say I'm not getting paid by a system. I cannot assume that. Bonjour, c'est un témoignage de, en tant qu'éditeur d'Yvan en français, et ça rejoint ce que disait Barbara. J'ai essayé de lui parler de, de théologie, de l'Église, de la religion. Euh, non, il ne voulait jamais, <rire> ça ne l'intéressait pas. Il y avait à un moment donné une année, je crois que c'était en 1986, ou 80... Ah. Vous avez parlé anglais très vite <rire> Je vais parler lentement. En 1986 ou 7, il y a un débat en France sur le mariage des prêtres. Et je, je dîne avec Yvan, je lui dis alors, et il fait pff, ça ne l'intéressait pas du tout. Enfin, il ne voulait pas parler de ça. Je connais assez bien de Lubac. Goncar, Goncar, Daniel Lou, enfin des, des théologiens comme ça, je croyais que ça allait lui plaire que je lui parle de ces théologiens. Non, ce n'était pas du tout ces, ces sujets. Et en 1972, je ne sais pas si vous connaissez ce film de la télévision française euh, où Jean-Marie Domenac, qui dirige la revue Esprit, dit à Ivan Illich qui pendant une demi-heure à la télévision, a parlé de Pandore, de Prométhée et d'Épiméthée. Domenac lui dit, 
Et l'Église, alors ?» Et Yvan répond « C'est une putain, mais je l'aime. » Vous voyez, ça, ça préfigure le euh, « she » et « it <rire> » qu'on va voir par la suite. Donc c'est une réponse euh, euh, radicale, évidemment. Euh, maintenant, c'est une question pour Martina, plutôt. <rire> la, d'abord, un complément, si je peux m- me permettre, sur Quanavaca, c'est là aussi où euh, le champignon hallucinogène a fait hallucinogène a, a été découvert par le, le spécialiste des champignons français Roger Heim en 1960 et qui a fait venir beaucoup de hippies à Cuernavaca parce que le champignon hallucinogène était une substance qui vous permettait de voyager. Donc c'est amusant que ce soit au même endroit et en même temps. Euh, pour Le Mercier, Le Mercier, c'est un il crée un monastère à côté de Cornavaca pour des moines qui sont en analyse. Donc il y a des psychanalystes, une psychanalyste de, de Mexico et un psychanalyste qui ne sont pas croyants, du reste, qui viennent pour avoir comme patient ces moines. Donc le Mercier est attaqué par le Vatican en même temps que Yvan pour d'autres raisons, donc leurs histoires sont, sont, sont parallèles, et euh, ils se connaissent, ils se fréquentent, sauf que le Mercier va déclarer à Francine Duplessis de Grec que Ivan Illich est un génie détraqué, il faut traduire ça en, en anglais ou en allemand, parce que c'est un génie, donc il reconnaît que c'est un génie, mais détraqué, qui aurait bien besoin d'une psychanalyse. <rire> Et on est euh, en, en 68. Dans ces dialogues avec le Christ, que, que Martina a peut-être lu, le, le livre de Le Mercier, qui date de 1966, euh, il y a énormément de réflexions sur la, le rapport à la communauté. Et la communauté chez Yvan est un point excessivement important. Or, en France et en français, le mot « communauté » est un mot tabou, parce qu'il renvoie à « communautarisme ». Et alors ça, on n'en veut pas. <rire> Sur les religions, euh, j'ai, je suis, c'est une question que je... Alors, la, ma question à Martina, c'est la psychanalyse, parce que Eric Fromm... <rire> Oui. Non, non, mais c'est, c'est amusant que euh, des, 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 des psychanalystes amis d'Yvan ne, 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 le, ne vont pas le convaincre du tout de s'intéresser à, à la psychanalyse qui est née à Vienne, <rire> d'où vient Yvan. Mais euh, c'est une question que je pose à tout le monde. Euh, je ne comprends pas la, l'absence, j'en parlais avec Désiré hier, je ne comprends pas l'absence de l'Afrique et du monde arabe dans euh, les, les parcours d'Ivan Illich. C'est, c'est, c'est un continent qu'il, dont il ignore tout. Et l'islam, qui est un vrai sujet en France, puisque c'est, la, c'est peut-être même la première religion pratiquée, quantitativement, euh, du moins, euh, je lui en parlais beaucoup. Et euh, là aussi, euh, il m'écoutait gentiment, mais <rire> il ne réagissait pas. I have to talk here, okay? Everybody on stand B, it's okay? Yeah. Great. Uh, I have a, a question for you, Stefan, about your topic. And when we, when, you t- when we talk about community, conviviality, and I think of every person here in the room, I'm okay. I'm saying, yeah, bring it on. 
When I'm thinking about my uncle from my mother, brother from my mother, I have to say, yeah, okay, but with social distancing. Yeah. And when I'm thinking about one of my cousins, I have to admit, I'd rather say no. <laughs> no conviviality, no community. So my question for you is, uh, if you want to widen the understanding of liturgy and sacrament, with taking the position of Illich, the, the image and picture of the Good Samaritan, one side, the governor mystical, mythical, uh, he breathed mystical body on the other side. So how do you integrate the notion of brokenness, sinfulness, without playing, I would say, the balance game? So the real church is only where the Eucharistic is and everything else is not important. So how do you integrate, if you, if you want to winding the concept of liturgy and sacrament, how do you integrate the notion of brokenness, sinfulness, without playing the balance game? Thank you, tough one. Um, I think um, maybe that seems uh, uh, not very creative as a theologian, but there are kinds of brokenness which we won't solve by, ours, by our own. There are some cousins we simply never want to meet again. And so, in a certain way, the center at the community uh, is not at our disposal. That's what, or this is like at least a, a theological insight, is uh, that what constructs ultimately a community the spirit of the community is not at our disposal. This is the insight. But in order to make space for this, we have to try to make space in our self in that sense. Uh, if this doesn't sound too, too spiritual, but I think it's not, a, it's not a religious topic in that sense. It's something we all know. It's, um, yeah, I don't know if I ever kind of answered uh, what you asked, but. Uh, yeah, there are things which are not at our disposal, but which nevertheless are the most important to us. And we some somehow have to find techniques. And talking about, uh, to, to nevertheless make it in a way at least somehow present. And theologically, we can speak about this then in sacraments, uh, sacraments and la la. And, but of course, there are so many different grammars, as many people there are, there are different grammars. So, this is one way, I think, to talk about it, but... Yeah. Uh, just, we were just discussing, looking at the time, since we have a, a, a packed afternoon, we thought we would end the discussion here now, but we will have a panel discussion at the end of the day. So we have some time, and we just thought the, the, the point that uh, Mr. Palava brought up about sort of the balance between a critique and maybe sort of a, a constructive vision which sort of, sort of resonates with what, what Nina has also um, mentioned, that could be a part of sort of a constructive discussion towards where do we go from here now, taking this, these things up, and maybe that can be part of the panel discussion in the afternoon, because uh, I think that it's a vital, I had a similar question uh, sort of on my mind, how, we, how do we continue this conversation into sort of proactively going towards a future? And so we will take our time for lunch now, and meet back at 2 p.m. sharp. So if we follow the provisions, and I tested it in real time, uh, it might stop raining now for the rest of the day. It was ordered together with the preparation of uh, the conference, so I hope um, uh, it will be like that. Uh, we hope for today, as probably uh, as the Schubert Jade started, and probably the city is full of people. And if you go down where we went yesterday to the restaurant Bindella, on the central place, there are many small offers of meals. So maybe you try to find something there. It might be helpful that you have your uh, red ribbon. We ordered some more, so pass here if you did not yet uh, get it. Um, the meals will not be too expensive. If you need Swiss money, uh, if you, if you no, normally in magazines, in, in shops, you can, you can use euro and credit cards, but uh, at this place probably it's better to have some Swiss francs. So I will stay at the reception desk 
and print some money for you and distribute it if you need. <laughs> and please, maybe do not forget each other, so look around that nobody uh, is uh, isolated and uh, lonely. So three more ribbons. Um, yeah. You might find in the city some music representations, smaller concerts in, in smaller rooms or even on the street. So with this you have the right to, to assist or even to enter. So profit uh, at the maximum, you, you can use your time. But please, um, at two o'clock, more or less, be back again here. Thank you.
Congratulations. Next up is Neto, who is uh, uh, back here with us. He is a, a Brazilian researcher uh, in somewhere between a political ecology and an environmental sociology. He is the husband of Isabella, who is also here. And so uh, we welcome you <coughs> for your presentation against Pax Ecologica. Or should I go? I think the last <laughs> you should go. I should go. Okay. I'll go then. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to somehow uh, express and share a bits and bits of my uh, relationship with Illich's ideas uh, for the last, I would say, six years. And um, I would like to briefly introduce how I uh, came across Illich's writings and friends. And first of all, I'm very thankful for the invitation and for all of you who are putting this gathering together. Uh, I will not name you because it will be unfair. I don't know all of the people involved, but thank you very much for this, this opportunity to, to have this, this gathering uh, centered on Illich. Uh, I was a student of economics in Brazil, in the University of uh, Campinas, when I was starting to grasp the, I would say, bad effects of development, of progress. Uh, something that I had felt coming from a family that have lived in a very small village in which progress and development took much longer to arrive and in which one could smell the breaks of the fabric of community once development and progress arrived. And it was hard to live in a country in which the critical thinking against development was not as present as I wish, because I was seeing the vanishing of communities that were disappearing, what Illich called vernacular, for example, and I wanted to think critically about development. And uh, I came across Illich in a group of uh, students thinking through what they called at that time Illich a radical ecologist. So I will not address Illich as a theologian in my talk, talk although I am somehow uh, with some approximations with theological issues, but I'm focused above all in some of his concepts and ideas that can somehow uh, give light to the ongoing environmental social crisis that we are facing. Uh, and these communities and villages and places and societies and groups of people, ethnicities, uh, it was hard to name what were they preserving or having uh, without for example, an anthropological approach. And I, do, I did not want to do anthropological work, but somehow be able to see and learn from these uh, communities and places uh, without the perspective of economics, which was uh, the career that somehow uh, uh, framed my, my, my thoughts in, in, in learning. And the reason why I, I entitled my talk Against Pax or Ecologica is because I see a clear uh, mirroring between Pax or Ecologica and development. And I hope in the first part of my talk to show that Pax or Ecologica is the new uh, Green Alliance for Progress. We had the Alliance for Progress, now we have a Green Alliance for Progress with the same destructiveness but now with the face of being something good, 
of being something inevitably good. And in the first part of my talk, I want to explain why I am against this Pax Ecologica and why uh, it's important to reflect upon uh, the main course of environmental thought nowadays and the, what I would say the mainstream uh, thought on environmental issues or social environmental issues. And after pointing out my critics, thinking together and after Illich, I will introduce briefly uh, something that I think could be a very nourishing way of uh, facing the social ecological crisis. So I will read and patiently uh, ask you to follow me after the lunch, which is quite difficult. However, I will try to be somehow uh, efficient to keep you awake. Uh, on December 1st of 1980, Illich gave the opening address of the first meeting of the Asian Peace Research Association in Yokohama. He entitled the speech the delinking of peace and development, which later appeared in, in the mirror of the past as that book's first essay. Sustainable development and sustainability were not yet on the horizon. The sun of development had not yet set when Illich spoke about it over 40 years ago. Development, he said then, was the most recent mutation of the ongoing worldwide war against people's peace, this time in the name of developing them. Peace does not and did not only mean the opposite of war. Illich showed that peace is as vernacular as languages, as various and distinct as modes of abiding and being. It carries a range of historically and culturally shaped meanings and therefore finds little correspondence with one another. Peace was not a universal and abstract idea, but a unique and specific spirit enjoyed by each historically constituted community. Though all are today usually translated as peace, the Roman Pax, the Jewish Shalom, the Athenian Philia, the Indian Shanti, the Japanese Fudo and the Chinese Huoping have incomparable meanings. Each people, each ethnos had its ethos of peace. Each culture claimed its own kind of peace. Each community had its way of being left in peace. Illich named this Pax Populi, people's peace, that originates from every grassroots which defines and is related to a specific we. Historically, what now goes under the name peace was neither related to economics nor war. The contrast between these varieties of people's peace and what Illich named Pax o Economica could not be greater. Pax o Economica refers to the idea that commerce and trade is a peaceful alternative to war. Today, we can clearly see the close link between the two between commerce and war. Europe does less business with Russia because there is a simmering war between them. The oil will flow easily again, again when the, gun, the guns fall silent. The idea that economic competition is a less dangerous form of rivalry, that peace is the opposite of war and can be achieved through economic trade has been promoted by under the banners of progress development, and more recently of globalization. According to Illich, the aggressive spread of economic exchange replaces the variety of cultures by the homogeneity of the market. Today, the imposition of a global market, a worldwide regime of property, and the monopoly of manipulative technology and systems have come to be synonymous with peace, that is, Pax o Economica. Pax o Economica is the planetary peacekeeping program that has served as a most efficient weapon of the war against the vernacular, the commons, and conviviality until now. I argue that sustainable development and sustainability are now transmogrifying Pax o Economica 
into a Pax or Ecologica. Both protect and expand economic exchange, but whereas the first protects the dirty industries, the second, Pax or Ecologica, protects the clean industries. Whereas the first aims at peace within society, even at the cost of nature, the second promises peace among humans on the condition of stopping the human war on nature. The Green New Deal proposed by the center left in the USA is perhaps the best name to define this emerging Pax Ecologica. The New Deal of the 1930s was meant to save the capitalist economy without regard for the environment. The Green New Deal is meant to save both the economy and the environment. It saves the environment by economizing it. The Green New Deal does not discourage transforming the commons into property as long as it expands markets. It does not challenge the unlimited expansion of markets as long as these are sustainable, and it does not question the unlimited growth of technology like cars as long as they are electrics. This is the credo of sustainability in the North and sustainable development in the South. It promises peace on Earth because of a peace with the Earth. Truth, disembodiment, sustainability, in large Pax or Economica into a Pax o Ecologica. Pax o Ecologica is a hoax because sustainability is the new scarcity. Sustainable development and the green economy are variations in an ongoing capitalist revolution. If the welfare state is understood as the kidnapping of socialist values, then green capitalism is a kidnapping of ecological values. Some think that sustainable capitalism is a contradiction in terms, an, an, an oxymoron. I see no contradiction due to a simple fact. The concept of sustainability, whether in economics, ecology, anthropology, or sociology, does not require any of limits to technology, limits to economy, or limits to property. Sustainability and sustainable development are not grounded on limits to technology property, or scarcity. And precisely because they are not so grounded, it is possible to see them as a case of old wine in new bottles. No limits to technology, but greening of tools. No limits to property, but recertifying them as organic and renewable. No limits to scarcity, but greening the economy. Sustainability is the new name of old ghosts that, that have haunted the planet for some time, progress, development, globalization. Without this triple limit, limits to property, limits to technology, and limits to the economy, the ongoing environmental collapse is understood as an accident or neg negative externality of a still immature capitalism. Sustainability sustains the myth that after some political adjustments and technical corrections, it can redirect economic growth away from environmental damage. The reason to curse sustainability is so that we can debate real alternatives. The road to climate change and therefore to a literal hell on Earth has been 500 years in the making. The recent history of social biogeochemical bio degradation cannot be understood without understanding the history of the expansion of market societies from colonialism, from colonialism to globalization. Its new clean to win sustainability is now paving over the, over the dirty road of development. 30 years of sustainability or sustainable development have not lowered the planet's increasing temperature by one decimal. On the contrary, they are the main reason for its continued increase. Following Illich's indictment of development, I argue that sustainability perpetuates, deepens a way of living anchored, anchored by market and state dependence and fueled by a sense of guilt. The rich can buy organic food wrapped in plastic, drive electric cars, and own buyers' stocks. The poor who cannot afford good food and who cannot walk on the roads for new electric cars are blamed for not embracing conscious consumption. 
Bayer has a whole section of its business dedicated to sustainability. None of its actions promote the protection of traditional seeds, land reform, or limits soil exploitation. They have a zero carbon policy based on carbon credits, which only monetizes climate change. They also expect to create a sustainable product by greening all parts of the chain supply. This is what they call sustainable agriculture. Sustainability means that Brazilian land usurpers can continue to burn the Amazon forest as long as their tractors are electric and solar panels light their offices. It is beyond dispute that many others have seen the failure of sustainability and connected it to eco-development and eco-friendly growth. In Europe, for instance, the yet timid but topical degrowth movement has been framing grounds for limits. Celia Samersky has also shown a possible correspondence between degrowth and Illich's critique of technology and urged the degrowth movement, and I quote, to seek deliberate limits to manipulative technologies in general. Eco-socialism reframed historical materialism by stating that non-ecological socialism is a dead end. Boaventura de Souza Santos has argued that sustainable development or sustainability are ways of perpetrating an epistemicide that has been the very cause of the social ecological catastrophe we are facing and thus evokes epistemologies of the South. Luis Marques has argued that sustainable capitalism is just an illusion and has shown three main aspects of its impossibility. It has become evident that the discourse on sustainability cannot but generate intellectual confusion, political diversion, and cultural stasis because the term has lost any determinate meaning. The 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nations cannot be accomplished based on the premises on which they are founded unless in a science fiction movie. In absolutely none of the descriptions of any goal and in none of their political statements will one find a single mention of limits to property, limits to technology, and limits to scarcity that are scaled by the human body. Take goals two, zero hunger, and six, clean water and sanitation. The UN proposes rural development, food security, and nutrition through sustainable agriculture to rid the world of hunger. To guarantee clean water, the UN offers to ensure water availability and sustainable management. Goal 11, sustainable cities and communities, is framed by sustainable transport and strategies for safer, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable human settlements. Goal 8, decent work and economic growth, promotes sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth Full and, pro full and productive employment and decent work. More generally, as Louis Marx has shown, for example, in the final text of the UN conference, Rio Plus 20, The Future We Want, the word sustainable, and I quote, is repeated 115 times without being linked to a single concrete action to make it effective. Now, sustainable is the key word here. It seems to function as a magical word word as if agriculture and management could transmogrify into something else when the word sustainable precedes them. I follow Willich's argument and understand it as an amoeba word, what Uwe Porksen calls a plastic word. In a conversation with David Cayley entitled Life as Idol, even Illich defined amoeba words as, and I quote Illich, a term with powerful connotations. A person becomes important when he uses it. He kind of bows to some kind of a professional who knows more about it. He is convinced that he makes, in some way, a scientific statement. Using the word makes waves, but it doesn't hit anything." End of the quote. Although a word such as sustainability does not designate anything precisely, it has many suggestive connotations. As Ajay Samuel argued, scientific terms should not be understood as concepts. Instead, they are constructs. The difference between common sense concepts and scientific constructs is fundamental. Concepts are grounded in a sensible apprehension of the world, whereas constructs are mental fabrications and to the sensible world. 
For example, the earth is a concept whose int intelligible content can be grasped by the hand, whereas the planet is a construct whose intelligibility can at best be visualized in models created by the mind. As Einstein said of scientific constructs, they are, they are not, however, they may seem, uniquely de determined by the external world. The distinction between concepts and constructs allows one to see why scientific terms easily lend themselves to becoming plastic words. Sustainability is polyvalent and plastic precisely because as a construct, it's not grounded in felt sensation or perception. The price paid for scientific constructs can be high. To paraphrase Porkson, plastic words sound friendly, smooth, positive, and consensual, but while not in themselves evil, they mask brutality. With a word such as sustainability, one can ruin an entire region. Stated simply, sustainability is unsustaining. And I say it not without hesitation, but flamed by the spirit of village, to hell with sustainability, and hope to celebrate vernacular forms of living. And I come to what I mean by vernacular forms of living, hope to celebrate something different than what I just defined at Pax Ecologica. To shift the public debate on sustainability requires challenging myself to think after Ivan Illich, which, mo which means both thinking with him, grasping his arguments, and after him, extending his arguments. Accordingly, I collect Illich arguments on limits into a conceptual triad to define the space within which vernacular forms of living can flourish. Accordingly, I propose that conviviality corresponds to limits to technology, whether dominant tools or systems, and the commons correspond to limits to property, whether private or public. And vernacular corresponds to limits to scarcity, whether shadow work or paid work. So we have this triangle of limits, limits to property, which is the commons, be it private or public. We have limits to technology, dominant tools, and we have limits to the economy, shadow economy or formal economy, creating this triangle. And inside this triangle, I call that flourishes vernacular forms of living. In extending Illich's argument, I suggest that the political struggle to realize limits to technology, property, and scarcity that are scaled by the human body will necessarily generate social arrangements which, following Agamben, I call vernacular forms of living, life that cannot be separated from its form. I propose vernacular forms of living as a conceptual tool framed by an inseparable relation between theory and praxis that can identify, recognize, analyze, and edify social arrangements that embody limits and therefore do not cross natural thresholds. There are several forms of living among originals, original peoples grounded in the notions of limits that accord with natural thresholds. Buen vivir, or vivir bien, that Alberto Acosta translated to Spanish, defines way of, ways of living of the Quichua, Aymara, and Guarani peoples, for instance, that are apparent alternatives to development. Gustavo Esteva has drawn the clear lines for commoning in the new society, and among the Zapotecans and the Zapatistas, has called for horizontal grassroots, grassroots organizations grounded on commotion instead of promotion, in which living together means the practice of radical democracy. The vernacular is the fabric that spins forms of living. I call for vernacular forms of, a call for vernacular forms of living is how I imagined an encounter between Ivan Illich, vernacular, and Giorgio Gambin, form of life. Both resuscitated these terms from Latin antiquity and ancient Roman law. Illich traced the vernacular back to the codification by Theodosius, while Agamben found reference to a form of life in Cicero, Seneca, and Quintilian way before the Franciscans. Ivan Illich breathes new life into the word vernacular, knowing that its ancient meaning carries the seed for what he intends to define. Vernacular designated everything is woven, cultivated, and made at home as opposed to what was sought truth exchange. 
Thus, vernacular, after illage, names a range of activities born out of structures of mutual reciprocity described in each aspect of existence that are non-market oriented. Vernacular activities can encompass the definition of use value activities, such as cotton fishing, net making, or growing one's food, and reproduction activities such as dating, exercising, or reading. The scope of the vernacular encompasses styles of thoughts in which science is not defined for people, but rather by people, when knowledge is not a scarce resource, but a shared commitment to support one another in beautifying the surroundings of communal life. George Ogamben thoroughly analyzed the monastic rules within the Christian tradition to flesh out a life that is not separated from its form. By freely and willingly committing themselves to the Quinobium, where one lives in common, the Christian monk adheres to a regula vitae, a rule of life, which is not applied to their life. Instead, he produces their way of living since it is produced in it, in the rule. The faith in Christ, the person, the word made flesh, generated a rule that conforms to his way of living. Even though Tertullian's regula fide, rule of faith, later fed the lines written in the Nicene Creed, the rule was not meant to be a dogma, but expresses the effort to follow the nude Christ. St. Francis of Assisi insisted that a rule of life is less a prescription of something than the act of following someone. Thus, a form of life is not the enforcement of a prescribed norm on life, but rather living in a life that, while being lived, takes the form that it ultimately seeks, what Agamben names the coincidence of life and form. St. Clair's last will incarnates the distinction, the definition of a form of life, and I quote, I wish to follow the life and poverty of our most high Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, thinking after Illich and Agamben, I propose vernacular as the name for the forms of living that presuppose limits to property limits to technology and limits to scarcity scaled by the human body. Such limitations are not a set of prescriptions that must be imputed into living as an enforced norm. On the contrary, these limits mark out the zone of abundance that emerges from styles of living that cannot be separated from the forms they take. I call regula vernacular, vernaculum, a rule of the vernacular, those forms of living that enact limits to tools, property, and scarcity scaled by the human body. Thus, limits can foster vernacular forms of living if and only if they are lived and set while experienced, not imposed, not prescribed. To live within limits attuned to bodily thresholds embodies vernacular forms of living. A call for vernacular forms of living is an invitation to celebrate the abundance that can only be found within such limits. More precisely, a call for vernacular forms of living is an invitation to opening a social imaginary of thought and fostering people's ingenuity to invent ways of living within limits to scarcity, the vernacular, technology, conviviality, and property, the commons. I would shortly, briefly tell a very uh, short story of how these concepts came actually from living within a, a community. I, I was invited by a group of artists, since my wife is an artist, to be part of what they were doing in a, a fishers community in the south of Brazil. And uh, it was when I was living with them that it became clear that these three limits creates abundance, opens a space for an abundant way of living. Uh, and it was very interesting to uh, realize how they defined the amount of energy they would have inside the community. So it is a community that had the opportunity to choose uh, how they would uh, relate to electricity, because electricity did not arrive in this place until 2010. So they have to make a communal decision of how do we embrace electricity? How do we accept electricity entering this place? And I think that uh, what was most uh, striking for me is that uh, they were not refusing uh, a tool, which is electricity, as something necessarily bad, 
but they were looking for a, mo a modernity that could be within limits. And they were able to foster uh, a very interesting uh, uh, way of dealing with that. They chose solar panels, but not only they chose solar panels at, at, as the source of their energy, but just a certain amount of solar panels that would allow uh, people to have very restrict relationship with technology. For example, in this village, if you watch television for more than two hours, everyone loses energy and no one has electricity. And why two hours? Because it's a football game match. And in Brazil, we are passionate by football, so we, they chose the limit based on what w they live as a community. You cannot, wear, you cannot have a microwave. If you have a microwave, you consume all the electricity. So by setting a limit to how much energy you have, and this is the debate of village in the 1970s, the energy crisis is not a crisis of uh, not enough energy, it is a crisis of too much energy. And they, by defining a limit of how much energy they would have in a community, they were able to continue flourishing as a community. So if you go there, there's no public light, there is internet, there are tools that are completely technological, but they are under a roof that limits the use of these tools. And the fire continues lighting the nights of that community. And it's by the fire, by the telling of the stories that come together with the fire, is that people continue imagining a world that can be completely different than we see uh, going uh, the path that uh, uh, development is taking and, and, so, and, and above all sustainability. So just to give a brief conclusion to my thought, Paxo Ecologica is the latest front of the war against the vernacular. I borrow the words of village to say it with more precision. It is the planetary mission that spreads, and I quote, the technological imperative transformed into normative responsibility. Driving an electric car will soon be, will, driving an electric car will soon become an act of universal responsibility. Paxo Ecologica is the main threat against vernacular forms of living. It is grounded on the assumption that sustainable capitalism is the locomotive spe speeding us towards social natural peace. Therefore, it, room, it runs over limits to scarcity, technology, and property because it treats these as archaic notions that deter the progress of humanity. Vernacular forms of living, like in Walter Benjamin's analysis of revolutions, are the emergency break of this locomotive. They cultivate their unique and colorful meanings of peace that keeps the playful balance between society and nature. Contrary to these modes of violence, Pax Populi protects vernacular forms of living. As Illich once called for the delinking peace and development, I call today for the complete disassociation of peace and sustainability. The abundance of species, seeds, insects, trees, plants, mammals, stones and minerals, gases, waters and peoples spread across the various territories will never be left in peace under the crusade of sustainability and sustainable development what I call Pax Ecologica. There is no hope, rather total collapse with the invention of a new kind of homo economicus, that is, its transmogrification into the homo ecologicus. Both are embedded in scarcity and, and universal men are made to live on the consumption of commodities produced elsewhere by others. Both proclaim the insane mechanism of universal ownership. Both play with planet Earth as it was a ball that they could juggle around. The vernacular forms of living names forms of living that emerge when people set limits to scarcity, limits to property, and limits to technology, each scaled by the human body. The manner of living keeps the spirit of people's peace alive. It constitutes the most radical change to Pax Ecologica because it reflects the multifarious arrangements of modern yet proportional societies, each of which protects people's peace. The vernacular forms of living are the sword against Pax Ecologica. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, with an eye on the clock, I just Let's just continue with Alessandro De Cesaris. He is 
has just moved to Freiburg and will be teaching and researching uh, here uh, at our university. And it's a pleasure to have you here. <laughs> view is magnificent from here. So, uh, well, thank you, Oliver. And first of all, uh, I'd like to say I I'm having a great time. So uh, thank you to the organizers, to Professor Alice Leben, to, to Luca, to Oliver, and to, to all of you for, uh, for this great opportunity. I, I, this is the best way to start my, my new time here in, in Freiburg. Um, I, I'm not a, philo I'm, I'm a philosopher of technology. I'm not an expert. Of, uh, of Ivan Illich, but I will say something about how I came to discover him. Uh, I started reading him when I became interested in the studies on new literacy, so the works by Walter J. Ong or Harry Kevelock and the, and the others. And so I, I tend to read Ivan Illich in the context of uh, media theory, philosophy of technology, and I dare say, I know Oliver is interested uh, in this uh, theology of technology uh, in, the 20, uh, in the 20th century. Um, this being said, one of my uh, research focuses are the so-called social-technical uh, imo imaginaries, that is, those narratives, uh, images, and uh, myths that regulate how we understand technology, how we feel about it, uh, how we interact with it. And for this reason, I will tell you uh, something about Prometheus and uh, Epimetheus, as the title of my, my paper uh, shows. But uh, before that, I'd like to start uh, by telling you a little personal uh, anecdote. So uh, uh, I spent this summer in my native homeland, uh, a small island in uh, southern Italy. And in August, even more uh, than uh, before the pandemic, the island was literally taken by storm by tourists. A place usually populated by 70,000 people must suddenly accommodate half a million, 500,000 people. So shortly after mid-August, one day, one morning in particular, something happened. For a few hours, the internet lines stopped working. Uh, in the shops, it was almost impossible to pay with credit card. Any online transaction or query or research took at least uh, um, 15 minutes. Uh, I was in a cafe. Uh, I was actually reading Fabio Mila, <laughs> uh, introduction to, uh, to, uh, to the first uh, uh, volume of the, of the works by Ivan Illich, uh, and I was surrounded by anxious foreigners. After a while, the situation was clear. We were simply too many. Uh, the island was so crowded that the infrastructure had broken down. So the people sitting at the tables continued to stare fixedly at, the, at their phone screens, uh, mesmerized by the spinning symbol of buffering, the Ouroboros, uh, the symbol of eternity, or perhaps simply a dog chasing its own tail. Uh, after a while, they began to converse with each other, and it was clear that there was no real need for any of them. Every com conversation started with, no, I don't need to do anything, but I mean, and that was, they, they kept repeating, I mean. It was clear that uh, there was uh, no real uh, issue. It was simply an existential problem, so to say. The unavailability of the network the impossibility of being connected to their loved ones, to their acquaintances, and their platforms was an incredible source of stress, was an unbearable amputation. Mm -hmm. So at that point uh, came to my mind a recent novel by Don De Lillo. It's called The Silence. The premise of the work, which was written during the pandemics, it's quite, uh, quite simple. At some point in the world, electronic technologies simply stop working. A plane goes off the ground in flight, making a crash landing, and a group of friends gather in a private home, characters typical of the Lilo's uh, work, thoughtful, reflexive, meditative, and sensitive individuals who process the technological shock by reflecting on the utter oddity of what until a moment before seemed to them uh, the only way to live. Just like when the same word is repeated too many times, the terms that had marked their lives for years suddenly appeared meaningless. 
In the words of the author, and I quote Delillo here, all the people watching intently or sitting as we are, puzzled, abandoned by science, technology, common sense. So uh, I remember that in a book published in 1994, Peter Sloterdijk proposed Boccaccio's Decameron as an alternative model to what he called hyperpolitics, uh, which has come to be known as globalization, we could say. So in the face of the systemic crisis, uh, Sloterdijk envisaged the emergence of small communities based on mutual, um, mutual support, proximity, and sharing. And yet, uh, I, I realized that the characters in the silence differ fundamentally from those in the Decameron or from the people sitting at the cafe that morning in my, on my island. In Boccaccio's masterpiece, the outbreak of emergency becomes an opportunity to interrupt the ordinary course of life and create a new form of community. In Dalilo's novel, on the other hand, a group of friends cannot even manage to organize a communal dinner. The disappearance of the technological infrastructure leaves uncovered a dramatic illiteracy in the field of coexistence. The malaise of individuals who have simply unlearned how to communicate and live together. So without even the courage to look out the window to understand what is happening, the tenants of the house bubble confused ideas, speculate, metabolize, they're being completely exposed and defenseless. This is at least how I read the Lilo's novel. So these two, mold, uh, these two small episodes, namely my, my summer misadventure and the novel by Delillo, have something in common. They both describe the crisis of an imaginary. Some critics of digital civilization, for instance, I don't know, Byung Chulan is the first name that comes to mind, accuse our time of being disenchanted, of being beyond the era of the so-called great narratives. And yet, uh, what we call information society, before being a reality, is a very influential socio-technological imaginary. Our relationship with technology today, as in other times, is mediated first and foremost by images, by myths that orient our actions and shape the way how we become subjects. So it seems to me that uh, one of Ivan Illich's uh, great contributions, uh, contributions to the philosophy of technology consists precisely in having emphasized the importance of sensitivity and imagination, even before the practical and cognitive aspects, in order to understand the meaning of the relationship between men and technology. And here, of course, I use technology as, as a broad term. So in this case, sensitivity is to be understood in a double sense, perceptive and aesthetic, but above all, affective and moral. This is a recurring idea. There is a recurring idea in, uh, in all theoretical reflections on technology, namely that uh, the gifts of uh, technology do not come without the price. So this is an idea expressed, for instance, by the platonic notions of pharmacon, at the same time remedy and poison, by the Hegelian uh, idea of second nature as both liberation and slavery, or by Marshall McLuhan's famous slogan that every extension of our body is at the same time an amputation. Yet this idea does not simply mean that every technology also has negative uh, aspects, so to say. Rather, the profound sense of these formulas is that we cannot make use of technology without profoundly changing ourselves. Now, for some, this entails a form of determinism. McLuhan, for instance, writes that human being is merely a servo mechanism of technology, is its reproductive organ, just like bees are to flowers. This idea, moreover, implies our inability to foresee all the effects of the devices we make use of. So media belong to the domain of Hermes, eh? the trickster par excellence. They are everywhere, but they remain invisible. They have a magical and unexpected effects on us. Now, in the analysis provided by Illich, it is to add that the problem is first and foremost about a certain form of moral imagination. That is, the way in which our ability to imagine influences our ability to evaluate and act. So Günther Anders, who was already, already mentioned by Professor Palava, and I mean, it's a name that 
came about during the conference, uh, argued that uh, the 20th century is the era in which our moral imagination is no longer capable of withstanding the enormity of the consequences of our technologically mediated actions. According to Anders, therefore, our time is marked by the insufficiency of our imagination and sensitivity in the face of the enormous power of technology. According to, to Illich, as I, as, I, as I read him, uh, on the contrary, the problem lies in the way the use of technology atrophies and disorients our sensibility. I am reminded here of a distinction I have always loved, formulated by Friedrich Schiller in his letters on the uh, aesthetic education of man, and I, I, I quote very briefly Schiller here. Now man can be opposed to himself in a twofold manner, either as a savage, when his feelings rule over his principles, or as a barbarian, when his principles destroy his feelings. The savage despises art and acknowledges nature as his despotic ruler. The barbarian laughs at nature and dishonors it, but he often proceeds in a more contemptible way than the savage to be the slave of his senses. So by modifying the word in his image, man modifies himself. The damage produced by technology is not the result of a cognitive de de defect, but of a lack of moral sensitivity. Savages suffer in the domain of nature because they do not know enough. Barbarians suffer in a world they are created because they simply do not care. This atrophy of sensitivity is not a generic result of technical progress but is the specific consequence of a certain technological imaginary. This is my, my main point. And we are going to call it, of course, a Promethean imaginary. Now, I will not inflict on you, once again, the story of Prometheus and, the, and his brother. We all know it. Uh, uh, Ivan Illich, uh, I have the impression, prefers Hesiod's version of the myth, in which much weight is given to Epimetheus uh, marriage to Pandora, but I am a philosopher, so of course uh, I've uh, always focused on the version of the story presented in Plato's, in Plato's uh, Protagoras, a proper founding myth of the Western conception of the relationship between man and technology. So in, in, in two sentences, at the dawn of humanity, Epimetheus has to distribute powers, uh, dunamis in Greek, among the living beings, but he forgets uh, man. At that point, Prometheus makes up for his brother's mistake by giving mankind fire and with it technical knowledge. Now, already in the 19th century, uh, Johann Jakob Bachofen had used the characters of Prometheus and Epimetheus as archetypes to distinguish between two different types of civilization. In Bachofen's taxonomy, Prometheus is the spiritual element, active, masculine, projected towards the future, um, and of course, a, war a warrior element. Epimetheus, on the contrary, is the material and sensitive aspect, passive, feminine, still looking to the past, and basically peaceful. So in this way, Prometheus and Epimetheus do not represent two elements of our culture's uh, relationship with technology, as for example in um, Bernard Stigler's analysis, but rather two different ways of, consider, of conceiving this same relationship. So in English thought, uh, to me, it is quite clear that the one between Prometheus and Epimetheus is an alternative. So I refer, of course, to the end of the schooling society, but also to some pages from, taken from Medical Nemesis. And I, I do not intend to propose to you an interpretation of uh, or an analysis of, of Ivan Illich's uh, thought on technology through uh, the figures of Prometheus and Epimetheus. I would rather like to think along with Illich and outline the, feature, the features of what a Promethean and an Epimethean imaginary of technology could look like. So what does a Promethean technological imaginary consist of? I would propose three elements. The first one concerns the very conception of human being as a being that must be overcome. In Plato's tale, it is the gates of Prometheus that first identifies the human being as an imperfect creature. Starting from Prometheus, the human being will be a Mengelwesen, to use the expression uh, created by Herder, a deficient being that must be supplemented 
with something from the outside, from the gods. In this first sense, the Promethean attitude is structurally a transhumanist and anti-humanist attitude. The human being is not enough. He is constantly striving to surpass his own condition. This means that man's ideal condition is beyond man in a total hybridization of body and technology. Starting with Prometheus, the human being is both more and less than himself. The second and uh, third elements are linked to the very name of uh, Prometheus. He who looks forward, of course, and then uh, therefore foresees, so to say. So in a first sense, Promethean imager imaginaries consists, uh, conceives technology as the ability to eliminate danger, to defeat chance. Promethean technology must see problems before they arise. It must be, must be able to dominate the future. In a second sense, Promethean technology looks forward because the technological extension of man is never sufficient, is never ended. As soon as we establish that the human being is imperfect outside his own hybridization with technology, this same technology has nothing to do with the capacities, the dynamics of Plato's tale of other animals. It is a second level dynamics, a meta dynamics, so to say, a capacity to create capacities and thus to extend indefinitely our species need for technological hybridization. Promethean technology thus feeds on this curious paradox, being always at the same time perfect and improvable. Based on this way of representing technology, I can maybe better explain what I meant when I referred uh, to a crisis of the imaginary. So uh, these are two different aspects of our relationship with technological uh, myths or technological narratives. When they effectively structure our experience of the world, they do change us and our behavior. Yet what happens when these imaginaries fail? What happens when our way of imagining our relationship with technology is no longer able to describe our experience? So let us return for a moment to the silence. The shock of the Lillo's characters is due to a substantial mismatch between their experience and the beliefs that guide uh, this very experience in everyday life. First of all, they are suddenly confronted with the extreme fragility of the technological infrastructure that underpins and makes their lives possible. How little is enough to send an island as mine into chaos? And yet, we are completely unprepared for a circumstance that, on a smaller scale, is constantly recurring. We are constantly baffled and frustrated by technology. One of the best known assumptions of media studies is that technology becomes most visible when it doesn't work. Our world is populated by glitches, frustrating waiting times, dead devices, no reception, hardware and software incompatibilities, as those of you who use Apple probably know better than us, than me. Yet the imaginary that dominates the discourse and the debate around the so-called digital culture is dominated by terms such as dematerialization, cloud, instant messaging, and so on. A huge metaphor of immateriality and of absolute velocity uh, populates the way we naturally speak about digital technologies. The fragility of technology, however, also and above all reveals our own fragility. Günther Anders, again, famously elaborated the notion of Promethean shame to express our sense of inferiority to the, to the machines and devices that populate our society. Promethean shame is part, of course, of a Promethean imaginary, the constant belief that technology is perfect or perfectible and we are not. The discovery of our fragility in the face uh, of the failure of technology is completely different, however, from Promethean shame. We do not discover ourselves fragile when confronted with machines, but rather we discover how fragile, insensitive, dull-witted the machines have made us. I can now try to say what an Epimethean technological imaginary might consist of. 
So Prometheus and Epimetheus, of course, have two mirror-like figures. So it will suffice to take up the traits of the former to discover something of the latter. Firstly, for Prometheus, technology is a remedy against the human condition. Fire serves to bring man closer to God, to make him overcome his own imperfection. Epimethean imaginaries, on the other hand, replace the vocabulary of remedy with the vocabulary of care. Technology is a way to take care of our imperfect, open, contingent, contingent condition. This means referring to two completely different models of technology. Hillich has widely criticized the reduction of all forms of technology to contemporary technological processes. So the difference between organ and instrument, for instance, is precisely this. The organ is an extension of the body. The instrument is a process that integrates and modifies the body from the outside. As in the case of Prometheus, the name Epimetheus can have two different meanings. In a first, case, in a first sense, Epimetheus is the one who looks to the past rather than to the future. Now, in the first volume of his uh, technic, uh, Techniques and Time, uh, Bernard Stiegler, who I already mentioned, has well shown that uh, the Epimethean position does not foresee, so to say, but meditates après coup. In this view, technology does not produce expectation, but hopes. Its goal is not to eliminate the future by predetermining it, but rather, but rather to be open to the future and to uh, the unexpected element that come along with it. Unlike Prometheus, Epimetheus is a contemplative rather than an active character. While the Promethean man builds the world, the Epimetheus man meditates on the history of this construction. Prometheus sees humans as imperfect and offers technology as a divine gift that will help them, uh, that will help them overcome their condition. Epimetheus sees the human, all too human uses of this very gift and meditates on the frailties that technology produces instead of eliminating. In a second sense, Epimetheus looks to the past because his attitude is not projective. He does not seek what is not there. He cares for what it is. The history of technical achievements is not a ladder to be thrown down in order to reach an endlessly projected goal. It is an archive of unexplored possibilities, of available and still valid resources. In this sense, Ivan Illich's critique against the idea of infinite progress, for example, the distinction between metabolic energy and mechanical energy, goes precisely in this direction. It makes no sense to think uh, of the bicycle as the now useless prehistory of the car, of the train, or of the plane. Prometheus condemns all, all technology as obsolete. It is the, the, the Promethean vocabulary is the vocabulary of, of obsolescence. Whereas an Epimethean imaginary sees the history of technology as a dense laboratory of practices and form of knowledge in which everything can be recovered and recognized as valuable. So if we apply this discourse to so-called digital culture, I think it is possible to say that in the public debate, but also and above all in the academic debate, I must say, a real clash of imaginaries is taking place, a conflict between a Promethean and an Epimethean narrative. It is a theoretical clash, of course, but one that has very important social and political consequences. First of all, it is important to recognize that the field of digital technology studies is strongly influenced by a Promethean mentality. Obviously, it is correct to identify and analyze the forms of belief and the narratives that provide a context for a, a given phenomenon. This is what I, what I do most of the time, basically. But however, in the field of digital culture studies, there is an oscillating attitude. It is not always entirely clear to me whether these studies propose an analysis of the technological imaginaries active in a certain debate, or whether they themselves intend to make an active contribution to the production of these imaginaries. In other words, it is not always clear to me whether these are forms of mythology, so a form of logos on myth, a reflection on our own mythologies, or forms of mythography, active myth-writing practices. Some studies on digital technologies, I will say this more directly, look to me more like forms of advertising than serious analysis in which science fiction and reality seem to merge. 
they engage in this epic and mesmerized celebration of digital progress in which singularity is behind the corner and the barrier between reality and simulation is about to be broken down. Against this tendency, there are studies that are increasingly careful to downplay the reconstruction of information technologies as a glorious march. Scholars such as Gabriele Baldi, Balbi here in Switzerland, Jaron Lanier, have shown, first of all, that digital technologies have a history. We continue to talk about digital uh, media almost always under the sign of novelty and of the future. But it is instead a history that has lasted for several decades, if not centuries. A history started with failures, misconceptions, political choices, regressions. Other scholars, such as James Bridle and Andrew Blum, have highlighted the fragility and impracticality of the material infrastructure that makes our connected life possible. Not a cloud in the sky, but a tangle of pipes and boxes that consume outrageous amounts of energy. A very interesting example is computer graphics, for instance. Whether it be video games or generic screen interfaces, the idea of a history of graphics proceeding towards a very precise goal, which is photorealism, presupposes an infrastructure made up of increasingly expensive machines equipped with a higher and a higher computing power. On the contrary, the valorization of the history of computer graphics as an archive of aesthetic, artistic, and operational options favors an intelligent use of resources, as well as a greater variety in terms of aesthetic and practical experiences. So this historical look at digital technologies is also crucial in order to escape the deterministic illusion, according to which the digital complex is a cohesive and unitary block. Our technological infrastructure is the result of a complex negotiation with the specific affordances of digital media. It is the consequence of political choices, commercial planning, social needs, but also fears, prejudices, misguided hopes. The political debate on surveillance, for instance, or about data protection, or on the availability of goods uh, and services, requires, first of all, the identification of those aspects of information technologies that cannot be negotiated because they structurally belong to the nature of the medium, and those aspects, on the other side, that are simply disguised as a natural development of the technology, being in reality the result of heteronomous needs. So in conclusion, it seems to me that the, the elaboration of an Epimethean imaginary is a fundamental step uh, if we want to imagine new digital cultures. In Italy, for instance, a hacker collective called Ippolita works explicitly with the concept of conviviality, asking precisely this question, how is it possible to make a convivial use of information technology? I believe that the possibility for information technology to be a convivial tool is a question of design. So today, interface design has produced a form of subjectivity that is, uh, if possible, the exact opposite of the Elysian idea of conviviality. We call this form of, subjecti of subjectivity the user. So user is not just a participle. It is a very specific, historically determined way of being subjects the way that is correlated to our present technological environment. Now, we define a convivial tool as one that extends the power of the subject without limiting it, uh, its autonomy, one that does not produce subordination, one that extends the range of action of the subject. So on the basis of this definition, the notion of user describes a form of subjectivity that is profoundly limited marked by a complete, a complete loss of autonomy because the user uses the device but does not know how it works, by a relationship of subordination because the user, the user must accept the use of devices without being able to modify them, Le even legally. We are not uh, allowed to modify them. Uh, by continuous limitations in the sphere of action because that is what profiling is for. It serves structurally to limit access rather than to guarantee access. And yet, digital culture has already produced an imaginary that we can safely identify as Epimethean. So the echo culture of the 80s and the 90s, for instance, before the explosion of graphical user interface and broadband connections, was explicitly inspired by principles that are not difficult to define as convivial. 
the diffusion of a cyber culture that guaranteed free and conscious access to uh, informa informatic tools for every individual, the absence of limitation in the use and customization of devices, free access to networks and archives. At the same time, uh, a culture connected to hacker culture, namely cyberpunk culture, anticipated with sensational foresight a disillusioned and critical look at the wonders of computer civilization. Even the one in the novels uh, by William Gibson, Bruce Sterling, or Neil Stephenson, for instance, computer technologies are delicate and sinister infrastructures described in their cold materiality and immersed in the web of desires, power relations, and political institutions that enable them to function. So after all, this is the first step in achieving an Epimethean imaginary of technology. Looking back, following with interest, but also with disenchantment, the complex and surprising history of our relation uh, with technology. Remember the fragility of this relationship. Take care of it. Rediscover it as something precious for us, and maybe also look at it uh, ironically, so to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, keep your questions in mind or write them down. We will now have, I don't have my program, but I suspect now is an hour of convivium and we will regather here at 4 p.m. sharp.
Um, it was not clear who will introduce Thierry Paco, but he introduced himself so well during our <laughs> so that there is no need. Once again, great thanks that he accepted some days before the colloquium. We knew his book on Ivan Illich, and we are looking forward to his next book on Ivan Illich. And uh, among these two ones, he will pre present us what else than Illich on friendship. And he will do it in French. But you have the translations, I hope. Oui. Oh, yes, uh, Dario. Dario and Paul, uh, you have to distribute uh, the translations. They will arrive from above, like every good thing. <laughs> Je remercie, je remercie Barbara qui a traduit en anglais et en allemand pour vous ce texte que j'ai écrit très rapidement pour qu'il puisse être traduit. Donc je vais un peu changer, mais je vous dirai quand je quitte le texte pour commenter et faire d'autres remarques. Je vais donc parler lentement. Voilà. Alors, à, à lire ou à relire les, les, les livres d'Ivan Illich, je me suis aperçu, comme tous ceux qui sont ses lecteurs, que le mot « amitié » revient très très fréquemment. L'édition des œuvres complètes en français, malheureusement, n'a pas d'index, à la différence de l'édition italienne de Fabio. Ça, c'est du travail sérieux. Et, et donc, euh, euh, je n'ai pas pu euh, vous donner un chiffre de la fréquence du mot « amitié » ou « ami » dans l'œuvre complète d'Ivan Illich. Mais si je prends le premier texte du premier volume, déjà dès le début, Ivan Illich remercie deux amis sans qui le manifeste qu'il propose en 1967 n'eût pas été écrit. Donc on voit que, euh, et pour tous ceux qui ont travaillé comme euh, Martina sur le SIDOC le savent très bien, euh, la, la production intellectuel des, des essais d'Ivan Illich euh, passe par plusieurs étapes, en particulier des discussions avec beaucoup d'amis, ou du moins un certain nombre de, de, de personnes euh, qui ne sont pas forcément des amis, mais qui sont des collaboratrices et des collaborateurs. Et, et donc, euh, le texte euh, qui, qui est édité à ce moment-là, généralement par le SIDOC, euh, est une première version qui sera retravaillée ensuite à chaque traduction. C'est un point très important, c'est-à-dire que les, les traductions françaises de ces livres ne sont pas l'équivalent des traductions allemandes ou des traductions italiennes ou des traductions espagnoles. Euh, et vous avez vu mon, mon incompétence en langue étrangère, c'est un handicap. Euh, aussi, je n'ai pas pu comparer, évidemment. Je sais par euh, des, des amis <rire> que pour le genre vernaculaire, par exemple, l'édition allemande est la plus riche est beaucoup plus riche que l'édition française. Voilà, par exemple. Donc, euh, euh, j'avais construit cet exposé par rapport à ma compréhension de l'amitié chez Yvan, en voyant qu'il y avait deux héritages qui le fusionnaient, l'héritage grec et l'héritage de la théologie du XIIe siècle. Et XIIIe, enfin. Donc, euh, je ne vais peut-être pas reprendre ce qui est écrit sur la, la philosophie de l'amitié en grec, c'est assez connu. Je dirais néanmoins qu'il y a huit mots pour dire « amour » en grec, ce qui est évidemment d'une très grande richesse et d'une très grande subtilité pour analyser ce sentiment très particulier qui est l'amour et qui se déploie à la fois selon des modalités, si vous voulez, différentes, il y a évidemment Eros, c'est le plus connu. Euh, c'est le plus connu pour nous au XXIe siècle. Mais quand on fait l'historique du mot, on s'aperçoit que euh, c'est le dieu de la fécondité et de la fertilité chez les Grecs. Il va être le dieu de l'amour, mais il ne va pas donner tout de suite les mots érotique et érotisme, qui sont des mots de la fin du XIXe siècle seulement. Donc on voit que ce n'est pas peut-être le mot le plus utilisé à cette époque. Alors, je vais laisser de côté le pragma, etc., que vous connaissez, pour m'intéresser à deux autres qui sont les, les, plus, les plus importants, Agapé et puis Philia. 
Agapé, en fait, c'est un terme grec tardif. C'est-à-dire que c'est un terme qui appartient au vocabulaire euh, du christianisme. Comme vous le savez, la langue du christianisme, c'est le grec. C'est l'araméen d'abord et ensuite c'est le grec. Et donc, euh, le mot « Christ » veut dire grec, le mot « ecclésiastique » vient du grec, etc. Bon, donc, euh, c'est l'agapé. Et là, il y a plusieurs ouvrages majeurs que Yvan connaissait très bien, j'en ai, j'ai eu l'occasion d'en parler avec lui, le livre de Nigren, par exemple, sur « Héros et Agapé » en trois tomes, qui est un livre passionnant. Et donc, là, l'agapé, malheureusement en français, il y a un appauvrissement du sens, puisque le mot va donner « agape ». Les agapes, c'est euh, un moment euh, de, 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 où l'on boit, où l'on mange ensemble. Euh, on pourrait presque dire que c'est un moment convivial, <rire> mais le mot n'existait pas encore <rire> à l'époque. Or, le mot « agapé » est traduit en latin par « caritas ». Ça, c'est beaucoup plus intéressant parce que ça a donné « charité » en français, et surtout, ça a donné un verbe qui traite de l'amour, qui est le verbe « chérir », qui est un verbe très peu utilisé aujourd'hui. Je dis toujours à mes étudiants, euh, un peu pour rire, « faut faire attention avec MeToo ». Je dis à mes étudiants, « Je vous chéris ». Bon. C'est-à-dire, je vous invite à, ch- à vous chérir les, les uns les autres le plus possible. C'est-à-dire de vous aimer mais au sens, évidemment, de l'amitié. Euh, chez les chrétiens, cette idée de l'amour, on va le retrouver dans la parabole dont on a déjà parlé ici, euh, du bon samaritain, c'est l'amour du prochain. Donc ça, c'est une, c'est une particularité, si vous voulez, très spécifique, qui n'a pas à voir avec le vocabulaire grec ancien. L'autre terme le plus important, c'est le terme « philia », Là, on le trouve aussi sous la plume d'Ivan Illich à plusieurs reprises, non traduit. Et la filia, euh, c'est une amitié, mais c'est une amitié qui est excessivement compliquée à comprendre chez les Grecs. Je, je, je suis désolé de l'avoir fait en quelques lignes, euh, puisque le premier texte majeur, c'est un dialogue de Platon qui porte le prénom d'un jeune garçon très beau que beaucoup d'autres garçons aiment, ou du moins désir, qui s'appelle Lysis, L-Y-S-I-S. Et ce Lysis, euh, il fait l'objet d'une, d'un amour, mais que ses camarades n'arrivent pas à lui déclarer. Alors, il demande à quelqu'un de plus âgé, qui est Socrate, hein, que Platon met en scène, pour raconter comment essayer de, de, d'aller dire à ce jeune garçon, à ce, cet, cet adolescent, qu'il est, qu'il est l'objet de, de leur amour. Nous sommes là dans ce qu'on a appelé en français, je ne sais pas si ça existe dans d'autres langues, la, euh, l'homosocialité. L'homosocialité, pour distinguer l'homosexualité, qui est une pratique amoureuse charnelle, et, et l'homosocialité qui est un amour, mais qui resterait, je le fais un jeu de mots bête, platonicien. <rire> voilà. Mais qui est très très important, évidemment. Et ce dialogue, le lycis, se déroule dans un gymnase. Le mot « gymnase » en grec signifie « être nu ». Et donc, c'est bien le lieu du culte de la beauté. C'est, tout ça est évidemment très important. Du reste, Platon, comme vous le savez, n'est pas un nom, c'est un surnom que le professeur de gymnastique de Platon lui a donné. Platon, ça veut dire « large d'épaule en grec. Donc c'est, c'est aussi pour vous montrer que euh, le rapport à la beauté, euh, à la beauté physique, est très important. Et donc du coup, Socrate va expliquer à Lysis que s'il veut être aimé et pouvoir aimer lui-même, il faut toujours qu'il cultive le bien. Pas seulement le vrai et le bon. Vous voyez, je prends les trois grandes idées platoniciennes. Mais on les trouve dans le livre de Platon. Et, enfin, qui n'est pas un livre, <rire> qui est un dialogue. Et dans ce dialogue, Platon euh, ne peut pas conclure. C'est-à-dire que Socrate euh, a épuisé tous ses arguments et il n'arrive pas à dire ce qui caractériserait l'amitié, ce qui caractériserait la filia. Donc c'est très intéressant parce que euh, pour les théoriciens que nous sommes tous dans cette salle, c'est une, c'est une sacrée leçon d'humilité. Platon dit ben, « je ne sais pas ». Hop. The end, 
C'est la fin. Il remet son manuscrit, c'est terminé. Et nous, on n'ose pas dire ça. On dit, il faut que je trouve une définition, voilà, même un peu bricolée. Et Aristote, qui est un élève de Platon, va reprendre ce dialogue dans un autre dialogue qu'il offre à son fils Nicomaque. Et là, il va lui expliquer une chose excessivement importante, c'est que la vie n'est réussie que si nous avons des amis. C'est-à-dire que si nous avons toutes les richesses du monde, mais qu'on qu n'a pas d'amis, alors on a raté son existence. Aristote, et ça ne nous rajeunit pas, <rire> avait cette idée, et c'est très très clair. Là, j'ai confronté plusieurs traductions du grec en français, parce que les traductions changent entre le 19e et le début du 20e et la fin du 20e siècle. On réédite souvent ces textes, et là, je me suis aperçu à quel point, pour que euh, la vie ait du sens, alors même que la notion d'individu, notre notion d'individu, n'est pas du tout la même à l'époque grecque. Donc là, il faut aussi prendre cette distance. Je reviens à la première séance de travail qu'on a eue ici, pour bien savoir se mettre à l'écart de notre propre pensée pour réussir à comprendre une autre période. Néanmoins, malgré cette, ce distinguo, néanmoins, il faut, pour réussir sa vie, avoir des amis. Mais Aristote... Euh, laisse entendre qu'il peut y avoir aussi une amitié amoureuse, sans plus la définir. Les deux, Platon et Aristote, donnent à l'amitié une valeur à la fois relationnelle au niveau de l'individu et une valeur relationnelle au niveau de la cité. Le ciment de la cité, c'est l'amitié. Donc ça, c'est un point très important parce que ça montre aussi que pour qu'il y ait ce ciment, pour que la cité fasse corps, il ne faut pas non plus qu'elle soit trop peuplée. Alors qu'aujourd'hui, Facebook nous dit à chacune et à chacun « Ayez un milliard d'amis. » Enfin, ou deux milliards d'amis. C'est impossible, évidemment. Et heureusement... Aristote nous dit qu'on ne peut avoir que quelques amis et que ces amis-là, euh, c'est euh, ce, que la vraie question qui est à poser, c'est qui est l'ami Et c'est très difficile. Qui est l'ami Ce n'est pas « je veux être un ami », c'est que d'une certaine façon, l'amitié nous, nous, nous arrive sans qu'on y prenne garde. L'amitié est sans pourquoi. L'amitié n'a pas de raison. Nous, on a du mal à, à comprendre ça. Hein. Euh, alors évidemment, Aristote et, et Platon réfléchissent. Hein. Là, je vais vite, bien sûr. Euh, il y a une amitié par, euh, par intérêt. Il y a une amitié euh, pour conforter une alliance euh, militaire, par exemple, ou politique, euh, etc. Mais à dire vrai, l'amitié qui leur plaît le plus, c'est l'amitié qui n'a aucune raison. Et ça fait un écho avec... Euh, Montaigne, dont vous connaissez tous l'histoire d'amitié exceptionnelle que Montaigne a avec la Boétie. Et la formule que vous connaissez, pourquoi y a-t-il cette, cette relation si forte entre la Boétie et moi, Montaigne Et Montaigne répond, parce que c'était lui, parce que c'était moi. Et cette définition, c'est une définition de, de l'amitié, est toujours valable. Et une rupture d'amitié est plus dure parfois qu'un divorce, qu'un qu démariage, on va prendre une autre formule qu'on peut inventer. Et, et on connaît beaucoup d'amitié entre femmes et d'amitié entre hommes, dont la rupture ou la disparition à cause de la mort de l'autre vous met dans un état d'accablement. Donc l'amitié est quelque chose d'excessivement puissant qui nécessite une culture. L'amitié s'entretient. Et l'amitié s'entretient dans l'égalité et dans le partage. Il n'y en a pas un qui, de, qui est supérieur à l'autre, qui le subordonne. Non, non. Les deux sont ensemble. C'est ensemble qui fait sens. Ce n'est pas un ensemble 
c'est ensemble. C'est un peu subtil. Vous comprenez pourquoi je n'ai pas parlé anglais ni allemand C'est trop difficile pour moi de faire ressortir ces subtilités langagières. Donc ça fait ensemble. Faire ensemble, vous voyez Pas faire un ensemble. Il n'y a rien de pire que de faire un ensemble. Parce que ça veut dire qu'on va constituer quelque chose qui sera contre. Or là, on est quelque chose qui est dans l'avec et le parmi. C'est quelque chose de très important. Tout à l'heure, euh, oui, sur l'Eucharistie, on parlait du, 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 du avec. Et, et là, c'est le avec, avec et parmi. C'est ça qui fait ensemble. Et donc ça, c'est un point euh, évidemment très important parce que euh, Aristote l'explique aussi, l'amitié, c'est la capacité de jouir avec l'autre, mais aussi de souffrir avec l'autre. Je viens de, de, de terminer un, un, une petite biographie de Rachel Carson. Je ne sais pas si vous connaissez. Oui, le printemps silencieux. Non, c'est une... Une, une naturaliste nord-américaine euh, euh, qui a publié un livre majeur qu'on considère comme un, un des premiers livres de la, de la, de la, du renouveau de l'écologie aux États-Unis en 1962. Et cette femme, Rachel Carson, a une relation d'amitié très forte. Du reste, certains, euh, certaines biographes considèrent que euh, c'est peut-être même une relation homosexuelle. Mais peu importe, c'est une relation très forte entre... Rachel et Dorothée, et à un moment donné, quand, quand l'une disparaît, l'autre a du mal à vivre, et elle écrit « J'aurais tellement aimé souffrir avec toi, j'aurais tellement aidé, aimé porter ta douleur, j'aurais tellement aimé partager ce qui te fait souffrir pour que tu souffres moins. » Ça, ça c'est un signe d'amitié, vous voyez, excessivement puissant. L'autre source... Euh, c'est le, le, la pensée médiévale. Et évidemment, c'est un livre d'Alred de, de Rielvaux, d'Héloïse et d'Abélard, bien sûr, et Duc de Saint-Victor. Euh, on n'a pas le temps, de, malheureusement, de rentrer dans le détail de la, de la, de la naissance de l'amitié entre Yvan et euh, Hugues parce qu'il le présente comme étant un ami. C'est un point très important. Nous tous, ici, nous pouvons avoir des amis d'une autre époque. Moi, j'en ai un que j'aime beaucoup, je vous le présenterai, il s'appelle Charles Baudelaire. C'est un vieux copain, mais bon, ce n'est pas le moment d'en parler. Nous avons tous des amis, ce qui nous permet de réfléchir à la notion du contemporain. Nos contemporains ne sont pas forcément nos plus proches vivants d'aujourd'hui. Nous avons des contemporains passés. Ce qui montre que le télescopage des temporalités est décisif dans le déploiement d'un sentiment. Donc, Hugues de Saint-Victor, pour Yvan, est un ami, auquel il se réfère très souvent, parce qu'il va lui permettre de, de mieux comprendre la situation dans laquelle il se trouve. Et le titre du recueil d'articles, euh, le plus important peut-être d'Yvan, enfin, à dire vrai, ils sont tous importants, c'est « Dans le miroir du passé ». Le titre est très fort, euh, c'est « Dans le miroir, dans le rétroviseur de mon présent, que je peux mieux comprendre comment mon présent est en train de devenir un passé ». Et donc ça, c'est évidemment euh, considérable, méthodologiquement parlant. Ça permet de, de relativiser, bien sûr, toute une série de notions qu'on considère atemporelles, mais qui ne le sont pas, évidemment. Donc euh, Yvan va euh, avoir beaucoup d'amis passés, enfin quelques-uns, et puis évidemment des, des, des amis euh, de, son, de son époque. Euh, il, je vais évoquer ses amis dans les interrelations personnelles, mais il a aussi réfléchi aux amis au sens de Platon ou d'Aristote qui favorisent la cité, ce qu'on pourrait considérer comme étant le politique. Et là, pour les Français, mais je pense la même chose dans d'autres pays, pour la réception de l'œuvre d'Ivan Illich, 
euh, il y a quelque chose qui gêne, c'est qu'on n'arrive pas à dire s'il est de droite ou s'il est de gauche dans l'éventail dans politique. Illich n'est ne pas le partisan d'un nouvel isme. Il considère que la politique a un parti et que ce parti, c'est celui de l'amitié. Alors là, vous voyez, on sort, on est au-delà des clivages idéologiques, droite ou gauche. Ce qui fait qu'en France, euh, les lecteurs politisés sont perdus. Après la publication de mes deux livres, j'étais invité à de très nombreuses conférences et débats, et toujours un syndicaliste, un militant communiste, un, un socialiste me disait « Mais euh, Ivan Illich, euh, qu'est-ce qu'il est, qu est ?» euh, voilà, et, et, et comme il a quelques idées qui peuvent paraître conservatrices, on dit, en fait, finalement, c'est un conservateur, individualiste, etc. Non, non, je leur dis, non, non, c'est il a un parti politique qui est celui de l'amitié. Et ça, dans notre culture politique, c'est incompréhensible, évidemment. Et pourtant, dans le texte que vous avez, je ne vais pas le répéter, euh, je, je donne des, des citations d'Ivan, des confidences d'Ivan à David Kelley, donc ça se trouve dans les deux ouvrages de, de conversation, où on voit à quel point l'important est de construire cette amitié. Alors, je, fais, je faisais un petit détour français, simplement pour vous, vous indiquer que la, la compréhension de l'œuvre d'Ivan a été controversée. Là, nous sommes tous admiratifs d'Ivan Illich, même si certains et certaines peuvent poser des... Des, des réserves, ce que je ferai tout à l'heure. Euh, mais en France, dès le premier livre, « Libérer l'avenir », puis « Une société sans école », les critiques sont excessivement importantes, très importantes et même très violentes. Et à chaque fois, derrière ces critiques, mais je ne l'ai compris que maintenant, euh, c'est la question de la droite et de la gauche qui se pose. Est-ce qu'il est chez du côté des plus démunis, des plus pauvres euh, et des révolutionnaires Ou est-ce qu'il est simplement euh, euh, un, un critique des institutions, comme ça, en général, ce qui serait assez, assez facile euh, depuis Karnavaka Et donc là, je me suis rendu compte que ce, dès ces premiers textes, il y a la présence de cette notion de l'amitié. Alors, merci. Donc il me reste cinq minutes. Donc je saute tout ça et euh, euh, bon, j'indique tout enfin, dans le texte. Donc, voilà, je voulais simplement faire deux remarques euh, euh, un peu de réserve, si vous voulez. La première, c'est que je pense que lorsque j'ai commencé à lister les noms qu'Ivan lui-même avait indiqués lorsqu'on se voyait à Paris comme étant ses amis, euh, cette liste m'impressionnait. Et c'était un peu contradictoire avec l'idée que j'évoquais tout à l'heure, que l'amitié se cultive et qu'avoir deux, trois, quatre amis, c'est déjà beaucoup. Et là, tout d'un coup, lui, il en a un certain nombre. Alors, je ne l'ai pas assez bien fréquenté pour savoir s'il si cultivait pareillement toutes ses amitiés ou s'il si en privilégiait certaines à certains moments. Je donne, je donne deux noms. Il ne faut pas se focaliser sur ces deux noms. Hein. Euh, deux personnes que je, que je connais euh, qui estiment énormément Ivan Illich, qui l'ont beaucoup aimé même, c'est Jean-Pierre Dupuis et Franco Lasecla. Et j'ai posé la question à Ivan, j'ai dit, euh, mais il y a longtemps, et, et Jean-Pierre Dupuis, euh, oh, pff, comme s'il ne voyait pas trop de qui je parlais. Et je lui dis, et Franco de la Sécla, pareil. Et, et moi, les connaissant tous les deux et sachant qu'ils l'ont très, très bien connu et vécu avec lui plusieurs, euh, à plusieurs moments de, de leur propre existence, j'ai trouvé ça un peu bizarre. Euh, parce qu'on peut dire, je ne suis plus ami avec. Mais gommer un peu leur, leur existence me semble un peu gênante. Je ne vais pas vous raconter ma vie, mais j'ai des amis avec qui... 
je ne partage plus rien et qui ne sont plus des amis. Ça arrive dans la vie. Il faut, il faut peut-être, et c'est dur, c'est douloureux, mais il faut le reconnaître. Donc ça, c'est la première question que je pose sur la, la, la relation amicale qu'Yvan Elish entretient et, et, et met en avant comme étant quelque chose de très important. Et puis, la, la deuxième idée qui m'est venue dans mes, dans mes propres travaux philosophiques, c'est que je crois que nous avons des amitiés extra-humaines. C'est-à-dire que, euh, personnellement, je cultive une amitié avec les lieux. Je suis donc un topophile. Je suis pour la topophilie. Je pense que les lieux, grandement, font de nous ce que nous sommes. Y compris peut-être la Casablanca de tout à l'heure. Peut-être que ce lieu a, constitué, a participé à la constitution de certaines personnes. Euh, à mes étudiantes et étudiants, je leur demande toujours un seul exercice qui est un plaisir à corriger. C'est une bonne chose hein, de prendre plaisir à corriger un texte. C'est une autobiographie environnementale. Une autobiographie environnementale. Racontez-moi ce que les lieux ont fait de vous. Et là, au moins, aucun étudiant peut piquer d'informations sur Wikipédia. <rire> c'est personnel, c'est en soi. C'est très profond. Donc, j'eusse aimé parler avec Yvan, mais je n'avais pas encore réfléchi à ça à cette époque, euh, de, de, de cette idée de la, philo, de, la philo, de la topophilie. Le mot se trouve pour la première fois en français sous la plume de Gaston Bachelard, dans la poétique de l'espace, à quatre reprises. Et le mot « topophilie » n'entre dans le dictionnaire Le Robert qu'il y a trois ans. Vous vous rendez compte La lenteur des dictionnaristes pour intégrer des mots qu'on utilise déjà sous la plume de Vachelard en 1957, il faut 60 ans avant que le mot rentre dans le dictionnaire. Alors pour moi, c'est très important parce que je, je crois, plus je réfléchis philosophiquement dans, dans, mes, dans mes travaux, c'est le thème d'un de mes prochains livres du reste, c'est de comprendre que euh, chacun d'entre nous est toujours en train de combiner les temporalités et les territorialités de son existence. Et s'il n'arrive pas à les combiner, il va mal. Le mal-être naît de cette difficulté à à fiancer, comme je reprends le verbe de Bachelard, à fiancer la topo-analyse, si vous voulez, et la rythme-analyse. Et puis, euh, l'autre point que je voulais peut-être essayer d'évoquer, oui, alors quand je dis l'ami du lieu, mais il y a d'autres amitiés possibles, hein. on pourrait demander à chacun et chacune, euh, j'ai écrit un petit livre qui s'appelle L'ami livre. Voilà. C'est-à-dire que j'ai beaucoup d'amis qui sont mes livres. Et... Et, et ce sont des très bons amis. Ils sont toujours disponibles. Quelle que soit l'heure, je peux me réveiller en pleine nuit, prendre un livre, et je sens qu'il est très gentil et qu'il va me permettre de me rendormir quelque temps plus tard avec des belles images poétiques, par exemple. Donc, la topophilie, l'ami du livre, etc. Et donc, cette présence de l'amitié euh, qui pourrait paraître au, 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 à beaucoup comme étant encore plus irrationnel que l'amitié sentimentale entre deux humains est pour moi quelque chose de très important. Et puis, le dernier point que je voulais soulever, euh, c'est à partir d'un poème d'un poète du XIIIe siècle, donc un siècle après Hugues de Saint-Victor, qui est un... C'est une chanson, une chanson, on appelait ça des chansons à l'époque, une chanson de Ruteboeuf qui a été euh, euh, adapté en français contemporain et mis en musique par Léo Ferré. Alors, rassurez-vous, je ne vais pas chanter, <rire> sauf si vous me le demandez. Bah, enfin. <rire> et je lis juste la première strophe, parce que ça sera ma conclusion de tout à l'heure. « Que sont mes amis devenus 
que j'ai tant de si près tenu et tant aimé. Ils ont été trop clairsemés. Je crois le vent, le vent, les a ôtés. L'amour est morte, ce sont amis que vent emporte. Et il vantait si près de ma porte qu'il les emporta. On saute plusieurs strophes et on arrive aux deux derniers vers de cette chanson qui ont vraiment des mots illichiens. L'espérance du lendemain, ce sont mes fêtes. Thank you very much, Thierry. Uh, we have now the weird pleasure to introduce ourselves. <laughs> Luca and I have prepared um, our reading of Illich's reading of Hugh of St. Victor's way of reading. <laughs> so it's a meta, meta, meta reflection on reading. Uh, and we added sort of a side glance to current events and developments in digital technology. We slightly adapted the title, did, to, did we get the joke toward um, uh, musings with Ivan Illich has turned into spiritual practice, sacred reading, and critical technology. And just very quickly, I had a, a, an unspectacular introduction to Ivan Illich. I was just reading Charles Taylor's The Secular Age from back to end stumbled over sort of the interpretation of the Good Samaritan and thought, hmm, that's interesting, and then looked up David Cayley and bought uh, The Rivers North of the Future and sort of got sort of sucked into uh, Elish's texts. And then with Barbara Hallensleben, we continuously wove in. Uh, I, I was her assistant for um, three, three years around, and so we did multiple seminars with texts of Elitch that were woven in, and then we did one seminar just last fall, I think, fall of 21, uh, on Elitch, and so got introduced to, to his texts, never got to meet the man, obviously, uh, but it was great to hear some personal stories, see some pictures, and get some more profile around these texts that for themselves are very strong and powerful, but with the person in mind uh, even more so. Maybe you want to say something? Yeah. My introduction was way more spectacular than that because it was you. <laughs> uh, you introduced me to, to Ivan Illich. Uh, I don't know how long after you had been introduced to him, but your, uh, your hint at the, at the beginning was this book, uh, The Rivers North of the Future. And I bought it and I read it and got interested uh, in reading more and uh, learning more and then there was the book, my Martina Kaller and other books about by Thierry Paco, the small one, the small book that has been translated into Germany, into German uh, a couple of years ago. I, I read that one and other things, and so I'm here now. <laughs> yeah. So, did we get the joke? Spiritual practice, sacred reading, and critical technology. According to Ivan Illich, we've heard it before, believing the gospel is like getting a joke. There is difference between merely understanding the words and truly grasping the point and therefore being able to laugh at the joke. True understanding is always a contingent event. It can be illustrated by the reaction of the Samaritan when he sees the wounded traveler on the wayside, helping that man and therefore incarnating something of the gospel that Jesus Christ had proclaimed in uh, of the kingdom of God that Jesus Christ had proclaimed in the Gospels is an activity, but it's also, it also has the quality of a gift being received. The priest and the Levite who passed the wounded man understand what, what was happening. However, only the Samaritan gets the relevant point of what matters in terms of the kingdom in that specific situation. Such understanding cannot be forced, it cannot be planned or formalized, no fixed method can guarantee its occurring. It's rather like a moment of intuition or inspiration, from a theological standpoint, quite literally uh, a moment of inspiration, in which we are lifted beyond ourselves and receive something which saturates what we had been doing with a new quality. Such inspiration can never be at our disposal. It can never be managed and distributed like a product by human institutions. 
Still, being inspired, getting a joke, receiving a gift are all acts. Like in the biblical account of the early church, the book of Acts, the point is not that they didn't do anything at all, but that one couldn't really clearly distinguish who the subject of those acts were. And in an important sense, the subject of those acts was both divine and human. Understanding is, in that sense, not a total passivity, but an active kind of passivity, a receptive form of action, one might try to clumsily say it. While it can never be fully under control, we suppose that there still are or seem to be conditions that are conducive to our ability to understand, to see the point, to get it, and then to live accordingly. Illich again and again speaks about forms of life which celebrate the point that makes up Christian belief. Such celebrations are a kind of training, a preparation or even a purifying of one's gaze. Um, they are an askesis uh, in the Greek term, which forms one toward proper praxis, which ultimately is the point, as the letter of James makes it clear to its readers, readers in the diaspora, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. In his later work then, Illich emphasized the importance of studying the past to gain some perspective on and wherever necessary critical distance to the present, something Thierry has just alluded to. Such studying is an essential way of pursuing the kind of ascesis which leads to true understanding and practice. To study the past, Illich says, is like visiting a foreign country. To really understand such a country and its culture, a quick visit and a short glance at things probably won't do. Instead, one must live in it, spend time in it, converse with its inhabitants. To a certain degree, one has to make that country one's home. And such homemaking, it seems to us, is one key to grasping Illich's approach to reading texts which always necessarily embody a form of the past because they were written by somebody. And it is also a key to understanding what understanding means for Illich. Maybe something like this is what Jesus meant when he told his disciples that there are many rooms in his father's house and that he has gone ahead to prepare a place for them, John 14, 2. Maybe to really get the joke of the gospel, one has to first inhabit the gospel in its traditional form of the scriptures. Now we want to take a step back and gain some perspective, taking up Elitch's conversation with Hugh of St. Victor. Whoever lives today was born sometime, uh, whoever lives today still and was born sometime in the first half of the 20th century has experienced the birth of a new era within an older one. This transition, I don't think it must be seen as a radical break, a kind of instant rupture. Still, it is revolutionary enough to be analyzed as something new within the old, fundamentally affecting the old that has been. We are referring to the digital transformation, as it is called, of our societies and the brave new virtual, virtual worlds it has enabled. More and more people live more and more aspects of their lives indirectly through the digital sphere, working, doing business, communicating, sharing life, or at least a, a digitized version of life in this technologically mediated space. Following Illich's approach, it might be helpful to visit the past to gain some perspective on that present. This is what he did in his last major monograph in the Vineyard of the Text, where he offers an in-depth analysis of a work by the great theologian and mystic Hugh of St. Victor on the Didascalion. Hugh, who, li who lived uh, AD 1097 to 1141, was of particular interest for Illich because he stayed, as it were, on the cusp of two eras the era of the monastic contemplative culture of the High Middle Ages and the era of specialized scholastic knowledge in the Late Middle Ages. The latter, in turn, was a period of significant development in the areas of technology and the scientific approach to reality, all preparing the revolutions of what should be called modernity later on. 
In Hugh, the old world is still alive while the new one begins to manifest itself. What is especially intriguing about Hugh is that he didn't outright reject the new developments of his time, but neither did he see them as a substitute for the old ways of living. The main topic of his book is the art of reading, especially of a sacred reading in the monastic tradition of Lectio Divina. Though concerned with wisdom in general, Hugh prudently begins his didas didascalion with an overview of several kinds of human activity to which he correlates different aspects of philosophy, i.e. the pursuit of wisdom. One such class of human activities consists in the artes mechanicae, those activities that are pursued through tools, instrumenta. These activities are, as such, not part of philosophy, but philosophy has the task of reflecting on their theoretical principle, their ratio, nonetheless. Thus, for Hume, mechanics, or the theory of human crafts, should be framed as an element of philosophy, and especially Christian philosophy, which means that technology should not be separated from spiritual practices also. What Hugh then tried to do was to lay the foundations for a critical engagement with technology, we might say, from the standpoint of a comprehensive Christian understanding of reality. And now I hand over to Luca. But of course we could ask, what was the take there was, was there a specific take of Hughes uh, on technology and what was it? If we follow uh, Illich, Hugh in fact deserves, as he writes in, in his book in the vineyard of the text, Hugh deserves an important place in the philosophy of technology since he dealt with the subject in an original way quite distinct from any other author I know. Hugh attempted to foster a modest view of technology, thus laying the foundations for what Illich calls critical technology. Hugh saw the mechanical arts or technology as essentially and merely as a remedy for those inborn bodily weaknesses of human beings that resulted from Adam's fall. Technology's main aim is not to enhance the nature of human beings or other created things, nor to control, dominate, or conquer nature for the purpose of turning it into a pseudo-paradise, as he writes, which has been the proto-transhumanist urge, at least since the time of Francis Bacon and René Descartes. Instead, technology was to be viewed as a partial, never complete or definitive cure for the symptoms of original sin, what Illich calls humanly caused disruptions of the environment. Technology thus is like medicine, a pharmacon. Uh, we already heard about that uh, from Alessandro. It's like medicine, a pharmacon, which in its Greek origins refers both to a remedy and a poison, the, def the difference between them being its dosage and application in the proper context, or in other words, its use and abuse. Today, in our reflection about the place of technology in the pursuit of a good life, this distinction helps us to differentiate between actual technological progress, somewhat alleviating the human condition, and mere technization, which might even make things worse. Hugh goes on to propose that we should study technical tools within the framework of a mechanical science, that is to say, a science of tools as tools, which Illich calls, as already mentioned, critical technology. Ultimately, such tools must be understood as products of and means for human activity. Even though, as current philosophers of technology rightly stress, Technology is never neutral, even though it has its distinct form of efficacy and always does something with humans, as humans do something with it. Still, any activity of a tool, strictly speaking, is only an activity by way of an extrinsic analogy, indirectly referring to a human activity. Thus, 
from a philosophical and even theological standpoint, the study of the mechanical arts is always the study of humanity and its place and role within the story of creation, redemption, and the resurrection of the dead. It stands in the tension between the biblical traditions of chiliasm and apocalypse, one emphasizing eschatological continuity, the other emphasizing discontinuity between our present human endeavors and the reality of God's future kingdom. Hugh and Illich both aim to strike a balance between the two, making sure that there is a human contribution to that grand eschatological narrative. And I quote here Illich again, mechanical science is the study not of God's creation, but of man's work in so far as this study can contribute to a practical remedy for human weakness. The challenge for any philosophy of technology is then to navigate between fatalistic resignation and an ethos of domination and control, the former being the root of apocalyptic religious escapism, the latter being the root of the decidedly modern natural sciences in the wake of Francis Bacon. What Hugh of St. Victor seems to argue for, and what Illich in turn seems to endorse, is a sober view of technology integrated into a spiritual and sapiential way of life. It is vital to see that such a critical technology is centered around human beings, or indeed persons, and the human and convivial use of technology. Granted, with today's digital technology, the relationship between persons and machines has taken on many different forms and modalities that go beyond the simple use of tools, if indeed there ever can be such a simple use. Therefore, careful thinking about the design of technology is vital. Still, an equal emphasis must also be put on the human beings who design and unleash technology on our societies and nature. Since Alvin Weinberg's pitch for technological fixes to solve our social and political issues, many have tricked into believing that technology, that there are technological solutions to almost every problem. Yet, there aren't. And technology as pharmacon is only desirable if there are people virtuous enough to deploy it wisely. These reflections bring us to Hugh's main topic, the formative practice of reading. In Hugh's time, the practice of sacred, or to borrow a phrase from Paul Griffiths, religious reading, had already begun to be supplanted by what Illich calls bookish reading. This new form of reading had to do with several technical modifications that were applied to books to make reading more efficient. For example, chapters were given titles and subtitles, while paragraphs, marginal glosses, tables of contents, and alphabetical indices were added. As a result, the new books could be used as tools in ways an older book could not. These changes, however, were not just accidental additions. Rather, they make plain a new understanding of books, as I said, as tools. In a way, what changed was the very nature of the book. The new book is simply a medium, the medium for something called a text. That is to say, a set of information that could be browsed over quickly and then absorbed. Thus, modern readers fly over the pages, scanning the text to extract usable data. On the contrary, the old book was a territory a reader was invited to explore, a foreign country, as it were, or to take up in its title, a vineyard. One could enter, wandering through and tasting the words, thoughts, and ideas almost like a pilgrim for whom the way is a vital part of the journey. The pages had, Illich writes, 
the quality of soil in which words are rooted. The old book was a landscape whose content couldn't be separated from its form, especially in a sacred reading of the scriptures, where the point of reading was ultimately the transformative effect such attentive reading had for the reader. He was well aware of these transformations, but what he teaches and upholds is still sacred reading. A mode of reading which is not rapacious, but humble and receptive. The readers who envisions are not like miners, digging through pages in search for valuable information, but like visitors entering the text with an attitude of humility and a disposition to be transformed by what they encounter there. As such, Lectio Divina is a strenuous exercise, an ascesis, involving the use of all intellectual faculties, but its primary purpose is not just the accumulation of knowledge, but personal progress toward wisdom. In sacred reading, the readers are not imposing their order on a story. Instead, it is the story that puts the reader into its order. Ilich emphasizes that Hugh didn't just carry on a pre-existing tradition, especially his insistence on the value of mnemonics, uh, techniques of remembering things, involves new developments. Combining new and old, Hugh encourages his readers to construct a memory palace of sorts. In contrast to pagan antiquity, he speaks not of a space with an arbitrary and static layout, but rather envisions a dynamic cloister for the soul. This place is to be organized according to the space-time structure of sacred history and revelation, meaning that the cloister of memory should mirror the historical reality of the church and the story God writes with it. Whatever one reads must and can be integrated with the, within this eschatological horizon. In this intellectual home, one carefully accommodates new insights, knowledge, and wisdom. The result of this would be that one personally inhabits that same space, that same story, that same reality, which is the reality of the kingdom of God. Elich writes, I quote, the activity which Hugh calls reading mediates between this macro macrocosmic church and the microcosmos of the reader's personal intimacy. End of quote. Hugh's originality, according to Elich, lies in his, quote, request that the reader mentally construct this arc in his mind and then live in it as his mental home. End of quote. Now, it's no coincidence that the Latin word habitatio, home, and habitus, disposition, attitude, but also the monastic garment, garment have the same etymological root. To acquire the habitus of the kingdom, one has to inhabit habitatio, the scriptures and their story, live in them as if one were settling down in a foreign country. Thus, for all the novelty of Hugh's rediscovery of the art of memory, the central aim remained the same to facilitate in the reader a transformation towards wisdom, which ultimately meant a transformation in the spirit towards Christ. Lectio, then, is not about gathering information, but rather a purification of the gaze, enabling one to look at the same reality from a new perspective, with renewed eyes, shaped by the engagement with the text. Lectio thus just might enable one to get the choke of the gospel. Ultimately, such spiritual reading goes deeper than technology because in transforming human beings, it also addresses their original sin. Illich speaks of Lectio as an, quote, ontologically remedial technique, end of quote. As David Cayley puts it, it is designed to remove the darkness from the eyes of fallen man and restore his capacity to perceive the light that shines from all things. In practicing it, we seek not ourselves, but another who is ultimately Christ." End of quote. Therefore, while technology might just help us to alleviate the human condition, if it is designed and deployed in such a way, sacred reading is conducive even more to conversion. 
It leads the readers back to Christ, to God's wisdom incarnate, and provides them with a foretaste of the eternal communion with him from whom eternal healing is to be expected. It is no accident that Hugh inscribes his reflection on the Artes Mechanica in a general program of spiritual formation, sacred reading as the fundamental practice of cultivating a life in communion with Christ, in his view, is the basis upon which any other aspect of life must be developed. Put differently, the perspective of faith in Christ as it is cultivated in a form of life shaped by the specific spiritual practices such as Lectio Divina is the horizon in which Christians are called to reflect upon and relate to every aspect of reality. At the same time, it is no accident either that Hugh's project since then has not been pursued much further. Illich writes that critical technology in Hugh's sense, I quote, ran counter to the passions and interests of the age and was forgotten, end of quote. What won the day instead was the idea that mechanical inventions should be employed instrumentally, in Francis Bacon's words, to conquer and subdue nature or even to shake her to her foundations, and thus rendering us maître et possesseur de la nature, in Descartes' famous phrase. Technical development in biotechnology and information technology today have massively enlarged the sphere of human power and control over nature, at first glance. They inspired a host of technocratic <clears throat> future visions, even though at the same time history continuously reminds us that we are much less in control than we think. Today, the computer and virtual worlds shaped by so-called artificial intelligences have replaced not only the old, but also the new book of modernity in many ways. New modes of attaining information to control have emerged that deserve a critical assessment. What remains the same is the fact that without spiritually formative practices, we will never be able to deploy them humanly and sustainably, which is a word that we probably have to revise after, uh, <laughs> after this event. From the time of Hugh until today, massive advancements in technical innovation are not being matched by in-depth reflection, transformative practices, virtue, and wisdom in human beings. Instead, technology and theology, as a kind of merger of philosophy and spiritually informed uh, and philosophy spiritually informed by the scriptures, are regarded as discrete, separate, and in independent realms. The situation today is reminiscent of a vulgarized version of Saint Augustine's distinction between a worldly and a spiritual city. What a historical perspective like Illich's has to offer here is the insight that the factual outcome as we see it today is not a fate. Illich, has already mentioned, uh, as already mentioned, was a firm believer in contingency. In history, nothing is total, compelling, or strictly necessary, which means that a change of mind, a reorientation, and a, conversation, uh, and a conversion are always possible. Keeping this in mind, Illich's narration of Hughes' theory of sacred reading is to be understood as a sort of plea in favor of its rediscovery. And perhaps today, in an era in which the hyper-modern project shows symptoms of fatigue, it is time to follow Illich and take up Hughes' vision again. Thank you. So now, now we just have a time to continue the discussion with questions. So if you have one, please come forward and say it into the microphone. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for all these four presentations. Um, yes, we suffered a little bit of the graveyard slot, the one after food, <laughs> after lunch. <laughs> Nevertheless, I, I listened to your, uh, present, to your talk very carefully, Nettle, and I just wanted you, maybe you can help me out here, when you said sustainability is the new scarcity. What you mean with it? Because sustainability, you yourself said that's a plastic word, which doesn't only connotes and doesn't denote anything. 
So uh, is it, isn't it a placeholder more than, and can, you know, scarcity occur with a placeholder? Yeah. And then, uh, Alex, I really appreciated your, your uh, presentation, but it was too, so overwhelming, all the details that I really couldn't follow track. But I, I had the impression that there was this moment when you said, you said yes, but it depends how not these media are used, but how they are shaped. I, I didn't get that point, maybe I was too tired. Yeah. And then uh, Thierry, um, about the uh, <laughs> translations, now I have to read uh, French and say it in English, yeah. about translations and then they are different. That's completely important because a translation is not, you know, a word by word translatere, yeah, from one shore to the other, yeah, because the condition on the other shore are different. Yeah? The, the syntax is different. So I really appreciate that there are so many different uh, translations and I don't think that's a, a race to, to uh, win. And then, Ah, left or right, um, whether, where Illich stood, yeah, that was so often the question, also the accusations of all kind, and even in the moment when these former people who were really fond of his ideas in the 60s and then in the late 70s, they themselves came into power even in government parties, and so on, then they said, ah, you are not too pessimistic, or yeah, you cannot make policy with it. And then said, and then you know that came up, oh that that's all you know, outdated and not important anymore. But I and I uh, maybe you also could help me with that uh, Barbara, who said that um, even rejected the concept of religion, of belonging to something which finds you kind of artificially because you cannot know, know all these uh, people who belong yeah, to this notion and so I think also left and right does not apply to his, his way of thinking. Yeah, that was a, a projection from outside. And then I would ask you, because you brought up the discussion, Thierry, but uh, how much was also a reasoning about even standpoints that could get closer to anarchism, yeah? Because there exists this current of, Catholic, uh, of Christian anarchism. It's just a question whether that came up, I don't know, and I would not qualify uh, even in any of these um, notions and con concepts. Yeah. And last but not least, I think, and I want you to in, maybe to include that, that the obsession with technique and tools yeah, in Illich came also out of a very specific moment uh, in his lifetime, uh, and that was the 1960s, that were the times of the counterculture, like late 60s, 70s. And these were these people who said no to consumerism, no to colonial lifestyle. Yeah? And they were looking for really material tools with which they could make a table they themselves and using it. And then, you know, gardening, cooking, everything, appetite for change. And there, this is what I already mentioned, the whole world catalog was published. And it was a collection of instructions how you can self-make things that you need in your context, whatever it is, a hammock or, or a, a, a pole, yeah? So, uh, and one more. Uh, ah, and this is the last one, sorry that I take so long, but I really want to address all, all uh, things. I, uh, I mentioned that I had a very long phone call conversation after uh, even 
had read my uh, habilitation thesis, and it was more than anything else a, a reminder. Uh, and something about the Lectio Divina, because you know, when you write a thesis, you often would not explicitly say, uh, I, yeah? but you claim uh, to have it invented or reinvented, and you claim that you know, because you are the author. Yeah? But it, it, he largely explained to me that authority in this Lectio Divina derives from another uh, quality, and that's the quality of words, and these words that have passed thousands of times through golden mouth. Yeah. That was exactly this repetition, this meditation, this loud reading of the text, and this has a complete, at least in my understanding, is completely different to what authority in a text of which is informative means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And I, I really wanted to share that with you. It's also here, also had written that down somewhere or <laughs> told to others. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to take uh, Yeah. Thank you very much, Thierry, and also you for these contributions. Um, in my mind, I went back to the, that I also was an exercise when we did the translation into German of your introduction to Ivan, because in your, in this book, we thought that uh, the, the, uh, Ivan's road then going to a German-speaking country that is not Austria, but it Hessen, or, or in the countryside in Hessen and so on, that um, this and then also the friends or how he, who he moved into uh, yeah, f uh, finding new, new friends, yeah. It's very important because what it, it ties to what Thierry said about topophilie et temporality, two conditions for friendship. And um, um, it, it, I, I don't, uh, it's difficult where to enter, and I, I want to be short, but even when we uh, 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 talk about reading, and then the the analysis of uh, you and the translations is that we should not forget that reading had to do with synesthesis, that it is a carnal experience, and it is chewing that there is no text. It is chewing in the repetition, and chewing means breathing, and, and it says something about the gusto of the, the sweetness or bitterness. And so even, uh, and that comes and ties to uh, the, the discovery of, uh, of um, the senses. Um, because even looking and reading a text is a very juicy and carnal doing. Because even looking at the text has to do with juices, because the, the eye, the eye that looks is going out, not turn, it's not coming a, an image into, but it's going out and then grazing, grasping, taking, fingering and then bringing back and so on, in the deeper sense of, a, of an experience. And that, again, was very important for the possibility of Ivan to, um, to start with gender. That he, was, that he was called 
to, to completely rethink his concept of uh, what means being a man in the modernity and what be, means being a woman, because that's not a, an issue of a categorization or uh, whatever, but uh, has to be rethought completely. And, um, and so this then makes it important or makes it understandable why Bachelard, he discovered Bachelard, knew that he didn't know before. And um, so, uh, be, say, in this, in this, uh, but that's in this um, moving over into uh, 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 in the deeper layers of uh, uh, a way of speaking that he knew as a as a uh, as a child. Before then, later he moved into Latin, which was then his home of taking personal notes and so on. Was was. Ivan had a, because he, he came to the, say, German-speaking countries, or Germany, um, as a man with already a lot of experiences in the church, but he was entering into a new etymology, or an old one, that he knew and that resonated with, um, with the dimension of an experiential echo in it. Because then in the, when you look it up, even uh, to, to taste, uh, to taste uh, 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 an argument means tasting. What is tasting? How do you know it? So all this refers back to, uh, to shades of synesthetic perception that within the history of the sciences um, usually it, it falls into a black, into a, into a point that um, is not seen because that that comes up has to do the, no, has the ring of an evidence. It must be like it is, always the modernity. But that that falls into the shadow that you do not know any longer that even that uh, reading, that reading has to do with the breath, and breath has to do with understanding. And that has to do with something very carnal. I can't, um, and so I, it seems to me, and that has to do with the gusto to someone. So, it, so um, I, I think there's a whole dimension here in this, in this uh, change of culture or return to a culture that at the same time had been transformed so much in Germany in the 1970s already. And, and it seems to me that here also the issue of Fre friendships, I stop now, friendships. For instance, what we, we never think of the old Muska, the Benedictine monk, uh, 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 an, a Bavarian princess or something, aristocrat, and that uh, Ivan cut her hair when she entered the Benedictine order. He was a priest then in, in New York, and she north of New York in the Abbey of Regina Laudes. And they hadn't seen each other for many, many years because, because he was in Mexico and so on, so on. But the, the, the rediscovery of a deeper, deeper, maybe deeper, juicy, experiential quality is the wrong term, but yeah, se senses of uh, when, you, when you move into different ways of expression, talking, your tongue, and so on. 
that this was a very important, important for forming or re-taking up friendships again. It was perhaps because Ivan then was coming from Germany, from Germany, and Mother Rome, the Benedictine, beautiful old woman. She, she came. She she could disclose or open to him dimensions from her childhood that um, are, are covered by layers that he could rediscover. And even this friendship with Mushka, the mother of Rome, then um, led ultimately to a huge pile of love letters. Uh, Ivan responded very rarely. He never had time. But Mushka, a, a marvelous woman, beautiful person, beautiful soul. And they had a, a an relation amical um, that, was, that had to do with topif topophily and temporality. Because when he was as acting as a priest, uh, it was impossible to take it up, this friendship. Even he had cut her hair and you, but she was safe in her Benedict. Okay, so, so with, or I wanted to comment on the notion that I found very important that Thierry was taking up to reconsider temporality and topophilia, topophilia. In the in the analysis of these of these uh, writings, that the Thierry that the that is much more as you know that better that it is much more than change the way how you talk, but that how you rediscover how you rediscover a gusto and something that's dear to your heart that you cannot know in the sense of knowing, but then it comes to you and you remember and you know it. Thank you. Well, I'll just try to quickly answer your question why I think that sustainability is a new scarcity. Uh, I think that in Illich, scarcity is related to having a way of living that is completely dependent on the market in, in, in the state, for example. When you have no more trust in your uh, inner ability to walk, to learn, to move yourself from point A to point B, to learn a language, when learning become uh, a product from a school, it's a scarce resource. So what I'm saying that when, when I say that sustainability is the new scarcity, I'm saying that we're not rethinking the way we live together. We're just using the old way and putting it into a new uh, magical sense that will somehow be uh, different, which is not. It's not. Uh, we are not rethinking, transiting from uh, within a city. We are just saying, no. Let's move. Uh, uh, let's start moving, uh, uh, being uh, not users, but uh, uh, let's just drive cars that are electric or buses that are electrics instead of rethinking completely the way we, 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 we see the space. Uh, instead of rethinking, can we just majorly walk? Can we just uh, depend on being taken from point A to point B in various different, uh, very specific occasions. Most of the people in the world does not need to be carried from one place to another to transit, but the spaces in which we live are designed for these tools. Therefore, it's, it's cars to walk. In, uh, in, in Brazil, I have this very clear example, and that was done by engineering, uh, transports engineering, saying that uh, the, the time that someone would take to, go, to take to, 
travel from the east uh, side of the city of Sao Paulo to the city center in the 90s, in 1910, 1910, was by riding a horse, it took two hours and a half. In 2010, to drive from the same place to the city center takes four hours. Riding a horse would be faster than driving a car. So we cannot even rethink how we, how we are together because we're always just saying, oh, we need an electric car or, or whatever. So I'm saying that it's the new scarcity sustainability in this sense of village. So instead of uh, rethinking the way we live, the way we learn, and these inner abilities that we carry and that every human being care, carries in, in, in their uh, uh, body, we are literally just retooling, for example. That's what I mean by sustainability being the face, the new face of scarcity, something that was already... I don't know if it's enough of an answer, but I have a, a more about that, but I think at least to give you a bit of what I mean by it. Yes, thank you. I just want to be sure I understood uh, your question because I was up there and you were into the microphone. So you, you mentioned the, uh, the fact that I talked about somehow our usage of media depending on how they are shaped. Russian media, you mean? Yeah. So, uh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a really complex. No, thank you. It's uh, it's an opportunity to to to, to uh, emphasize an aspect that maybe is, is so always problematic. What are we talking about when we talk about media or technologies uh, and so on? The the Luca mentioned the the to say a big taboo of uh, media theory, namely you, you cannot say that uh, media are neutral, right? So if you say something like that, it's like saying that uh, Earth, uh, Earth is flat, so to say. But uh, on the other side, you, you want somehow to uh, not to be a determinist, not to, 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 to say that there is some sort of space for political intervention, for social design of technologies, there is the possibility to change, so to say. So what I wanted to stress are two elements. The, the first one is that uh, the process through which we arrive here, the, the, the work by Simon Don will be really useful, but I, I, in general. So the process through which we arrive at uh, a specific set of devices, because when we speak about technology, we mostly speak about devices, about objects, which is very wrong, which is absolutely wrong. But we, we usually mean objects, a, a, certain, a, a certain thing, a certain kind of device. So the process through which we arrive at a certain kind of device is in itself a technological process. So when we arrive at a certain kind of tool, so many technological decisions and so many technological processes have already taken place so that when we arrive at this stage, we can no longer say, yeah, this is neutral. This depends on how you use it. No, this is no longer neutral, because this is the concretization of a huge uh, set of decisions, of, uh, of processes, and, and so on. And of course, this does not exist without an infrastructure that makes the use of this device possible. So at this stage, it doesn't depend uh, anymore. You, you, what McLuhan says uh, is, is true. This is absolutely not neutral. It doesn't, it doesn't have any sense. But what I wanted to say is there is, of course, a process. And this process is complex and is full of contingencies and is very composite, so to say. And in this process, a huge factor is the way uh, we imagine and the way, so to say, we speak about technology. So th 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 that's the problem. The problem is my idea is we, have, uh, we almost never have a rational uh, cognitive relationship with technology. When we speak about technology, we almost always uh, use 
words, notions uh, that are inherently mythical, theological, uh, narrative. We, we almost always narrate about technology and we are, we are not always precisely aware of what we are doing and that's the, the difference I was trying to express with the, the distinction between a mythology and a mythography. Namely, there is a time when we simply take part in this mythological creation, which we, so to say, are not aware that we are in this uh, imagery, in this, in this imaginary, so to say. And there is a moment, which is the task, in my opinion, also for scholar, in which you, we, so to say, take a distance, make a step uh, uh, away and say, listen, okay, let's look at our way of speaking about technology. Granted that the fact that something is an imaginary does not mean that it is false. It's not necessarily about saying this is only a myth, this is not truth, this is only to say uh, um, uh, a lie, because that's precisely the nature of the struggle. So when I, when I speak of a Promethean and an Epimethean uh, imaginary of technology, I speak of two imaginaries. They are both uh, na narratives. The, the, it's not that one is not a narrative and the other is a, is a narrative. They are two narratives. The problem is uh, uh, when do these narratives come into play? They do not come into play at this level or they, they, it's a minimum contribution that they can do. Because the, the, the issue here, what is at stake here, is of course the general infrastructure. What, uh, what Nato was saying, I mean, if you, if you think about, so to say, uh, uh, using electric car instead of, uh, of uh, oil, oil based car, you, you're not changing anything. You, you're, you're simply thinking about using a, a certain kind of device instead of another kind of device. So you are already at the end of the technological process whereas you want to be at the beginning of the technological process. You want to think about the very structure of our technological environment. But in order to do so, you will really have to reflect about the basic assumption of an entire society's discussion about technology, what it looks like, how we feel about it. And the, way I, the, the reason I use the word uh, Im imaginary is because it's not just, so to say, a set of propositions. It's not just a set of rules or, or, or a set of uh, uh, statements about technology. It has something that is really of the order of feelings. It's something we, we have faith in, that we fear, that mm -hmm. really regulates our action. So it's really direct. So th that's maybe also, I was really connecting also with what Luca and Oliver said, because that, that's, that's the problem. I mean, we cannot it's really difficult to, th to talk about the question of techno-determinism and the uh, good or bad nature of media if we keep understanding uh, media as uh, devices, as uh, objects. Because that, that's, the, that's, that's the problem. We, we, we can, of course, have a discussion about uh, whether this, uh, this device is good or bad. I mean, this device has huge problems but that this device has huge problems does not mean that electronic media or that electricity is a bad medium per se. That's, that's the issue. So the problem is you want to go back to, from, from these to electricity as a medium. That, that's, my, that's my understanding of, uh, of, of the question. So I, I hope I answered, but mm -hmm. yeah. that was the general idea. Mm -hmm. so. no, thank, you. thank you, I think this is very, very helpful. Um, Luca and I had, had a similar discussion about this when Luca mentioned that uh, Neil Postman, right, was it, said media are like an environment. And of course, an, an, an environment is conducive to things growing and other things not growing. So ultimately, the question is what kind of environments do we create, sort of ecologically, but then also technologically and culturally and sort of formatively, spiritually in that sense. That's one of the main questions I think we face. Um, we, we will now take a, a quick 10-minute break and then continue with what we termed a panel discussion. It basically is the continuation of our, of our discussion here. So I would ask you to sort of prepare some sort of thoughts, statements, things. And we would like to, to, to steer that towards um, the future, thinking, sort of thinking about um, the question that uh, Wolfgang Palaver sort of brought up the dialectic between being in, in institutions but also critiquing institutions and 
sort of maybe even when is the point that one has to get out of an institution that, that Nina uh, mentioned and where are we at? That kind of question would be one. I think the other one would be in terms of exactly of this, of an imaginary or of the narratives, um, we, are, we have heard a lot of critique and analysis of an interpretation or an, a myth of science and technological progress and medicine. And once we critique that myth, what's the alternative story constructively that we can bring to people uh, in order to, to think better in better ways about technology and, and the technological future? And where was the third one? This was already the third one. Oh, that was the third. So these two, the institutional dialectic and the question of when to make a point, sort of an exit, Point and the question about the positive narratives. I think that would be an interesting way to go on uh, after this 10 minute break.
continue a little bit. We have time actually till half past seven. <laughs> At half past seven, uh, there will be this concert in the Aula Magna of the University. And after that, we will have dinner together in the restaurant Gemelli. Um, so uh, there, there, there are refreshments. Uh, some of you have already profits from it, I, I think. But the idea was, as, as Oliver said before, that we uh, give us our, uh, a little more, more time to discuss together some issues. Uh, Oliver mentioned them already. Um, but as I understood, Fabio Milana uh, wants to, to, make the, to, to begin uh, or to make a start in our discussion. So please. So you was solicited um, everything I listened to, or better, everything I I could understand these two days, and very grateful to the all of you. Um, now I'm pushed to intervene, especially by uh, St Stefan's uh, presentation, which I appreciated very much, and, and maybe adding something um, which maybe lack, it was like lacking in, um, in your speech, and, and about liturgy you now. <laughs> And I'm, I'm uh, recollecting uh, the, um, an expression by, by Illich. Uh, celebration is always a celebration of the death of the Lord, memory of the, the last supper, the meal of the prisoner who will kill tomorrow. So the death of the Lord is the very center of the liturgy. So our gathering around that event, that's the end. So the, 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 the death of the Lord, so the death of the Lord is the loss of everything we have, we had, our Lord. It's our unique hope, our unique certainty are the rock who supported support us. So we are generally full of projects, uh, reforms, uh, revolution, protest, movement, what? <laughs> but our Lord accepted not to change everything in this world. So he accepted his, his whole powerlessness. He accepted to die. I can't imagine, I can't imagine, imagine, no, nothing worse, no corruption optima, pessima, worse than that, so we, we want, we still want to make the world a better place. This is absurd, that's absurd. Our Lord decided, she chose not to do anything, to be completely beaten. And this is the center of our celebration. Acceptance of the death of the Lord is accepting to be deprived of everything we had, uh, of our certainties intellect and senses, how, as Illich wrote about prayer in one of the earliest of his writings, prayer is rehearsal for that because you, at a certain stage of the prayer you lose intelligence, you lose sense, you lose your usual means to understand and to practice reality. But experiencing death, accepting death, is the beginning 
of real life. Life in biblical sense, says Illich when speaking to those science students, you know, in 1968. If you want really to go to Mexico and see if you are really, if you really want to live, if you, if you are able to live, but to live in, in biblical sense, go, let's go, go to Mexico. But what living in biblical sense? Huh? He explained, if you are disposed to go there, renounces your certainties, renouncing your projects, renouncing everywhere, uh, accepting to be completely useless and to be hosted by those, pe those peasants, peasants uh, and to be honest, and maybe they can have pity for you and they can learn you something if you are disposed to do so, so you uh, are able to live in biblical sense, that's what he's saying there. So, there has been a, you know, a, a beginning of, of controversy about theology of death or theology of life in, uh, in Illich, but um, I think that, you know, the beginning, in, according to Illich, the beginning of life as real life so as life given, as life as a gift, is uh, possible through death if you accept uh, the experience of dying. Mm. So if you accept life as openness, openness to, to the unknown, to the gift, to surprises, okay? There is... There, is, there has been also a historical, political declination of this conception in my, as far as, as I can understand, as I could understand. So in the, during the dec decade of development, uh, when Illich in his priesthood and uh, immediately uh, and faced the, 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 the theme of changement, because change in those periods, but not only in those period, in, in that period, but change was the experience that for everybody in that period. It was the historical sign of the times in that moment. You know, and, and what he was saying is ex was exactly that, what happens in the heart of a man who lives, or a woman, who lives in a rural village and go to the town and loses everything of what he had. And so how to live this experience, the experience of change. And, and Illich thought that church should not um, orient the changement because church had to explain the meaning of change. This is church, or was church, this, this celebration of awareness. So to understand what is, uh, what is um, going on, understand this experience as a, an experience of that that join you to Christ as a crucifix, you know? And to understand that, this is the, the, the task of the church, to celebrate with you, to celebrate together that experience, also in historical and we can say political or unpolitical, uh, if you prefer, experience. And maybe, so Illich, experienced, directly experienced other, <laughs> other phase of, of changement, of traumatic changement. And I'm not, I, I, I have not understood really what is his tense in front, for example, 
to, of the passage to the age of systems. For sure, he, he chose to confront, to face it, to confront with me, and to pass through. So an, ex an experience. Uh, uh, okay, liturgy. I said. I already said that. This is the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God, which is always present, not uh, which is present in celebration. Kingdom of God is the awareness of that experience, real life starting through at times the experience of poverty, the experience of dying. Okay, and uh, um, oh, I hope <laughs> I will be able once, maybe not. But I, will, I would like to illustrate uh, Illich's thought as the, the thought of, of the thought of the thinker of crisis. So this is really crisis. Crisis is with that, that's it, that experience, experience of the end of a hand and of a possibility, new possibility of freedom and of awareness, whatever. Um, happens uh, in, uh, in our life. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know which uh, path you, you want to continue on. So we had, we had the issue uh, of the dialectic between church as it and church as she uh, with the question about how can we articulate as a meaningful critique of a system of which we all are part of uh, linked to the question which is also rooted in, the, in Illich's biography because he chose at some point to leave the system um, because of particular reasons. Um, and then the, the other path was the, the, the question about a new design or other propositions, um, positive ones, so alternative paths after the, cre the critique of what is there. I don't know uh, whether you, Wolfgang, or other wants to uh, say something to Fabio because I am not happy with what he said. Please, uh, <laughs> I mean, Fabio, Fabio, you probably were addressing my discussion with David Cayley about this in some way. And I mean, it's very difficult for me. I'm not so sure as you are or, or seem to be what's the real path. But I would never say that uh, in the Eucharist we celebrate the death of Jesus. I mean, we, we should not push away the cross. And I fully agree what, what Illich uh, wrote about the cross because we experience the cross in, in several uh, dimensions in our own life, in the life of the world. But I think we should never forget that we celebrate uh, the death with the resurrection. And even, even with the hope of a new heaven and new earth. And uh, the best apocalyptic thinkers, they always tell us that uh, we, f we should face the catastrophe we should face death because death is in some way the individual apocalypse in some way. But we should do it in a hopeful way. And a hopeful way in contrast to fundamentalist apocalyptic understanding means, as, as it said, Martin Luther said it, probably he didn't say it, but we quote it again and again. Even if I would know that uh, Earth will be destroyed tomorrow. I will plant the apple tree today. And you can find the same, the same saying in Muhammad, 
who said, even if the day of judgment would be today or tomorrow, I would uh, plant a palm tree today. So uh, I'm, uh, f from my uh, point of view, uh, the best uh, apocalyptic thinker and hopeful thinker in the Christian sense, one of the best, and I don't know if Illich ever read it, is Josef Pieper. Josef Pieper wrote two or three books immediately after the second, end of the second, or in the last uh, two years of the Second World War. And he said, we should take the apocalyptic possibility very seriously, but we should not, and he even was courageous enough to read the Apocalypse of John and said, if you read it carefully, those are people who expect the end of the world, but care for this world. Doesn't mean to change, uh, but to care, care for it. And I think that that's, uh, that's also important. And I mean, if David <laughs> would be here, he said, David wrote in, in the Conspiratio number two against my reading, and it's, we should, friendship should allow uh, <laughs> discussions and disagreement, I think. He wrote to me, uh, that there is no theological problem and we should not see the death, we should not see death as an enemy. Well, St. Paul said in the first letter to the Corinthians that the resurrection, in the resurrection of Jesus, the ultimate enemy was destroyed. And I do not want to give up on this uh, sense. And, and in a deeper sense, if you study Judaism carefully, and in my, uh, I, I draw to Elie Wiesel, but you can name a lot of other Jewish thinkers. They had such a strong emphasis on, on life that Elie Wiesel write, writes, how can Christians believe that, uh, that uh, redemption comes from death? This is not understandable from the Jewish point of view, and I think we Christians should read the redemption, the cross and the resurrection with Jewish eyes, and not uh, in the way that we celebrate death, which is more the early religions of the sacred. So that's uh, just a short answer. I would like to make an observation, because <laughs> my intervention this morning was after the morning and yesterday. And I felt this afternoon we had a much more uh, balanced uh, view of technology in the last paper and in Alessandro's paper. And I do not want to make now personal statements or judgments who is good or who is bad or is better. Uh, my question that suddenly came up, why is it easier for all of us to be a little more balanced about technology and why is, when we address the health system, uh, is in the Elysian world at least a much more black and white? Is this also related to deaths? And uh, I mean, the health system, of course, <laughs> is, is something that relates to deaths. Of course, that's a quite uh, challenging thing and technology we can handle. That was just an observation. Maybe that can lead us also to a deeper discussion of the general question of dialectics or not dialectics. And I do not claim uh, I, have a, I present a good Illich way. I, I just, I think we should discuss open and I just try to share some of my worries. Does someone wants to take this? Yeah. La, la, la question est, est donc celle de comment euh, parler d'Ivan Illich euh, aujourd'hui sans tomber dans la géographie, évidemment. Euh, et je pense que la difficulté, c'est de ne pas focaliser nos, nos travaux, nos études que sur lui, mais de, de, sur, et surtout pas occulter 
ceux qui l'ont aussi beaucoup nourri. Par exemple, dans le livre que je suis en train de, de rédiger, je me suis aperçu que sur l'école, par exemple, euh, donc je fais un chapitre sur euh, comment Illich euh, en vient à faire la critique de l'institution scolaire, mais je fais un second chapitre juste après sur Paul Goodman. Parce que, euh, indéniablement, euh, Paul Goodman a, a contribué, a, a permis à Illich de formuler, comme il l'a fait, l'idée de déscolariser la société. Le livre est très mal traduit en français puisque le titre, c'est « Une société sans école ». Or, c'est bien déscolariser la société. Et je pense qu'il faut aller peut-être plus loin encore que le titre d'Illich à cette époque. Il faut déscolariser notre esprit. C'est-à-dire que notre esprit est scolarisé à cause de l'école, mais même en dehors de l'école, quand on devient adulte, quand on devient parent, etc. etc. Donc, euh, avancer avec Illich, c'est aussi faire ce pas de côté. Lorsque euh, je fais le chapitre sur le vernaculaire euh, chez Illich, je fais un second chapitre juste derrière, un, un, qui n'est pas un chapitre fantôme, euh, sur Jean Robert, par exemple. Euh, J'ai lu euh, euh, les livres de Jean Robert et je m'aperçois qu'il a une vraie pensée, très forte, très intéressante, mais il se mettait toujours en retrait d'Yvan par... Euh, par euh, générosité, j'allais dire, mais euh, il a et il existe comme, comme penseur euh, entier. Euh, pour Jean-Pierre Dupuis, c'est pareil. Et, et ce n'est pas parce que Jean-Pierre Dupuis, à un moment donné, a, a préféré René Girard à Yvon Elitch qu'il devait disparaître. Euh, il revient dans Némésis Médical, dont il, a, il est vraiment un co-auteur de la version française, et dans « Énergie et équité », où il est un co-auteur de la version française, je précise à chaque fois, euh, et euh, euh, Jean-Pierre Dupuis, par exemple, trouve des similitudes entre Gunther Anders et Ivan Illich, et je pense que c'est tout à fait vrai. Donc, euh, euh, c'est aussi le travail qu'on peut faire, c'est un travail à la Michel Foucault, hein, de généalogie, de la pensée, de la généalogie des travaux d'Illich, en regardant d'autres auteurs que lui-même, peut-être, n'en mentionne pas. Non pas parce qu'il voulait euh, euh, les taire, mais parce que, bon, voilà, il ne les mettait pas forcément dans, dans sa bibliographie. Donc, je crois que là, c'est un, un vrai travail, mais ce n'est pas facile, évidemment. Mais c'est essayer de... de euh, je n'ai pas trouvé le titre de mon livre, l'éditeur ne euh, le trouve pas bien. L'idée était un peu comme... Euh, euh, le roman de Heinrich Bohl. Vous savez, euh, portrait de groupe, euh, portrait de femme. Vous connaissez ce roman de, de, Je prononce mal euh, cet auteur allemand euh, qui a eu le prix Nobel. Euh, portrait de, de groupe avec femme. Euh, moi, mon idée, c'est de faire un portrait d'Yvon Elitch euh, avec, avec un groupe. <rire> Mais un groupe qui est toujours mobile, qui est toujours en train de se constituer, de se reconstituer, etc. etc. Je voudrais juste profiter de ce moment pour, euh, poser, enfin pour compléter ce qu'a dit très gentiment Barbara sur la topophilia. Euh, C'est une vraie question par rapport à Yvan. Parce que Yvan répétait à David Kelley et à d'autres euh, qu'il n'avait pas de, de pays natal, il n'avait pas de ville, il n'avait pas de maison. Euh, il était itinérant. Il profitait de la maison de Barbara à Brême, etc. Bon, euh, disait-il, mais lui, il n'en avait pas. Or, euh, je ne sais pas ce qu'il aurait pensé d'une topophilie si lui n'a pas de lieu. Comment peut-il être l'ami des lieux Et euh, dans mon travail, un autre livre que je suis en train de terminer sur la topophilie, euh, je pose la question du « chez-soi ». Là, philosophiquement, c est, c est, c est, français, c'est très difficile. Je pose la question du « chez-soi » en disant « Quel est le soi du chez-soi » Vous voyez C'est une question fondamentale, philosophiquement parlant. « Quel est le soi du chez-soi » Et euh, j'en parlais avec Yvan euh, encore en juillet 2002, lors d'un dîner chez moi. Euh, Corinne Kelao était témoin. Euh, moi, j'ai beaucoup écrit sur l'urbanisation planétaire, sur l'urbanisation des mœurs. Et j'explique du reste 
l'effacement progressif de la religion catholique dans les pays occidentaux par l'urbanisation des comportements et des valeurs. Et j'essayais de le convaincre que la terre dont on parle est une terre urbaine. Et là, je voyais que ça, qu'il n'embrayait pas avec cette idée. Et aujourd'hui, avec le recul, on est 20 ans plus tard après la mort d'Ivan, euh, je constate que les gated community, que les, les mégalopoles, etc., euh, sont, euh, ont déstructuré totalement toutes les campagnes, ont, ont totalement euh, précarisé les territoires et ont unifié, homogénéisé les paysages. Donc là, c'est une manière de, 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 de repartir avec Illich en chemin. Vous voyez, c'est plutôt cette idée que la, le connaître, la connaissance, c'est un chemin. Et sur ce chemin, on croise Yvan. Salut. <rires> Salut. This might have been the last word. My last word is much more severe, but I think we should conclude officially, and I will conclude with my severe words. They are in Latin. Mors et vita, duello, conflixere mirando. It's the sequence, if I am right, Stefan, you will help me. It's the sequence of the Easter celebration, and you can translate it in death and life, are in the in a, in a battle, in a struggle, in a strange duel. So I think that the fact that we arrived at this center of human existence, that we entered into the most profound question, not of religion, but of humankind, is a good sign for our conference. And I think we should close here the official part I want to be short. It's just a word of gratitude to everybody here present. You all contributed in your way uh, to this meeting, to this conviviality. And the last word I would like to take up by what Stefan Tautz invented so brilliantly. Those who knew Ivan Illich might say again, oh, we miss him. Those who never met Ivan Illich up to now might say, I miss him even if I never met him. And I hope this happened to everybody present here in the room and present online who will see us now or whensoever. So thank you so much. Thank you also to the film team. And we will continue. Don't leave, but the, the official part is closed here. Thank you.